Section 53 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Stevens. The World Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico and the West Indies. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 53. Given to Hospitality, 20th Century, by Dr. Wilfred Thomason Grenfell. Old Uncle Malcolm of Dovebrook, Labrador, was a world citizen. For, though born on the shores of Newfoundland, he had ranged the seven seas in his youth in every kind of craft and in every kind of climb. But his time came, as they say on this coast, as everybody's else does. For after a harder trip than usual, reaching his native shore and tired of roaming, he had sought and won the hand of as true a partner as it was ever man's good fortune to fall in with. Fishing had been Uncle Malcolm's boyhood occupation, and that of his father and forefathers before him, so he had no difficulty in finding a calling that was at once congenial and would support him nearer home. It was all the pleasanter that the industry afforded a livelihood to the bulk of his neighbours also. The shore fishery, as it was called, that is the cod fishery in their own bays in Newfoundland, was for some reason then just beginning to fail, and the bolder souls were venturing farther down north each year, crossing the Straits of Belle Isle and cruising the rock-bound coast of Labrador in search of fish. Among these it was but natural to find Malcolm. When the fall commenced and ice beset the Labrador harbours, Uncle Malcolm's craft, which he had first partially mortgaged on the strength of his savings as a sailor, and had then paid off from his voyages of fish, used always to repair to the bay and lie up for the winter, waiting the new outfit for the succeeding year. On all his trips his good wife accompanied him, cooking for him on the schooner and helping him put away the fish, enjoying, as she used to tell me, every bit of the voyage, for she too, had the genius of the sea in her bones, an heirloom from many generations past. But as time went on, little ones were given to Uncle Malcolm, and it became harder and harder to close the home for six months and carry the children among the dangers of the Labrador coast, more especially as every year the snapper fishermen were pushing farther and farther north, where the coast is not only unlighted and unmarked, but also unsurveyed and uncharted. At last the question had to be settled. As with many others, should the wife and children stay home while Dad took his vessel on her perilous journeys, or should they find a place on the Labrador coast itself where the fish was plentiful, and so in the schooner should they abandon the long cruises and enjoy a home life, even if it involved the isolation of the then almost unpopulated country? To Uncle Malcolm, moving was as second nature, and the move of 500 miles one way or the other with him did not count for much. But to the wife and Ben's the breaking up of the home and the leaving of her people were matters of great difficulty. For a long while she felt she could not leave the old folks. But eventually her love for her husband rang true. To be near him being her chief end in life, and loving the simple home ties more than aught else, she at last gave her consent and the whole family migrated, settling on the shores of a huge inlet. The new home was far enough in from the open sea to have trees enough for firewood and for protection, growing close alongside the house, and was near enough to the good trapping grounds to give Uncle Malcolm a chance of fairing in winter, without his having to live practically the whole time away in tilts on the fir path. Yet the chosen spot was near enough to the open sea that in their small boat he and his boys could also work nets and lines for the abundant cod fishery in the fall, while from the point jutting out below the house and forming the little boat harbour, they could also tend salmon nets and so add yet another stream to their bows for earning a living with. Excellent berries grow in extravagant plenty on the hillsides above the house, and no one could preserve them better than Aunt Anne, and along the land was enough grass to keep his goat all winter in hay. It might be supposed that with his long wanderings before the mast, the sweetness and simplicity of Uncle Malcolm's character might have been much impaired. But this was far from being the case. The strong religious upbringing of his old home had been so real, so fine, and so exemplified in the lives of his own parents, 
that he had imbibed his Bible teachings to as good purpose as he had his mother's milk, and that was to very considerable purpose, for Uncle Malcolm stood very well over six feet, and was far beyond the average in chest measurement. He stood as erect as a soldier, but when first I knew him, his hair and beard, both of which hung in wavy abundance around his honest, weather-beaten face, were already grey-flecked. For twenty years he has been my friend now, and if I were asked to name a man who, in spite of a strong personality and no little temper of his own, has always appeared to me to deserve the title of a man with the prefix of Christian before it, I should unhesitatingly say, you needn't go beyond Uncle Malcolm. For many years things material went well with the family, and under their hands grew up a fine house with a large, airy kitchen, which had twice to be enlarged as the family grew, and visitors and friends on pleasure cruises also grew more and more numerous. Aunt Anne's table was seldom, if ever, clear of refreshments, for no one may arrive at any time of day or night without being pressed to sit in and take a cup of tea. I've known more folks stopping off here over Sunday, as they passed along the climatic road in winter with their dogs than ever I saw in a house party at a country house ten times the size. It was all very well them times, said a sententious neighbour, but nothing could stand again that of late years. When times began to get bad in the bay, half the shore took to cruising, and then that brought up at Uncle Malcolm's fairly ate him out of house and home. For things have changed both with the coast and with Uncle Malcolm since I first knew him, and it is that that caused me to write this story. To begin with, the nemesis that overtook the Newfoundland shore fisheries has pursued them also to Labrador, and of late the fisheries have been that uncertain that a man could no longer do as he had wished to in providing hospitality for his neighbours, though, like Lot, these good folk were ever on the lookout for strangers. The years have dealt hardly also with Uncle Malcolm, one of his lads has left him for those shores where bales of flour and gallons of molasses no longer are subjects of anxiety. One, following the footsteps of his father, has gone to sea, joined the crew of an overseen brigantine that carried fish to Spain and has not been heard of since. A third is in the States, doing well, but his letters of late years have been only scattered and there is little likelihood of Malcolm ever seeing him again. His devoted wife has gone also before him, and only his youngest boy, Anthony, is left. It would seem as if it would be no difficult matter for these two to provide for themselves all that was needful. I could not help noticing, however, as successive seasons brought in the mission vessel once more to Uncle Malcolm's door, that the house looked bearer each time, and though a brave show of hospitality was still made to us all on our arrival, there was now no milk for our tea, and even the bit of sugar gave place to molasses. Still the home was kept scrupulously clean, though the bright, homemade mats gradually disappeared from the floors, and all the many little tokens of a woman's handiwork followed in their wake. The maid, whom he fed and clothed in return for doing his rough work, displayed a spirit worthy of her master in her use of the scrubbing brush, soap, and water, and she had succeeded in inducing such a sense of utter nakedness in the great kitchen that unavoidably a sense of sadness filled one on entering it. The old man, with the grit that always characterised him, was silent on all personal matters, and appreciating the self-respect which held him from reposing his confidences in me. I came and went without breaching the subject of his ways and means. At last, what he could not bring himself to say he put in writing, an acquirement he had to thank his early sailing days for, and I received a letter asking me to refer to these matters on my next visit. Uncle Malcolm had now passed the three score and ten years allotted by the psalmist as the years of our strength, and in spite of his erect figure, his clear eye, his steady hand, it was not difficult to see that in his case this span of years was probably approximately correct. The hard life had told on his vitality, and he was no longer the man he had been. It's this way, doctor, he exclaimed when at last his door was shut and we found ourselves alone together. The cupboard is bare at last. There has been hard times these three years. The neighbours get that numerous they have driven up most of the fur away. I got narrower skin last winter, and how I'm going to get through this winter I can't tell. No, I owes no man anything, thank God, and what bitter flour Anthony and the maid eats don't amount to anything. But you see how it is, doctor. It isn't ourselves we have to look out for only. 
There isn't a family to the westward what isn't in debt to the company, nor to the eastward either, this side of the big river, and when them's hungry in winter, what's them to do? They can't get no more credit. Lots of them haven't got no credit now, and more of them has got children in plenty. What's them to do? They can't go away without a bite, when them is hungry and come he's here. He would not do that, would he? And he wouldn't allow his friends to either. There was no gainsaying the difficulty, there was no denying that the Christ would have fed them. In my own mind, I couldn't help fearing that I somehow have avoided the issue, possibly by moving off the comatic track each winter, as many I knew had already done. I even ventured to suggest this, but Uncle Malcolm stood firm. No, no, Doctor, as long as God gives me a bit, I stay right here and share it with him. What I am afraid of is it won't go round this time. Still, if the master feed thousands with a few fish them times, I got that many anyhow, and he can make it go round. It wouldn't be much trusting him now after all these years if I just ran away up the bay with them fishes. It wasn't to complain, Doctor, I wrote to you. I knows the Lord will be true to his promises. But we got to do our part, and I thought I'd like somehow to speak to you to see what you thinks. Uncle Malcolm, I replied, I'm delighted you did. I was just looking for someone to get me a few thousand billets of good dry wood put on some place like your point, where the mission ship could easily call and get them. We're always short of coal away down here, and I find I can pay enough to make it worthwhile. I reckon I'll help out by giving flour for the winter, and you can place the billets right here where you can keep an eye on them. I was narrowly scrutinising his face as I spoke, and I fancied I saw an even brighter sparkle in those honest grey eyes than usual a sparkle that counts far more to some folk than that of any jeweled trinkets. A short silence ensued, and being a man of few words, he shook hands and went out. Two days ago we once more dropped our anchor off Uncle Malcolm's point. Two years had passed, and each time the large quota of firewood had been faithfully procured and ready for us, and now once again the same problem faced us. His failing strength made him realise that to haul logs, which got ever farther from his door, and to cut bullets enough to supply his needs had become impossible. Fourteen barrels I used last winter, Doctor, he began as he saw my eyes roaming about the great kitchen that outrivaled a mother Hubbard's for bareness. Not a bone either of beef or of pork would the neediest of visitors have found. No, nor a speck of dirt either. The place was swept and garnished like a great skeleton. Fourteen, I replied. Four, you mean? Four is more than enough for you and Anthony. Every ounce of fourteen, he said, and but for what you bought for me in the south, every barrel at eight dollars fifty a barrel. Who ate them, Uncle Malcolm? Well, we had as many as twenty-seven staying here at one weekend, and they were netter a bite or sup at home. Is not us told to be given to hospitality, and that is not feeding him as they'll pay us back, is it? It's you that is the real relieving officer down here, I answered. Thank God, he replied, somewhat piped. I've not had to come to the government yet for help, though we has been on dry flour all summer. What, you are without any fats in the house for yourself? Is that true? Well, you see, doctor, they comes round first one, and then another, for just a bit to grease the pot, till there's none left for our own pot. I thank God I doesn't have to take none till I catches what to pay for it with, but I haven't seen a bit of butter this three months. There's a few salmon and fewer fish on the land yet, I know, he went on. Is not it better in here in the bay, I asked. No, indeed. It'll be a poor lookout for winter. The best of them have not a quintal under salt yet, and the season be far slipping away. You'll simply have to shut your door to them this winter, then, whatever happens now, Uncle Malcolm. He stood and looked at me and simply said, I'll not last much longer anyhow, Doctor, and please, God, it'll never come to that. I does not want to hear him say, I was hungry and you did not feed me, a stranger and you took me not in. Well, what can you do? There be that thirty dollars what you sending me for the wood this year, and that'll do for all Anthony and I needs. There'd have been more of that as there was other years. But I can't chop like I used to, Doctor, and the folks what visits me doesn't seem to be able to go at it. They ought to do the whole lot, but since they don't, however can you manage? 
For answer, he had already gone to a large time-worn seaman's chest and, after carefully unlocking it, was feeling about among a mass of heterogeneous wraps and relics. At last, he apparently found what he was hunting for. For closing the lid, he came back to the table with what was evidently a schoolboy's ancient pencil case. It required much persuasion to open it, as it had obviously been lying some years untouched. When at last the feat was accomplished, with his jackknife he picked out a packing of spun yarn that had been well corked into it, and then, holding it upside down, a small roll of greenbacks fell out on the table. If them as killed the fox that bought them notes had done with theirs as I done with mine, he began, there'll be less hunger in the bay this day. There's many in the bay, doctor, that's caught two to my one always. But there they didn't know how to look after them when they had him. He picked up the notes and handed them to me. There ought to be twelve of them, he said. That makes sixty dollars, but I can't read them, so you count them. He was correct. The roll proved to consist of twelve old five-dollar bills. What shall I do with them? I asked. Do with them? Why, won't you buy food for me with them? What food do you want? Flour and molasses and some butter if it will reach to it. But you have flour enough already. You needn't spend all this on butter and molasses. Is that all that you have laid by for your old age? Yes, doctor. It's all I has laid up and I wants it all. Every bit. in flour and butter and molasses, that is. He corrected himself. Molasses and some butter. No, it is not me that wants it, but I've got to have it, and that's all there is about it. But, Malcolm, you are getting old, and you should not cut the last plank away yet. I'm seventy-three, come Michaelmas, he said, and I feel more in that since the old woman's took, and I'm thinking maybe I won't need any flour next winter. But maybe you'll be spared many winters yet, and if you spend all you have now, how will you take care of those years? He'll take care, Doctor. I guess I'll trust him. It wouldn't do not to have used that sixty dollars and have sent folks away hungry, would it, Doctor? It would look as if I didn't have much trust in him. Doesn't the book say, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat? What could be said? I mechanically took the sixty dollars and put them in my pocket and was silent. It certainly seemed to be the master speaking. I had once imagined I knew what hospitality meant. End of section 53. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matt Stevens. Section 54 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Stevens. The World Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico and the West Indies. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 54. Canada of the Future. 20th Century. By Agnes C. Lout. The 20th Century belongs to Canada. The production of Sir Wilfrid Laurier, Premier of the Dominion, seems likely to have bigger fulfilment than Canadians themselves realise. What does it mean? Canada stands at the same place in the world's history as England stood in the golden age of Queen Elizabeth. On the threshold of her future as a great nation. Her mental attitude is similar, that of a great awakening, a consciousness of new strength, an exuberance of energy biting hard on the bit to run the race. Mellowed memory of hard-won battles against tremendous odds in the past. For the future, a golden vision opening on vistas too far to follow. They dreamed pretty big in the days of Queen Elizabeth, but they didn't dream big enough for what was to come. And they are dreaming pretty big up in Canada today, but it's hard to forecast the future when a nation the size of all Europe is setting out on the career of her world history. To put it differently, Canada's position is very much the same today as the United States a century ago. Her population is about 7 million. The population of the United States was 7 million in 1810. One was a strip of isolated settlements north and south along the Atlantic seaboard. The other, a string of provinces east and west along the waterways that ramify from the St. Lawrence. Both possessed and were flanked by vast unexplored territory the size of Russia. The United States via Louisiana, 
Canada by the Great Northwest. What the Civil War did for the United States, Confederation did for the Canadian provinces, welded them into a nation. The parallel need not be carried farther. If the same development follows Confederation in Canada as follows the Civil War in the United States, the 20th century will witness the birth and growth of a world power. To no one has the future opening before Canada come as a greater surprise than to Canadians themselves. A few years ago, such a claim as the Premier's would have been regarded as the effusions of the after-dinner speaker. While Canadian politicians were hoping for the honour of being accorded colonial place in the English Parliament, they suddenly awakened to find themselves a nation. They suddenly realised that history, and big history, too, was in the making. Instead of Canada being dependent on the Empire, the Empire's most far-seeing statesmen were looking to Canada for the strength of the British Empire. No longer is there a desire among Canadians for place in the Parliament at Westminster. With a new empire of their own to develop, equal in size to the whole of Europe, Canadian public men realise they have enough to do without taking a hand in European affairs. As the different Canadian provinces came into confederation, they were like beads on a string a thousand miles apart. First were the maritime provinces, with western bounds touching the eastern bounds of Quebec, but in reality, with the settlements of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island separated from the settlements of Quebec by a thousand miles of untracked forest. Only the Ottawa River separated Quebec from Ontario, but one province was French, the other English, aliens to each other in religion, language and customs. A thousand miles of rock-bound, winter-bound wastes lay between Ontario and the scattered settlements of the Red River in Manitoba. Not an interest was in common between the little province of the Middle West and her sisters to the east. Then prairie land came for a thousand miles, and mountains for six hundred miles, before reaching the Pacific province of British Columbia, more completely cut off from other parts of Canada than from Mexico or Panama. In fact, it would have been easier for British Columbia to trade with Mexico and Panama than with the rest of Canada. To bind these far separated patches of settlement, oases in the desert of wilds, into a nation was the object of the union known as the Confederation. But a nation can live only as it trades what it draws from the soil. Naturally, the isolated provinces looked for trade to the United States, just across an invisible boundary. It seemed absurd that the Canadian provinces should try to trade with each other, a thousand miles apart, rather than with the United States, a stone's throw from the door of each province. But the United States erected a tariff wall that Canada could not climb. The struggling dominion was thrown solely on herself, and set about the giant task of linking the provinces together, building railroads from Atlantic to Pacific, canals from tidewater to the Great Lakes. In actual cash, this cost Canada $400 million, not counting land grants and private subscriptions for stock, which would bring up the cost of binding the provinces together to a billion. This was a staggering burden for a country with a smaller population than Greater New York, a burden as big as Japan and Russia assumed for their war, but, like war, the expenditure was a fight for national existence. Without the railroads and canals, the provinces could not have been bound together into a nation. These were Canada's pioneer days, when she was spending more than she was earning, when she bound herself down to grinding poverty and big risks and hard tasks. It was a long pull and a hard pull, but it was a pull altogether. That was Canada's seed time. This is her harvest. That was her night work when she toiled while other nations slept. Now was the awakening when the world sees what she was doing. Railroad men, farmer, miner, manufacturer, all had the same struggle. The big outlay of labour and money at first, the big risk and no profit, the long period of waiting. Canada was laying her foundations of yesterday for the superstructure of prosperity today and tomorrow, the new empire. When one surveys the country as a whole, the facts are so big they are bewildering. In the first place, the area of the Dominion is within a few thousand miles as large as all Europe. To be more specific, you could spread the surface of Italy and Spain and Turkey and Greece and Austria over eastern Canada 
and you would still have an area uncovered and the least alone bigger than the German Empire. England spread flat on the surface of eastern Canada would just serve to cover the maritime provinces nicely, leaving uncovered Quebec, which is a third bigger than Germany, Ontario, which is bigger than France, and Labrador, Ungava, which is about the size of Austria. In the west you could spread the British Isles out flat, and you would not cover Manitoba, with her new boundaries extending to Hudson Bay. It would take a country the size of France to cover the province of Saskatchewan, a country larger than Germany to cover Alberta, two countries the size of Germany to cover British Columbia and the Yukon, and there would still be left uncovered the northern half of the west, an area the size of European Russia. No old world monarch from William the Conqueror to Napoleon could boast of such a realm. People are fond of tracing ancestry back to feudal barons of the Middle Ages. What feudal baron of the Middle Ages were lord of the outer marches was heir to such heritage as Canada may claim? Think of it. Combine all the feudatory domains of the Rhine and the Danube, you have not so vast an estate as a single western province. Or gather up all the estates of England's midland counties in eastern shires and borderlands, you have not enough land to fill one of Canada's inland seas. Lake Superior. If there were a population in eastern Canada equal to France, and Quebec alone would support a population equal to France, and in Manitoba equal to the British Isles, and in Saskatchewan equal to France, and in Alberta equal to Germany, and in British Columbia equal to Germany, ignoring the Yukon, Mackenzie River, Kiwaran, and Labrador, taking only those parts of Canada where climate has been tested and land surveyed, Canada could support 200 million people. The figures are staggering, but they are not half so improbable as the actual facts of what has taken place in the United States. America's population was acquired against hard odds. There were no railroads when the movement to America began. The only ocean goers were sailboats of slow progress and great discomfort. In Europe was profound ignorance regarding America. Today all this changed. Canada begins where the United States left off. The whole world is gridironed with railroads. Fast Atlantic liners offer greater comfort to the immigrant than he has known at home. Ignorance of America has given place to almost romantic glamour. Just when the free lands of the United States are exhausted and the government is putting up bars to keep out the immigrant, Canada is in a position to open her doors wide. Less than a fortieth of the entire West is inhabited. Of the great clay belt of North Ontario, only a patch on the southern edge is populated. The same may be said of the great forest belt of Quebec. These facts are the magnet that will attract the immigrant to Canada. The United States wants no more immigrants. And the movement to Canada has begun. To her shores are thronging the hosts of the old world's dispossessed, in multitudes greater than any army that ever marched to conquest under Napoleon. When the history of America comes to be written in a hundred years, it will not be the record of a slaughter field with contending nations battling for the mastery, or generals wading to glory in their deep in blood. It will be an account of the most wonderful race movement, the most wonderful experiment in democracy the world has known. It is not given to all emigres to become great capitalists or great leaders. Some who have the opportunity have not the ability, and the majority would not, for all the rewards that greatness offers, Choose careers that entail long years of nerve-wracking, unflagging labour. But on a minor scale, the same process of making over it takes place. One case will illustrate. Some years before immigration to Kendler had become general, two or three hundred Icelanders were landed in Winnipeg destitute. For some reason which I have forgotten, probably the quarantine of an immigrant, the Icelanders could not be housed in the government immigration hall. They were absolutely without money, household goods, property of any sort except clothing, and that was scant. The men having but one suit of the poorest clothes, the women thin homespun dresses so worn one can see many of them had no underwear. The people represented the very dregs of poverty. Withdrawing to the vacant lots in the west end of Winnipeg, at that time a mere town, the newcomers slept for the first nights, herded in the rooms of an Icelander opulent enough to have rented a house. Those who could not gain admittance to this house slept under the high-board sidewalks, then a feature of the new town. 
I remember as a child watching them sit on the high sidewalk till it was dark, then roll under. Fortunately it was summer, but it was useless for people in this condition to go bare to the prairie farm. To make land yield, you must have house and barns and stock and implements. I doubt if these people had as much as a jackknife. I remember how two or three of the older women used to sit crying each night in despair till they disappeared in the crowded house. Fourteen or twenty of them to a room. Within a week, the men were all at work, sawing wood from door to door at a dollar and a half a cord. The women out by the day, washing at a dollar a day. Within a month, they had earned enough to buy lumber and tar paper. Tar papered shanties went up like mushrooms in the vacant lots. Before winter, each family had bought a cow and chickens. I shall not betray confidence by telling where the cow and chickens slept. Those immigrants were not desirable neighbours. Other people moved hastily away from the region. Such a condition would not be tolerated now when there are spacious immigration halls and sanitary inspectors to see that cows and people do not house under the same roof. What with work in peddling milk, by spring the people were able to move out on the free prairie farms. Today, those Icelanders own farms clear of debt, own stock that would be considered the possession of a capitalist in Iceland, and have money in the savings banks. Their sons and daughters have had university educations, and have entered every avenue of life. Farming, trading, practicing medicine, actually teaching English in English schools. Some are members of parliament. It was a hard beginning, but it was a rebirth to a new life. They are now among the nation builders of the West. But it would be a mistake to conclude that Canada's nation builders consisted entirely of poor people. The race movement has not been a leaderless mob. Princes, nobles, adventurers, soldiers of fortunes, were the pathfinders who blazed the trail to Canada. Glory, pure and simple, was the aim that lured the first comers across the trackless seas. Adventurous young aristocrats, members of the old order, led the First Nation builders to America, and, all unconscious of destiny, laid the foundations of the new order. The story of their adventures and work is the history of Canada. It is a new experience in the world's history, this race movement that has built up the United States and is now building up Canada. Other great race movements have been a tearing down of high places, the upward scramble of one class on the backs of the deposed class. Instead of levelling down, Canada's nation building is levelling up. This, then, is the empire, the size of all the nations in Europe, bigger than Napoleon's wildest dreams of conquest, to which Canada has awakened. End of section 54 this recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matt Stevens. Section 55 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Read for LibriVox.org. South America, Part 1. Stories of the Incas. Historical Note. About the year 1200, a clan or tribe of Peruvian Indians, known as the Incas, set out on a career of conquest that made them, within three centuries, the rulers of a great part of western South America. Over this vast territory, which included what are now the highlands of Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, and northern Chile, the Incas, or Children of the Sun, established themselves as a ruling class or nobility. Their government, which was highly centralized, was administered by a monarch who was regarded as both king and god, assisted by a chief priest, a council, district rulers, and a host of minor officials. By the 16th century, the kingdom of the Incas had reached a high degree of prosperity and civilization. The land appears to have been owned in common by the different tribes, and all able-bodied persons were obliged to assist in working it. Agriculture was highly developed, and much of the country was covered with a network of irrigating canals. The buildings of the Incas were put together without mortar, yet often the blocks of stone fitted so exactly that a knife blade could not be thrust between. They were also famous road builders, constructing military highways through mountains and over valleys, one of them at least 2,000 miles in length. They excelled in the manufacture of textiles and pottery, possessed some knowledge of astronomy, medicine, and surgery, and knew how to smelt and mold metals. 
In 1531, Peru was invaded by a small band of Spaniards commanded by Francisco Pizarro. Their guns, armor, and horses gave the invaders so great an advantage over the natives that, in spite of the disparity of numbers, they were able to conquer and enslave this great empire, and to destroy, in their greed for gold, the remarkable civilization that was being slowly built up in this out-of-the-way corner of the world. End of section 55. This recording is in the public domain. Section 56 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World's Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 56. The Stolen Child of the Inca, Before 1532. By Sir Clements R. Markham. Beautiful Princess McKay had been promised in marriage to the chief of the Ayamarcas, but her father finally gave her hand to the Inca Roca, of the tribe of the Wylacans. On this account, war arose between the two tribes. The Wylacans at length begged for peace. This was granted, but with a secret understanding that they would steal Cusi Walpa, the little son and heir of the Inca Roca, and deliver him up to Toque Capac, chief of the Ayamarcas. The story had been handed down from the time before the coming of the Pizarro. The Editor In accordance with the agreement, a treacherous plot was laid. An earnest request was sent to the Inca that his heir, the son Cusi Walpa, might be allowed to visit his mother's relations, so as to become acquainted with them. Quite unsuspicious, the Inca consented, and sent the child, who was then about eight years of age, to Miku Cancha, or Paupu, the chief place of the Wylacans, with about twenty attendants. The young prince was received with great festivities, which lasted for several days. It was summer time. The sun was scorching, and the child passed his time in a veranda or trellis work called Arapa, covered with bright flowers. One day it was announced that the whole tribe must march to some distance to harvest the crops. As it was still very hot, the Wylican chief insisted that the young prince should remain in the shade and not accompany the harvesters, who had to go a considerable distance under the blazing sun. The prince's attendants consented, and all the tribe, old and young, boys and girls, marched up the hills to the harvesting, singing songs with choruses. All was bright sunshine, and their haile, or harvest song, was in praise of the shade. Seek the shadow, seek the shade, hide us in the blessed shade. Ya ha ha ha, ya ha ha. Where is it? Where, where, oh where? Here it is, here, here, oh here. Ya ha ha ha, ya ha ha. Where the pretty cantut blooms, Footnote, flocks, end of footnote, where the chiwa's flower smiles. Footnote, thrush, chihuahua is a calciolaria, end of footnote, where the sweet amanke droops. Footnote, amaryllis aurea, end of footnote, ya ha ha ha, ya ha ha. There it is, there, there, oh there, yes, we answer, there, oh there. Ya ha ha ha, ya ha ha. The child listened to the sounds of singing as the harvesters passed away out of sight, and then played among the flowers surrounded by his personal attendants. The place was entirely deserted. When the sound of the singers had died away in the distance, there was profound silence. Suddenly, without the slightest warning, the war cry, Atua, Atua, was heard in all directions, and the little party was surrounded by armed men. The Orajones struggled valorously in defense of their precious charge until they were all killed when the young prince was carried off. Toke Kapak waited to hear the result of his treacherous raid in his chief abode, called Ahuayra Cancha, or the place of woof and warp. When the raiders returned, they entered their chief's presence with the young prince, shouting, Behold the prisoner we have brought you. 
The chief said, Is this the child of Mama Mackay, who should have been my wife? The prince answered, I am the son of the great Inca Roca and of Mama Mackay. Unsoftened by his tender years, or by his likeness to his beautiful mother, the savage chief ordered the child to be taken out and killed. Then a strange thing happened. Surrounded by cruel enemies with no pitying eye to look upon him, young Kusi Hualpa, a child of eight years, stood up to defy them. He must show himself a child of the sun and maintain the honor of his race. With a look of indignation beyond his years, he uttered a curse upon his captors. His shrill young voice was heard amidst the portentous silence of his enemies. "'I tell you,' he cried, "'that as sure as you murder me, there will fall such a curse upon you and your children that you will all come to an end without any memory being left of your nation. He ceased, and to the astonishment of his captors, tears of blood flowed from his eyes. Yawar wakak! Yawar wakak! He weeps blood, they shouted in horror. His curse, and this unheard of phenomenon, filled the Ayamarcas with superstitious fear. They recoiled from the murder. Toke Kapak and his people thought that the curse from so young a child and the tears of blood betokened some great mystery. They dared not kill him. He stood up in the midst unhurt. Toke Kapak saw that his people would not kill the young prince then, or with their own hands at any time. Yet he did not give up his intention of gratifying his thirst for vengeance. He resolved to take the child's life by a course of starvation and exposure. He gave him into the charge of shepherds, who tended flocks of llamas on the lofty height overlooking the great plain of Suriti, where the climate is exceedingly rigorous. The shepherds had orders to reduce his food day by day until he died. Young Kusi Hualpa had the gift of making friends. The shepherds did not starve him, though for a year he was exposed to great hardships. No doubt, however, the life he led on those frozen heights improved his health and invigorated his frame. The Inca was told that his son had mysteriously disappeared and that his attendants were also missing. The Huaylican chief expressed sorrow and pretended that diligent searches had been made. Inca Roca suspected the Ayamarcas, but did not then attack them, lest, if the child was alive, they might kill him. As time went on, the bereaved father began to despair of ever seeing his beloved son again. Meanwhile, the prince was well watched by the shepherds, and by a strong guard which had been sent to ensure his remaining in unknown captivity. But help was at hand. One of the favorites of Tokay Kapak, named Chimpu Irma, or the Fallen Halo, had probably been a witness of the impressive scene when the child wept blood. At all events, she was filled with pity and the desire to befriend the forlorn prince. She was a native of Anta, a small town at no great distance from Cusco. As a friend of Toke Kapak, she was free to go where she liked, within his dominions and those of the chief of Anta, who was her father. Chimpu Irma persuaded her relations and friends at Anta to join with her in an attempt to rescue the young prince. It had been arranged by the shepherd and guards that on a certain day, some boys, including Kusi Hualpa, should have a race up to the top of a hill in front of the shepherd's huts. Hearing this, Chimpu Irma stationed her friends from Anta, well-armed, on the other side of the same hill. The race was started, and the prince reached the summit first, where he was taken up in the arms of his Anta friends, who made a rapid retreat. The other boys gave the alarm, and the jailers, shepherds and guards, followed in chase. On the banks of a small lake, called Wailapunu, the men of Anta, finding that they were being overtaken, made a stand. There was a fierce battle, which resulted in the total defeat of the Ayamarcas. The men of Anta continued their journey, and brought the prince safely to their town, where he was received with great rejoicings. Kusi Hualpa quite won the hearts of the people of Anta. They could not bear to part with him, and they kept him with great secrecy, delaying to send the joyful news to the Inca. Anta is a small town built up the side of a hill, which bounds the vast plain of Suriti to the south. There is a glorious view from it, but the climate is severe. At last, after nearly a year, the Anta people sent messengers to inform the Inca. The child had been given up for lost. All hope had been abandoned. 
Roca examined the messengers himself, but still he felt doubt. He feared the news was too good to be true. He secretly sent a man he could trust, as one seeking charity, to Anta to find out the truth. The Inca's emissary returned with assurances that the young prince was certainly liberated and was at Anta. The Inca at last gave way to rejoicing, all doubt being removed. Principal lords were sent with rich presents of gold and silver to the chief of Anta, requesting him to send back the heir to the throne. The chief replied that all his people wished that Cusihualpa could remain, for they felt much love for the boy, yet they were bound to restore him to his father. He declined to receive the presents, but he made one condition. It was that he and his people should be accepted as relations of the Inca. So the young prince came back to his parents and was joyfully received. Inca Roca then visited Anta in person, and declared that the chief and his people were, from henceforward, raised to the rank of Orihones. The Huilicans made abject submission, and, as Cusi Hualpa generously interceded for them, they were forgiven. End of section 56。section 57 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico and West Indies read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt Machu Picchu, a ruined city of the Incas Photograph, page 288 By the Peruvian expedition of 1912, led by Professor Hiram Bingham, the marvellous ruins of Machu Picchu were explored. Professor Bingham believes that this was the Inca city of refuge. It was perched upon a lofty mountain ridge and protected by stupendous precipices. It was a city of narrow streets and a vast number of stairways, often winding ingeniously between two mighty ledges, and occasionally barely wide enough for one person. Sometimes both stairs and balustrades were cut from a single stone. There were fountains or tanks of water, and there were carefully built stone houses. Besides having the ability to plan and carry out great architectural and engineering works, the people who built this city were exceedingly skillful in the making of pottery, and they knew well how to cultivate the ground. It is evident that not only the bits of land for a long distance around the city, but every foot of the numerous terraces within the town were made use of for agriculture. Machu Picchu was not discovered by the Spaniards, and was indeed practically unknown until the first visit of Professor Bingham in 1911. It is the largest and most important ruin discovered in South America since the days of the Spanish conquest. For the privilege of presenting the remarkable picture of Machu Picchu here reproduced, the editor is indebted to the kindness of Professor Hiram Bingham, director of the Peruvian expedition of 1912, under the auspices of Yale University and the National Geographic Society. End of section 57. This recording is in the public domain. Section 58 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hernán Ibarra. The World's Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tapan. Section 58. How Pizarro Captured the Inca by William Hicklin Prescott. It was not long before sunset when the van of the royal procession entered the gates of the city. First came some hundreds of the menials, employed to clear the path of every obstacle and singing songs of triumph as they came, which in our ears, says one of the conquerors, sounded like the songs of hell. Then followed other bodies of different ranks and dressed in different liveries. Some wore a showy stuff, checkered white and red like the squares of the chessboard. Others were clad in pure white, bearing hammers or maces of silver or copper. And the guards, together with those in immediate attendance on the prince, were distinguished by a rich assured livery and a profusion of gay ornaments, while the large pendants attached to the ears indicated the Peruvian noble. Elevated high above his vassals came the Inca Tahualpa, 
borne on a sedan or open litter, on which was a sort of throne made of massive gold of inestimable value. The palanquin was lined with richly colored plumes of tropical birds, and studded with shining plates of gold and silver. The monarch's satire was much richer than on the preceding evening. Round his neck was suspended a collar of emeralds of uncommon size and brilliancy. His short hair was decorated with golden ornaments, and imperial borla encircled his temples. The bearing of the Inca was sedate and dignified, and from his lofty station he looked down on the multitudes below with an air of composure, like one accustomed to command. As the leading files of the procession entered the great square, larger, says an old chronicler, than any square in Spain, they opened to the right and left for the royal retinue to pass. Everything was conducted with admirable order. The monarch was permitted to traverse the plaza in silence, and not a Spaniard was to be seen. When some five or six thousand of his people had entered the place, Atahualpa halted, and turning round with an inquiring look, demanded, Where are these strangers? At this moment, Fray Vicente de Valverde, a Dominican friar, Pizarro chaplain, and afterward bishop of Cusco, came forward with his breviary, or as other accounts say, a Bible in one hand and a crucifix in the other, and approaching the Inca, told him that he came by order of his commander to expound to him the doctrine of the true faith, for which purpose the Spaniards had come from a great distance to his country. The friar then explained, as clearly as he could, the mysterious doctrine of the Trinity, and ascending high in his account, began with the creation of man, thence passed to his fall, to his subsequent redemption by Jesus Christ, to the crucifixion and the ascension, when the Savior left the apostle Peter as his vicegerent upon earth. This power had been transmitted to the successors of the apostles, good and wise men, who under the title of popes, held authority over all powers and potentates on earth. One of the last of these popes had commissioned the Spanish emperor, the most mighty monarch in the world, to conquer and convert the natives in this western hemisphere, and his general, Francisco Pizarro, had now come to execute this important mission. The friar concluded with beseeching the Peruvian monarch to receive him kindly, to abjure the errors of his own faith, and embrace that of the Christians now proffered to him, the only one by which he could hope for salvation, and furthermore to acknowledge himself a tributary of Emperor Charles V, who in that event would aid and protect him as his loyal vassal. Whether Atahualpa possessed himself of every link in the curious chain of argument by which the monk connected Pizarro with St. Peter may be doubted. It is certain, however, that he must have had very incorrect notions of the Trinity, if, as Garcilaso states, the interpreter Felipillo explained it by saying that the Christians believed in three gods and one god, and that made four. But there is no doubt he perfectly comprehended that the drift of the discourse was to persuade him to resign his scepter and acknowledge the supremacy of another. The eyes of the Indian monarch flashed fire, and his dark brow grew darker as he replied, I will be no man's tributary. I am greater than any prince upon earth. Your emperor may be a great prince, I do not doubt it, when I see he has sent his subjects so far across the waters, and I am willing to hold him as a brother. As for the pope, of whom you speak, he must be crazy to talk of giving away countries which do not belong to him. For my faith, he continued, I will not change it. Your own God, as you say, was put to death by the very man whom he created, but mine, he concluded, pointing to his deity, then alas sinking in glory behind the mountains. My God still lives in the heavens and looks down on his children. He then demanded of Valverde by what authority he had said these things. The friar pointed to the book which he held as his authority. Atahualpa, taking it, turned over the pages a moment. Then, as the insult he had received probably flashed across his mind, he threw it down with vehemence and exclaimed, Tell your comrades that they shall give me an account of their doings in my land. I will not go from here 
till they have made me full satisfaction for all the wrongs they have committed. The friar, greatly scandalized by the indignity offered to the sacred volume, stayed only to pick it up, and hastening to Pizarro, informed him of what had been done, exclaiming at the same time, Do you not see that while we stand here wasting our breath in talking with this dog, full of pride as he is, the fields are filling with Indians? Send on at once, I absolve you. Pizarro saw that the hour had come. He waved a white scarf in the air, the appointed signal. The fatal gun was fired from the fortress. Then, springing into the squares, the Spanish captain and his followers shouted the old war cry of, Saint Hago and at them! It was answered by the battle cry of every Spaniard in the city, as, rushing from the avenues of the great halls in which they were concealed, they poured into the plaza, horse and foot, each in his own dark column, and threw themselves into the midst of the Indian crowd. The latter, taken by surprise, stunned by the report of artillery and muskets, the echoes of which reverberated like thunder from the surrounding buildings, and blinded by the smoke which rolled in sulfurous volumes along the square, were seized with a panic. They knew not whither to fly for refuge from the coming ruin. Nobles and commoners, all were trampled down under the fierce charge of the cavalry, who dealt their blows right and left without sparing, while their swords, flashing through the thick gloom, carried dismay into the heart of the wretched natives, who now, for the first time, saw the horse and his rider in all their terrors. They made no resistance, as indeed they had no weapons with which to make it. Every avenue to escape was closed, for the entrance to the square was choked up with the dead bodies of men who had perished in vain efforts to fly, and such was the agony of the survivors under the terrible pressure of their assailants, that a large body of Indians, by their convulsive struggles, burst through the wall of stone and dried clay, which formed part of the boundary of the plaza. It fell, leaving an opening of more than a hundred paces, through which multitudes now found their way into the country, still hotly pursued by the cavalry, who, leaping the fallen rubbish, hung on the rear of the fugitives, striking them down in all directions. Meanwhile the fight, or rather massacre, continued hot around the Inca, whose person was the great object of their assault. His faithful nobles, rallying about him, threw themselves in the way of the assailants, and strove, by tearing them from their saddles, or at least by offering their own bodies as a mark for their vengeance, to shield their beloved master. It is said, by some authorities, that they carried weapons concealed under their clothes. If so, it availed them little, as it is not pretended that they used them. But the most timid animal will defend itself when at bay. That they did not so in the present instance is proof that they had no weapons to use. Yet they still continued to force back the cavaliers, clinging to their horses with dying grasp, and as one was cut down, another taking the place of his fallen comrade with a loyalty truly affecting. The Indian monarch, stunned and bewildered, saw his faithful subjects falling round him without fully comprehending his situation. The litter on which he rode heaved to and fro as the mighty press swayed backwards and forwards, and he gazed on the overwhelming ruin like some forlorn mariner who, tossed about in his bark by the furious element, sees the lightning's flash and hears the thunder bursting around him with the consciousness that he can do nothing to avert his fate. At length, Weary with the work of destruction, the Spaniards, as the shades of the evening grew deeper, felt afraid that the royal prize might, after all, elude them, and some of the cavaliers made a desperate attempt to end the fray at once by taking Atahualpa's life. But Pizarro, who was nearest his person, called out with his stentorian voice, Let no one who values his life strike at the Inca, and, stretching out his arm to shield him, received a wound on the hand from one of his own men, the only wound received by a Spaniard in the action. The struggle now became fiercer than ever round the royal litter. It reeled more and more, and at length several of the nobles who supported it, having been slain, it was overturned, and the Indian prince would have come with violence to the ground, 
had not his fall been broken by the efforts of Pizarro and some other of the cavaliers, who caught him in their arms. The imperial Borla was instantly snatched from his temples by a soldier named Estete, and the unhappy monarch, strongly secured, was removed to a neighboring building where he was carefully guarded. End of section 58. This recording is in the public domain. Section 59 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 59. The Golden Ransom, 1532. By Charles Bradford Hudson. The following extract is from a novel whose scenes are laid in the time of the coming of the Spaniards to Peru. Cristoval is a Spaniard who has shown himself friendly to the captive Inca and has advised him to offer a golden ransom. The Inca's offer of the vast amount of gold to secure his freedom is historic. The Editor The Spaniards were unprepared for the splendor of their entertainment. Banqueting was a function which the Peruvians had developed to a degree of elegance hardly equaled in Christendom. The table was laden not only with the choicest viands of the region, but with a lavish display of plate that dazzled the eyes of the guests and rendered the vidor suddenly speechless. The Inca watched closely to observe the effect of the gold, and a moment convinced him that Cristoval was right. He noted the quick lighting of Pizarro's Saturnine countenance, and the significant glance at his companions, though the leader gave no other sign. Some of his officers retained less of their equipoise, and there were ejaculations of the names of saints, the faith, the cross, the sacrament, and the like, invoked to witness their astonishment. Mendoza broke into a coarse guffaw and slapped his neighbor on the back. De Soto, Hernando, Pizarro, Cristoval, and two or three others, the cavaliers of gentle breeding, stood with faces reddened or pale with humiliation, until Pizarro put an end to the exhibition with a stern, Attention, signors! For the sake of heaven, be silent! Ye are at the table of a gentleman! An uncomfortable constraint of some minutes' duration followed the seating of the company. The Inca meditated upon the manifest craving of his guests for the tableware, a greediness to him preposterous. The Peruvians were diligent miners of the two precious metals, not because they assigned to them any especial value, but for the reason that they were beautiful and adaptable to purposes of decoration. The idea of their use as a medium of exchange, that they could be representative of the value of other things, of the luxuries, comforts, and even necessities of life, was beyond the Inca's conception. Money was a thing unknown in Tavantinsuyu, and Cristoval had not yet explained to him its use in Christendom, but Atahulpa saw the Spaniards display an interest in his plate which seemed emotional, even passionate, and which made them oblivious not only of the common courtesy due to him, as their host, but of their own dignity. The unaccountable appetite excited at once his wonder and scorn. After a moment, however, he recalled the obligations of hostship, and with Filipilo's help engaged different ones in conversation. Pizarro swallowed his irritation and took part with more graciousness than Atahualpa had suspected him capable of showing, and the chill which had threatened to mar the evening gradually wore away. There were several of his nobles present, and they joined as freely in this sociability as circumstances permitted. For at the royal table, the extreme formality of the court was for the time suspended, and the rigid distinction of prince and subject laid aside. At last, the table was cleared, cups were served and filled with chica, and the Inca, dipping his fingertips into the liquor, filliped a few drops into the air as a libation to inti the sun. He raised his cup and bowed to Pizarro. 
the latter responded and in accordance with an ancient custom of the peruvians remarkably like our own the inca touched his cup to that of his guest and they drank together thus with each of the company in turn at a hulpa, took a sip of chica this ceremony completed he turned again to the spanish commander and said with nonchalance i perceive viracocha pizarro that your people are attracted by some of our metals especially so by gold it is something you have in your own country it is something which some of us have in our own country my lord inca replied pizarro and of which more of us have little but something by the faith which all of us are pushing heartily to get ah said the inca but you possess a metal of far greater value in your iron viracocha it hath surprised me that you can set so much importance upon one of comparatively little worth but i would ask a question can freedom be purchased with gold surprised by its suddenness pizarro seemed to fail for a moment to find a reply can freedom be purchased with gold viracocha pizarro repeated at a pizarro recovered himself and replied with emphasis by the crucifix that it can provided gold enough be offered provided gold enough be offered repeated the inca unable to conceal his eagerness then hear me general pizarro promise me liberty and i will cover the floor of this room with gold the company ceased talking pizarro looked at him in astonishment while a smile of incredulity went around the table atahualpa misinterpreted the silence and the expression taking them to mean that his offer was too meagre he looked from one to another for a moment then sprang to his feet and striding to the wall stretched his hand above his head as far as he could reach i will fill the room to this height with gold Viracochus, is it enough he demanded his eyes blazing with hardly suppressed excitement is it enough still the spaniards were silent dumb with amazement several had arisen mad whispered one the inca stood waiting for their reply his arm upraised his commanding figure drawn to its full height glittering in the lamplight with gems and golden decorations while his dark eyes gleamed from beneath the fringe of his ilotu as he surveyed the astonished veracoches is it not enough he demanded again then a like amount of silver hold in the name of heaven exclaimed cristoval warningly in quichua pizarro regained his voice what sayest thou peralta can he do it ask the noble beside thee the noble answered with emphasis in the affirmative then tis done shouted pizarro unable to restrain his excitement done agreed my lord inca we accept your offer make good your terms and you are a free man at liberty to go and come without let or hindrance here's my hand upon it wait we'll give you an instrument in writing zapato step out and send an orderly for my secretary hernando mount a chair and scratch a mark with thy dagger where the inca put his hand my lord deign to raise your hand again by the gods senor what say you to it a hundred thousand demons do you believe your ears we are all rich men ask the noble again peralta whether he can do it ask another of them saith he yes art sure blood and wounds and gods of war ha ha what say ye to it signors pizarro's cold reserve had gone cristoval had rarely seen him smile before now he laughed even roared not pleasantly and his pale countenance showed unaccustomed color the vidor had pulled several times at his sleeve unheeded pizarro he whispered pizarro hold off a bit he would have offered more i am sure of it pizarro turned upon him with impatience oh a curse upon thy money gluttony rogelio hath it no bounds art insatiable be silent he had opened his mouth to offer more i'll swear it oh misery snuffled the vidor as he turned away the room was in a hubbub every man was on his feet talking at the top of his voice and gesticulating now the chica flowed without stint when the secretary entered and set about the work of drawing up the agreement 
they crowded upon him explaining suggesting and advising until in despair he appealed to the commander and they were ordered back while pizarro dictated the document rogelio was a notary and the paper was duly attested and sworn to the inca looking on with interest and making his mark at last in accordance with a confusion of instructions from the wrought-up spaniards the business finished he retired with a faint significant smile to cristoval but his going was almost unnoted by the others and they lingered over their chica and their jubilation until the small hours when the guard was summoned to carry certain ones to their quarters rogelio was hauled from a corner and awoke to bitter tears and incoherent reproaches hurled against pizarro's want of commercial sense End of section fifty nine this recording is in the public domain section sixty of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume eleven canada south america central america mexico and the west indies edited by eva march tappan section sixty the execution of atahualpa fifteen thirty three by w h davenport adams having paid a magnificent and right royal ransom atahualpa naturally demanded to be set at liberty i have no doubt that this was the original intention of pizarro that he would have released him under such conditions as would have ensured his subordination to the spaniards but the arrival of almagro and his men brought about a complete change of affairs from the first they were inimical to the inca partly perhaps from a jealous feeling that he should have been captured by pizarro and his soldiers partly because they feared that whatever gold might come in would still be claimed as a portion of his ransom this unfavorableness of sentiment was early detected by atahualpa who when hernando pizarro took leave of him exclaimed i am sorry that you are going for when you are gone i know the fat man and the one-eyed man that is Requelma, the king's treasurer and almagro will combine to kill me he had another and even more powerful enemy in the interpreter Filipillo. thus it came to pass that the question of the disposal of atahualpa was much discussed in the camp under influences which did not bode him well about the same time rumors reached pizarro of the gathering of the peruvian army as if it had suddenly awakened from its long lethargy and designed to strike a blow for the national independence brave as the spanish captain was and conscious of the superiority he derived from the arms and discipline of his men he knew that they were but a handful in the midst of millions and that at any time a well-conceived combination or a skilful surprise might set aside the superiority on which he relied and overwhelm him with ruin he could not afford therefore to throw away a single chance and the release of atahualpa might have been such a chance as it would have afforded the peruvians a centre a rallying point so to speak and a legitimate and in their belief heaven-sent leader on the other hand if he held him prisoner he was liable to a thousand annoyances and anxieties atahualpa would naturally intrigue for his liberation or to effect his escape or the peruvians would be incited to some desperate attempt on behalf of their imprisoned monarch pizarro was perplexed and uneasy for throughout his peruvian expedition he was a close copyist of cortez and here was a dilemma in which he had no example of cortez to guide him in adopting the principle that whatever was expedient was just he adopted one which cortez was not fond of recognizing his hesitation is shown by the circumstance that he published a formal and official document fully discharging the inca of further obligation in respect to the ransom though its exact terms had not been and perhaps never would have been fulfilled yet at the same time he expressed an opinion that considerations of safety and security rendered necessary the detention of the inca until additional reinforcements came from spain while he thus wavered the rumors of an indian attack revived an army it was said was assembling at quito and would be supported by thirty thousand caribs and many tongues connected with this menacing movement the name of atahualpa when pizarro repeated the story to chilacuchima the gray-haired veteran pronounced it a calumny pizarro next went to the inca himself 
what treason is it you are meditating against me against me who have treated you with honour and trusted in your words as in those of a brother why do you mock me replied the inca why are you always saying these jests of me what are we i and my people how can we conquer men so valiant as yours do not cast these jibes at me this he said we are told with great composure but he did not convince pizarro who remembered that he had often spoken with the same coolness and astuteness so that the spaniards had been surprised to see such prudence in a barbarian perceiving that he had not removed the general's suspicions out of huapa again asserted his innocence am i not he said a captive in your hands how could i conceive such a design as you speak of when i should be the first victim and little do you know of my people if you think they would enter upon it without my orders when the very birds in my dominions would not dare to fly in opposition to my will but the belief of the troops in a general rising of the natives deepened every hour a large force it was said had been concentrated at guama jucho some ninety miles from the camp pizarro seems to have shared their apprehensions he caused the inca to be loaded with fetters he doubled his patrols and went the rounds in person to see that vigilant watch was kept the soldiers slept on their arms the horses were all saddled and bridled in readiness for immediate service what was more to the purpose two indian spies were sent out to reconnoitre the enemy's position they returned with the information that the peruvian army was slowly advancing through a mountainous district that atahualpa had at first ordered it to retreat but had afterwards cancelled the order and named the hour and place at which the attack was to be delivered saying that if it was delayed he should be put to death the soldiers and especially those of Almagro's party were more clamorous than ever and openly declared that atahualpa's death was essential to the safety of the spaniards they were supported by Requelma, the treasurer and other royal officers who had accompanied Almagro to the camp pizarro still shrank from so extreme a measure as the death of his prisoner and hernando de soto and a few others nobly protested against it asserting that there was not sufficient evidence of his guilt it occurred to pizarro to dispatch soto at the head of a small force to reconnoitre the country about guamachucho and ascertain if the rumours of warlike movements were based on fact or fictitious but while soto was absent there came to the camp at Caxap malca a couple of indians who were attached to the spanish army and they declared that the peruvians were only three leagues from Caxamalca and would attack on that or the following night the excitement then became so intense that pizarro consented to bring the inca to immediate trial the usual formalities were observed pizarro and almagro presided as judges a doctor of laws acted for the prosecution and an advocate was assigned to the prisoner twelve charges drawn up in the form of interrogatories were preferred of these the most important were that the inca had ordered the assassination of his brother and fomented a conspiracy against the spaniards he was also accused of idolatrous practices and of lavishly and unprofitably expending the revenues of the kingdom since the conquest of prosecuting unjust wars and wasting his estates upon his kinsmen it can hardly be said that any of these matters came within the cognizance of an invading power except the alleged conspiracy but they seem to have been formally investigated the principal witnesses were the two indians whose evidence was wholly unsupported the judges however declared altahuapa guilty and sentenced him to be burnt at the stake he was offered another form of death if he embraced christianity a religion which could hardly have been recommended to him by the conduct of his spanish professors an angry discussion followed the declaration of the sentence many of the spaniards protested against its being carried out they were not insensible to the claims of honour justice and good faith and insisted that pizarro was bound by the promise he had given they even suggested that the inca should be transferred to spain where the charges against him could be examined by the proper tribunals they denied the authority of the court that had condemned him and impugned the validity of the evidence brought before it in all this they were fully justified the trial was a gross outrage on the law of nations their sole error lay in supposing that any spanish tribunal had a right to sit in judgment on an independent prince their courageous and manly protest failed however against the bloodthirstiness and panic fears of the majority and all that remained for them was to record in writing their sense of the iniquity of a procedure which has left an indelible blot on the spanish name we acknowledge much force however in the reasoning of the historian that this vehement debate and the large majority against atahualpa militate against the common belief that his death was the result of a previous and stern resolve on the part of the spanish commander i am convinced that pizarro shared in what was obviously the opinion of most of his soldiers that the inca had secretly ordered military preparations and that he regarded his death as an urgent measure of self-preservation 
it must be admitted that this argument does not absolve him from the guilt attaching to so cruel and unprecedented an outrage but it furnishes an excuse which will be accepted by persons capable of calmly considering the position of the spaniards and the hopes and fears by which they were swayed the whole transaction is an illustration of the great truth which common experience is continually demonstrating that one ill deed inevitably leads to another and that good cannot come out of evil the invasion of peru was the initial crime and it necessitated a long series of crimes over the record of which our shocked humanity may well turn pale when the sentence was communicated to the inca his emotion was uncontrollable with tears in his eyes he exclaimed what have i or my children done that i should meet such a fate turning to bizarro he continued reproachfully and from your hands you who have received so much kindness and friendliness from my people you with whom i have shared my troubles you whom i have loaded with benefits he implored him to spare his life promising double the ransom already paid if only time were given him to collect it and offering any guarantee that might be required for the safety of the spanish army down to the meanest soldier bizarro listened to this touching appeal with tears i myself says an eye-witness saw the general weep but though he wept he did not perhaps he could not relent and when altahuapa found that death was inevitable he prepared to meet it with a dignity worthy of his rank and race by sound of trumpet the inca's doom was proclaimed in the great square of caxamalca and two hours after sunset on the twenty ninth of august it was carried into execution altahuapa was brought to the place in chains with father valverde who had affixed his signature to the sentence by his side actively labouring to convert him to christianity even at the last hour when the royal victim was bound to the stake with the faggots heaped around him the father held up a cross imploring him to embrace it and be baptized and promising that if he did so the painful death to which he had been sentenced should be commuted for the milder form of the garret this argument proved effectual he consented to abjure his own religion and receive baptism the ceremony was performed by valverde and the new convert received the name of juan de atahuapa he then expressed his desire that his remains might be interred with those of his maternal ancestors at quito and commended his young children to the care and protection of pizarro with stern composure he submitted himself to the hands of the executioner and was suddenly strangled while the spanish soldiers around him muttered their credos for the welfare of his soul his body that night was exposed in the great square and on the following morning interred with solemn funeral pomp in the church of san francisco pizarro and the principal cavaliers attended in morning garb and the troops listened attentively to the service read and chanted by father valverde in the middle of it a loud lamentation was heard outside the church the doors were suddenly burst open and many indian women the wives and sisters of the murdered inca swept up the central aisle and with tears and sobs prostrated themselves around the corpse they piteously protested that the funeral rites of their lord should have been celebrated in the peruvian fashion and expressed their desire to sacrifice themselves on the grave and accompany his spirit to the golden land of the sun the spaniards informed them that atahuapa had died in the christian religion and that the god of the christians required no human sacrifices they were then excluded from the church but several on retiring to their residences carried out their vows and by committing suicide confirmed their devotion to the murdered prince a day or two later hernando de soto returned and great was his indignation when he was informed of the cruel deed done in his absence repairing at once to the presence of pizarro he found him with a large felt sombrero by way of mourning drawn down over his eyes his attitude and bearing suggestive of sorrow and perhaps remorse with a soldier's abruptness he said to him you have acted rashly for altahuapa was falsely accused there was no army at guamachucho nor did i anywhere see the signs of insurrection if it were necessary to bring the inca to trial he should have been sent to castile to be judged by the emperor i would have pledged myself to have seen him safely on board ship pizarro acknowledged his precipitancy and threw all the blame on Raqualma, valverde and the more pertinacious members of the majority who in their turn recriminated against pizarro the quarrel was loud violent and prolonged but as they could not bring the dead back to life the contending parties at length subsided into silence end of section sixty this recording is in the public domain section sixty one of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by abai in july two thousand twenty the world's story volume eleven canada south america central america 
Mexico and the West Indies, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 61. The Hidden Treasure of the Incas. After 1532. From the Spanish of Valverde. It was generally believed in Ecuador that the Incas had hidden a vast amount of gold in a lake on a peak of one of the Yanganati mountains. A Spaniard named Valverde was said to have learned its whereabouts from the father of his Indian wife, and in consequence to have become enormously rich. Valverde was thought to have bequeathed his secret to the king of Spain, and to have left a derrotero, or guide, to the mysterious place. Several expeditions were sent in quest of the treasure, but it still remains undiscovered, or non-existent. The following is a translation of the derrotero made by the English botanist Richard Spruce. The Editor Placed in the town of Pillaro, ask for the farm of Moya, and sleep, the first night, a good distance above it, and ask there for the mountain of Guapa, from whose top, if the day be fine, look to the east, so that thy bank be towards the town of Ambato, and from thence thou shalt perceive the three Cerros Yanganati, in the form of a triangle, on whose declivity there is a lake, made by hand, into which the ancients threw the gold they had prepared for the ransom of the Inca when they heard of his death. From the same Cerro Guapa thou mayest see also the forest, and in it a clump of sangurimas standing out of the said forest, and another clump which they call flechas, arrows, and these clumps are the principal mark for the which thou shalt aim, leaving them a little on the left hand. Go forward from Guapa in the direction and with the signals indicated, and a good way ahead, having passed some cattle farms, thou shalt come on a wide morass, over which thou must cross, and coming out on the other side thou shalt see on the left hand, a short way off, a jucal on the hillside, through which thou must pass. Having got through the jucal, thou wilt see two small lakes called Los Anteojos, the spectacles, from having between them a point of land like to a nose. From this place thou mayest again descry the Cerros Yanganati, the same as thou sawest them from the top of Guapa, and I warn thee to leave the said lakes on the left, and that in front of the point or nose there is a plain which is the sleeping place. There thou must leave thy horses, for they can go no farther. Following now on foot in the same direction, thou shalt come on a great black lake, the which leave on thy left hand, and beyond it seek to descend along the hillside in such a way that thou mayest reach a ravine, down which comes a waterfall. And here thou shalt find a bridge of three poles, or, if it do not still exist, thou shalt put another in the most convenient place and pass over it. And having gone on a little way in the forest, seek out the hut which served to sleep in, or the remains of it. Having passed the night there, go on thy way the following day through the forest in the same direction, till thou reach another deep dry ravine, across which thou must throw a bridge, and pass over it slowly and cautiously, for the ravine is very deep, that is, if thou succeed not in finding the pass which exists. Go forward and look for the signs of another sleeping place, which, I assure thee, thou canst not fail to see in the fragments of pottery and other marks, because the Indians are continually passing along there. Go on thy way, and thou shalt see a mountain which is all of pyrites, the which leave on the left hand, and I warn thee that thou must go round it in this fashion. On this side thou wilt find a pasture in a small plain, which having crossed, thou wilt come on a canyon between two hills, which is the way of the Inca. From thence, as thou goest along, thou shalt see the entrance of the tunnel, which is in the form of a church porch. Having come through the canyon, and gone a good distance beyond, thou wilt perceive a cascade, which descends from an offshoot of the Cerros Yanganati, and runs into a quaking bog on the right hand, and without passing the stream in the said bog, there is much gold, 
so that putting in thy hand what thou shalt gather at the bottom is grains of gold. To ascend the mountain, leave the bog and go along to the right, and pass above the cascade, going round the offshoot of the mountain. And if by chance the mouth of the tunnel be closed with certain herbs, which they call salvaje, remove them, and thou wilt find the entrance. And on the left-hand side of the mountain thou mayest see the huaira, for thus the ancients called the furnace where they founded metals, which is nailed with golden nails. And to reach the third mountain, if thou canst not pass in front of the tunnel, it is the same thing to pass behind it, for the water of the lake falls into it. If thou lose thyself in the forest, seek the river, follow it on the right bank, lower down take to the beach, and thou wilt reach the canyon in such sort that, although thou seek to pass it, thou wilt not find where. Climb, therefore, the mountain on the right hand, and in this manner thou canst by no means miss thy way. End of section 61section 62 of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies read for LibriVox.org. south america part two peru chile bolivia and ecuador historical note the influence of the blows struck for freedom in the other south american states early in the 19th century was a little slow in affecting peru but in 1824 a decisive victory over the Spanish forces took place at Ayacucho, and Peru became a republic. Like other South American republics, however, it has been shaken by revolutions. About the middle of the 19th century, the value of the guano and nitrate beds was discovered, and immense wealth flowed into the Peruvian treasury. In 1879, war broke out with Chile under the ownership of these same beds, and Chile won the prize. Chile had become free from Spain in 1818, but her lack of boundary lines was a continued source of trouble. The line between Chile and Argentina was settled in 1902 by arbitration, but that between Chile and Bolivia was difficult because of the enormous value of the nitrate deposit in the disputed territory. This led to war between the two countries in 1879 through 83, and here, as in the war with Peru, Chile was victorious. Bolivia was part of the territory subdued by the Spaniards in 1538. In 1780, insurrection against Spanish rule arose, but it was not until 1824 that the country became free. The story of the state has been in the main one of revolution and civil war, with only occasional intervals of peace. Ecuador, on becoming free from Spanish control, united with New Granada and Venezuela in forming the Republic of Colombia. This union lasted but a short time, and in 1829, Ecuador became an independent republic. Civil wars and struggles between different parties have filled the years from then until now. Ecuador has a fertile soil and exceedingly valuable mineral resources, though they are as yet undeveloped. End of section 62. This recording is in the public domain. Section 63 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 63, The Highest Railway in the World, about 1865, by Frederick A. Talbot. This South American line, the Lima and Arroyo Railway, is not an ordinary mountain railway. It is an audacious marvel of engineering science. Nor does it merely offer facilities for sightseeing among the impressive Cordilleras, but acts as a traffic highway between the coast and the mines on the high inland plateau. As might be supposed, 
the difficulties which the engineers had to break down were numerous and stupendous. Moreover, the work was extremely costly. In the case of the Arroyo Road, it averaged about 60,000 pounds, or $300,000 per mile, and altogether 8,500,000 pounds, $42,500,000, were sunk in the enterprise, more than the total cost of the San Gothard Railway, with its famed tunnel and 172 miles of track. The first attempt to subjugate this range by the Iron Road was made in the 60s by a daring Philadelphian engineer, Henry Miggs. His idea was ambitious in the extreme. He proposed to start from Calio, lift the metals over the crests of the mountains, drop down the other side onto the highlands, and push across the plateau until he gained a point on the mighty Amazon, which could be reached by steamer from the Atlantic. By this means, the Pacific seaports of South America would be brought into closer touch with the markets of the Old World, avoiding the protracted and hazardous journey round Cape Horn. That the idea was never carried to success is one of the sorry tricks of fate. Internectine strife and wars with neighboring states sapped the financial strength of Peru to such an extent that there was not enough money to complete this grand scheme. Possibly one day the steel thread will be picked up again at Oroya and forced to its original objective. For the first 107 miles, this railway makes a continual ascent. There is not a single foot of downhill in the whole distance. Work was commenced in 1870, and pushed forward so energetically that in the course of 12 months, Miggs had completed 20 miles of the line, and had the earthworks well advanced as far as Chosica, some 33 miles out of Calio. In order to ease his task as much as possible, the engineer decided to follow the Remick River into the mountains. But as the innermost recesses of the Cordilleras are gained, the river narrows considerably, until it plunges merely through a slender defile, the walls of the peaks dropping down precipitously into the water. The result was that the engineer found it very difficult to find a natural lane for his metals, so he had to hew and blast galleries, to swing first from one bank to the other, in order to seize the slightest foothold. He had plunged forty-seven miles into the mountains, and had gained an altitude of about one mile, when he was brought to a dead stop. The mountain along which he had crawled laboriously broke off abruptly. Further advance was impossible. To have cut a tunnel would have been a Herculean task, and as the mountain wall dropped straight down below, and towered to a dizzy height above him, he found himself in a quandary. A few feet immediately above him, however, he espied a ledge running parallel with that on which he had laid his track. He resolved to gain that upper gallery, but the crucial question was, how? Then he hit upon a brilliant idea. It was something new and untried in railway engineering, but as he had already tested all existing methods to gain the point at which he now stood, there was no alternative but to devise new ways and means of overcoming perplexing situations as they arose, despite the apparent novelty of the solutions. He resolved to lift the track from the lower to the upper ledge by a V-switch. The embankment on the outside of the track at the point he had gained was leveled off, and a small turntable was erected. From the latter, two short lines were laid down at an angle to the track in the form of a widely opened V, with a turntable at the apex. The main line cuts across the top of the V, forming a triangle, and continues a short distance beyond. The manner in which the train is lifted from the one level to the other is as follows. The engine pulls it up the lower line onto the section crossing the top of the V, and in such a way as to be between its two angular limbs. The engine is uncoupled, and runs down one leg of the V onto the turntable, which is then swung round until the engine faces the other arm of the V, up which it passes until it gains the main line. It is now at the rear of the train which it was pulling a few minutes before. The engine is coupled up, and the train is pushed backwards until it is over the switch connecting with the upper level. It then proceeds forward in the usual manner. In reality, it makes a zigzag course up the mountainside. This ingenious means of overcoming such a difficulty was tried first at San Bartholomew, and proved so very economical and simple a solution of a grave difficulty that it was freely introduced by the inventor whenever similar conditions were encountered. True, the process of uncoupling and recoupling the engine occasioned a little delay, but the switch was cheaper and quite as effective as a loop, even if the latter could have been built, for it was found possible to lay the turntable between two tiers of metal on a gradient not exceeding one in twenty-five. Altogether, 
there are twenty-two of these switches on the system. The majority of them are of the simple type that we have described above, but in some cases there is a double zigzag when the difference in level was extreme and did not permit of the connecting bank line being raised at an easy grade. The adoption of the Miggs V-switch, as it is properly called, saved the engineer thousands of pounds. In one case, the switch is set in a very precarious situation, for the climbing line winds along a perilous ledge blasted out of the solid flank of the peak, and the traveler's heart thumps every time the train lurches, as he looks down upon the curling river far, far below on the one, and the mountain wall climbing some two thousand feet above him on the other hand. The Arroyo line has been described as a railway of sensations, and it is an apt description. During the process of veeing a train, the voyager has ample opportunity to contemplate his peculiar situation at leisure. Highly ingenious and simple was the verdict of the railway world when they realized Meg's handiwork. But what is going to happen if a descending train runs away at one of these switches? Will it make a beeline for the bottom of the canyon through the air, or pile up against the dead stop? Miggs, however, did not anticipate trains running amuck in this manner, but he guarded against any such contingency, because brakes sometimes will fail to act on a descending grade. Consequently, at the end of each line in a V-switch, he provided a substantial bank of earth. This was a fortunate precaution. Some years ago a train, in proceeding from the upper to the lower level, did run away on the falling bank. It crashed into the solid embankment at the dead end, and came to a stop at an ungainly, heterogeneous mass of twisted ironwork and splintered wood. Nobody was hurt, the debris was removed, and the runaway engine was recovered, overhauled, replaced in service, and is running today, little the worse for its misadventure. Owing to the peaks of the Cordilleras being separated from one another by yawing ravines, extensive bridging became imperative. Some are short, insignificant spans. Others are lofty, spidery structures, which were completed at the expenditure of many human lives from disease and accident. As a matter of fact, the railway earned an unsavory reputation owing to the high mortality that attended its realization. The Barugas Bridge was the greatest offender in this respect. It was the greatest undertaking of its time on the line. It is 575 feet in length, and cleaves the air 225 feet above the bed of the ravine. There are bigger and loftier bridges in other parts of the world, but few have been so troublesome to erect. At the time it was undertaken, it was the most remarkable structure of its kind, and by the time it was completed, 12,600 pounds, or $62,000, had been expended. It lies at an altitude of 5,839 feet, and was carried on three masonry piers, the center and main support being built up from the bed of the gorge. This pier measured 50 foot square at the base, and was of solid masonry, thus forming a substantial plinth for the slender iron superstructure. All the component parts of this bridge had to be kept within certain limits of dimension and weight, to enable them to be hauled up from the coast and set in position on the site. Large gangs of workmen were crowded upon the work, because, until this bridge was set in position, material could not be transported to the other side of the gorge for the continuation of the grade. But the task was dogged by ill luck. Work was in full swing when a mysterious and malignant disease broke out. So furiously did it rage that the men were swept off like flies. There was no means of checking its ravages. It became known far and wide as the Verugus fever. It resisted diagnosis and treatment, but there was no denying its deadliness. As a result, labor gave the district a wide berth. It struck down natives and white men indiscriminately. Just how many men succumbed to the attacks of this epidemic probably never will be known. Men contracted the malady, died, and were buried all within the space of a few hours after reaching the site. Indeed, it is chronicled that one man fell a victim after crossing the bridge only once. This mysterious and terrible scourge threatened to stop the whole enterprise, though Meg spared no effort and money to bring about its completion. The most attractive inducements were held out to workmen to come up and risk their lives, but only the more adventurous, fascinated by the high wages, dared to face death in an uncanny form. It was mainly through the efforts of such happy-go-lucky spirits that the gorge was spanned ultimately. Miggs himself appeared to bear a charmed life, for he haunted the fated gorge day and night. But the awful experience seriously undermined his health, his constitution was wrecked, and he was changed into an old man. Still, he clung tenaciously to his enterprise. The gorge crossed, he found himself among the wildest fastnesses of the Andes. The mountains became steeper, the intervening gulches deeper and more difficult to cross. 
Landslides were of such frequent occurrence that they might well have struck terror into his heart. Yet he fought his way forward. Blasting became heavier and heavier, wide sweeping curves more frequent, the ascent steeper and steeper, and tunneling through projecting spurs more frequent. In these upper reaches, the trains play a gigantic game of hide-and-seek, darting in and out among the labyrinth of tunnels. In a distance of fifty miles, he had to drive his path through no less than fifty-seven of these obstructions, while altogether there were sixty-five tunnels in the one hundred and thirty-eight miles of the railway's length. The line doubles and redoubles upon itself in the most bewildering manner in order to gain points on the mountain sides. In the course of eleven miles between Mantuka and Tamaraki, this scaling by means of the zigzag was exceedingly heavy. Standing at the latter station and looking down, one can see tier after tier of the gleaming metals until they are lost to sight far below. Five miles beyond Tamaraki, another remarkable achievement had to be accomplished. The line tunnels a peak to emerge upon the brink of a drop into the river below as straight as a brick wall. On the opposite side is another towering pinnacle. To span the gulf, a heavy bridge was necessary. It is called Infernillo Bridge, and never was a name more fittingly bestowed. Its erection by false work or scaffolding was out of the question, as in this region not a tree exists. It had to be built out from the sides, the men being suspended in cradles and loops dangling from ropes attached to brackets driven into the solid rock above. The builders found swinging the tools from such crazy footholds to be perilous in the extreme, but there were no other ways by which the bridge could be erected. It is a frail link between two dark yawning mouths and opposite towering crests, and the traveler as he rattles across can scarcely quell a shudder. So energetically did Meigs pursue his self-appointed task that in six years he had carried the line eighty-eight and one-half miles into the Andes, and had gained an altitude of twelve thousand two hundred and fifteen and one-half feet. All the men that he could possibly procure were pressed into service. At one time the railway gave employment to 8,000 laborers. The amount of blasting necessary to prepare the roadbed for this single line of standard track was enormous, something like 500,000 pounds of explosives being used every month. The strain inseparable from such an enterprise told its tale upon the bold engineer, whose iron constitution could not withstand the anxieties and worries of the Baruga fever and the exposure to a rarefied atmosphere without receiving an indelible mark. The first signs of a complete breakdown appeared as the railway was approaching Chikla, and when this point was gained in 1877, he succumbed. The removal of the guiding spirit brought the whole undertaking to a stop. Meigs had completed two-thirds of the undertaking and had broken the back of the difficulties. For fourteen years not another foot of line was graded. At last, the Peruvian Corporation of London, which had taken over the railway, settled a contract for its completion with William Thorndike, who also hailed from Philadelphia. The new engineer carried the line a further 3,450 feet above the sea, following the surveys of Miggs, and then became confronted with his greatest obstacle, the piercing of the summit crest. Thorndike had to hew his way through the bosom of a pinnacle for over 3,855 feet at an altitude at which such work never had been attempted before. The trying character of the situation was augmented by the rarity of the atmosphere, and the fact that he had to force his way through the region of the terrible mountain sickness, with a low prevailing temperature such as is encountered in the region of eternal snow and ice. Such conditions retarded the boring of the Galera Tunnel, as it is called, more than the stern resistance of the rock. The workmen invariably fell victims to the sickness, though the undertaking was not accompanied with the heavy mortality that characterized the building of the Verugas Bridge far below. Mountain drilling, blasting, excavating, and the removal of the heavy soil proved exacting and fatiguing, and a man could work only for a few hours at a stretch. By skillful organization and careful husbanding of his forces, however, the engineer succeeded in forcing the metal track through the mountain at record speed. The Galera Tunnel is the crowning point of a magnificent achievement. In the center, you stand on the Great Divide of the South Americas, nearly 16,000 feet above the ocean. When a bucket of water is upset, one half of the liquid runs eastward towards the Atlantic, while the other flows westward to the Pacific. Arroya is thirty-one and one-half miles distance from the eastern portal of the tunnel on the great island plateau of the continent, and only a little less than three thousand five hundred feet below it. On this section, construction was very rapid, as there were no untoward difficulties to be overcome. About the same time as the Arroya Railway was commenced, another great line was undertaken some miles to the south. In this instance, the port of Molendo was the Pacific terminus, 
the inland objective being Puno, on the shores of Lake Titicaca, that remarkable inland sea nestling among the crests of the Alps some 14,660 feet above the Pacific. The total length of this line is 332 miles, and it divides with the Antofagasta Railway to the south, the traffic between La Paz and the seaboard. Although it does not compare with the Arroyo or Central Railway of Peru as an engineering achievement, yet it possesses certain individual characteristics. The tumbled mountain country experienced further north, giving way to open expanses of bleak, dismal desert. This line, in its ascent of the Andes, skirts the base of the most majestic of mountains, the smoking El Misti, whose snow-capped crater rises like a grim sentinel far above the other visible points of the mountain chain. Here the mountains are nobler and wider apart, so that one can grasp better their magnificent proportions, while their flanks are not so scarred, and there is an absence of those fearsome yawning ravines. In making the ascent, the line describes broad sweeping curves to avoid projecting peaks, and throughout the whole distance there is a notable relief from the zigzags and switches so frequent on the sister line. On this road, however, the moving sand threatened to be an implacable enemy. In the higher altitudes, the sand is piled up into quaint little cones ranging from 10 to 20 feet in height, and from the distance their incalculable number and regular lines present the appearance of a vast army of men, grimed and covered with the dust, which illusion becomes emphasized when they are seen moving across the plains in a steady, rhythmic manner under the influence of the wind. When the railway was built, it was anticipated that elaborate precautions would be requisite to keep the track clear of this encumbrance, but it was found that the trains could plow their way through the mass with little difficulty. In the higher levels, the sand gives way to a country of broken rock, a land absolutely void of any signs of life. This monotonous waste continues to the shores of the lake, where the dank water grass and limpid water offer a welcome relief to the aridity experienced for so many hours. This railway was constructed with remarkable rapidity for the land of paradoxes, as the whole 332 miles were built in five years and thus the isolated waters of Titicaca were linked to the Pacific by the Iron Road. Not only was this railway much cheaper to construct than the Central or Arroyo line, but its maintenance is not so harassing as the former system. The engineers of the Arroyo Road are engaged in a constant war with the elements. The landslide is the most relentless foe that has to be combated. A big slip on a slope, an avalanche of snow, huge boulders, and miscellaneous debris rattle down the mountainsides with terrific fury, blotting out the track and sweeping bridges away in their mad career. The Barugas Bridge was dogged by ill fortune after its completion, for in one of these visitations the whole structure was demolished through the main central pier being knocked away. The tangled and twisted metal was left rusting in the ravine, for the bridge builder's art had advanced considerably since the old bridge was designed, and in reconstruction it was found possible to span the gorge on the cantilever principle without the central support. All the other bridges on the railway are being rebuilt gradually on these lines, and when this task is completed, the engineer will have one danger the less to fear, the collapse of the slender link of communication across the gulches. One can enjoy a most exhilarating experience on this railway. This is a descent from Galera Tunnel to Veo on a small hand car. It is a glorious coast downhill for no less than 107 miles. One rushes down inclines, swings round curves, threads tunnels, and whisks across gorges at the exhilarating speed of 45 miles an hour. It is a unique sensation, one of the many marvels associated with this remarkable railway, which is not merely a striking evidence of civilization, but a perpetual monument to the 7,000 lives devoted to its construction. End of section 63. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Todd. Section 64 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 64. How to Conduct a Spanish-American Revolution. About 1860. By F. Hasorik. The Spanish-American Revolution, to be successful, must originate with, or be supported by, 
the soldiery. The conspirators began by bribing a portion of the garrison of an important post. Military barracks will never be attacked without a previous secret understanding with some of the officers and men who are in charge of the post. In the negotiations for such purposes, the ladies take a most active part. They are passionate politicians and very energetic secret agents. They carry letters and dispatches, excite discontent, conceal political refugees and facilitate their escape and keep their banished friends posted as to the state of affairs at home. During my residence in Ecuador, several of these female agitators were banished the country by President Garcia Moreno. They went, hurling defiance into his teeth. He could imprison or shoot the men who trembled before him, but he could not break the spirit of the women. The moment a revolutionary party has secured a foothold somewhere, they resort to the customary mode of Spanish-American warfare. Its principal features are forcible impressments, and forced loans and contributions, in addition to which they seize all the horses, mules, cattle, provisions, Indians, and other property they can lay hands on. The government does the same. There is no legal or equitable system of conscription or draft. By common consent, gentlemen, that is to say, white men of good families, are exempt from it. But the poor, the half or crossbreeds, the journeymen, mechanics, and farm laborers, are seized and impressed wherever found, and without reference to age, condition, disability, or the time they may have served already. The appearance of the recruiting officers on the street always creates a panic among those liable to be recruited. It is a pitiful spectacle to see those poor fellows run away in all directions, wildly chased by the officers and their men. Compulsory service in the army is a calamity greatly dreaded by the populace, and from which they will try to escape in a thousand different ways. They will flee to the mountains, and hide themselves in forests or deserts. They will take refuge in churches or convents, or in the houses of foreign representatives or residents, and they will not show themselves on the streets or public highways until the danger is over. When they are near enough to the frontier, they will leave the country in order to avoid impressment. In Peru alone, there are over 10,000 Ecuadorians who left their own country to avoid impressment. Ecuadorian soldiers are but poorly clad and poorly paid. Many of them have to go barefoot. When their services are no longer required, they are discharged without the means to return to their homes. Under these circumstances, it cannot appear strange that such soldiers should revenge themselves on society whenever an opportunity offers. When marching from one place to another, they will take from the poor people living along the public highways whatever they can find. Hence, when it becomes known that a regiment or a company of soldiers will march through a certain district, the people living along the road, even in times of profound peace, will hide their valuables, drive away their horses, mules, cattle, or sheep, take their provisions, chickens, etc., to some out-of-the-way place in the mountains or forests, and make preparations as if they expected the arrival of a savage enemy. The houses along the road will be deserted. The men will carefully keep out of the way of the marching columns, and only now and then an old woman will be found to tell the soldiers how poor she is. Many a time when, during my travels in the Cordillera, I stopped at a hut to buy eggs or other provisions, the people told me with a sigh, We have nothing to sell, sir. The soldiers were here and took all we had. The first measures of a party which succeeds in a revolution or a civil war are generally acts of retaliation or revenge on the vanquished who may congratulate themselves if only forced contributions are resorted to. The wealthy members of the losing party are notified by the new government that within a certain number of days or hours they must pay a certain sum of money. If they refuse, the amount is sometimes raised, and even doubled, and the victims are imprisoned, either in their own homes or in the military barracks, until they pay up. If they are storekeepers, their goods are seized as security. If they are hacienda owners their cattle or horses are taken in lieu of money. If they are women, they are placed under a military guard and are not allowed to leave their rooms or to consult with their friends until they comply with the arbitrary edict of the despot of the day. I shall relate but one instance of the many that came to my knowledge. In 1860, a contribution of several hundred dollars, I do not recollect the exact amount, was imposed upon a gentleman who had held office under the government that had just been overthrown. He being absent from Quito, 
on his hacienda in Esmeraldas on the coast, a detachment of soldiers was sent to his house with a command to his wife to pay the money. The lady protested that her husband had left her no money, and that she was unable to pay the required amount. Her answer was deemed unsatisfactory, and her house was surrounded by soldiers, who did not allow anybody to enter or to leave it. She was not permitted to send for victuals or for water, nor was she allowed to employ counsel or to see her friends. For three days and nights she was kept a prisoner, until, coerced by starvation, she yielded at last, and paid the amount which had been assessed without warrant of law by the caprice of the victorious party. A political adversary is considered an outlaw, who may with impunity be treated in the most arbitrary and cruel manner by those in power. His haciendas are laid waste by soldiers quartered on them. His cattle and horses are at the mercy of a reckless government. The greatest sufferers, however, are the owners of beasts of burden, whether they take part in political affairs or not. Their horses and mules are taken whenever they are needed for the transportation of military stores. They are used, generally without compensation, to the owner, who may congratulate himself if they are at last restored to him. Their galled backs and emaciated bodies are the pay he gets, all constitutional and legal provisions to the contrary notwithstanding. Those who own mules or donkeys which they hire out to travelers, or on which they bring their vegetables to market, keep away from cities in time of war or civil commotion, for fear of being robbed of their means of subsistence. Their beasts they send to the fastnesses of the mountains until the danger is over. Thus the city markets will be but scantily supplied, merchants cannot ship their goods, travelers find no means of transportation, and the whole country suffers and decays because governments will not respect individual rights and private property. When the country is threatened with war, foreign invasion or revolution, or when a violent change of government has taken place, the houses of foreign ministers, councils, and other foreigners are eagerly resorted to by all classes of the population. Not only will ladies and gentlemen take refuge there, but such houses will be depositories for all sorts of valuables, goods, trunks, and boxes, belonging to merchants, mechanics, private citizens, and even the government. During the war with New Granada, in 1862, when it was feared that General Aboleda, after his victory at Tulcan, would march to Quito and occupy the town, the government made arrangements to deposit the silver bars belonging to the mint in the house of one of the foreign ministers. The houses of foreigners are respected, not only because the governments to which they belong are expected to shield them with a strong arm, but also because even the victorious or ruling party are interested in maintaining the sacredness of asylums, to which, perhaps tomorrow, it may be their turn to resort as the vanquished. In Ecuador, foreigners alone enjoy the rights and privileges which the Constitution, on paper, guarantees to the citizens. The persons of foreigners are secured. Their servants are not taken away from them. Their beasts are never interfered with. Their property is respected. And if they have a diplomatic representative in the country, they are favored in a thousand different ways. They are the only class of people who can carry on business in safety. Of course, they will suffer from bad times, when the country is desolated by revolutions or civil war, but they have little to fear from the government and party leaders, and while forced contributions of money or goods will be exacted from the native capitalists, while their servants and laborers, horses and cattle, will be taken away from them, the person, property, laborers and servants of a foreigner will be secure. No wonder, therefore, that every extensive landowner, every wealthy merchant in the country, wants to make himself a foreigner. I was almost continually troubled by persons who wanted to know how to make themselves North American citizens. Everybody, almost, who has anything to lose is anxious to abjure his nationality and place himself under the protection of a foreign flag. End of section 64. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Todd. Section 65 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April 2020. The World's Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico and the West Indies, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 65. 
The Unconquerable Araucanians, 20th Century, by Nevin O. Winter. The most indomitable of the native races in the New World, with the exception of the red men of North America, have been the Araucanians of Chile. They are the proudest, richest, and bravest of the Indians of South America. At the time of the conquest, this race occupied the greater part of Chile and had spread across the Andes into a part of Patagonia, which country they shared with the Tehuelches, the so-called giants. For three hundred years they waged a successful warfare against the Spanish invaders and the Republic of Chile, which later succeeded the Spanish province. It was not until 1884 that they were finally conquered and submitted to the Chilean government after certain rights and privileges were guaranteed to them. So long as the Chileans attempted to conquer the Indians by brute force, they failed, just as had the Spaniards before them. It was not until some tact and judgment were used that any real progress was made in the subjugation of these people. According to the early account, the Araucanians were given to agriculture, and the valleys south of the present city of Santiago teemed with an industrious and energetic race. The Incas had spread their sovereignty south of Santiago as far as the Maule River, and this probably accounted in part for the agricultural development there. Some writers claim that the Incas had enslaved the Araucanians and compelled them to do their work. At any rate, the Spaniards encountered little opposition in their conquest before that river was reached. The fact is that these people were really divided into three different tribes. The tribes that lived along the coast were fishermen, those that lived on the higher lands were hunters, while those who occupied the more fertile valleys were agriculturalists. It was estimated by some of the early writers that there were at that time no less than a half million of these Indians. This estimate is no doubt excessive, and half that number would be nearer the truth. They knew not the use of any metals, excepting silver, which they worked into various forms. Silver breastplates were worn by the wives of the caciques, or chiefs, which told of the number of their children, as large families were their boast. They also wore large crescent earrings and great silver suns as breastpins, with hieroglyphics upon them which told of a nature worship. Bracelets formed of a multiplicity of minute silver beads were also fashioned very attractively, and in later years silver stirrups were manufactured for the headmen. Even today this race is noted for its silver work. Down upon this stronghold of the Araucanians came Pedro de Valdivia in 1550, with 200 horsemen and some other troops. This force no doubt made an imposing appearance, as it marched along with their coats of mail, helmets, swords and spears flashing in the sunlight. The only firearms were clumsy arquebuses borne by the infantry, and fired from a wooden support by the aid of a fuse kept alight only with great difficulty. And yet, the Spanish soldiers at that time were considered to be the best in the world. They continually marched in order of battle, preceded by an advanced guard, and carrying their baggage in the centre. From the time Valdivia reached the river Itata, his march was a continuous conflict, although he managed to get as far as the river Biobio. How two hundred men were able to make this trip through a thickly populated country can be explained by reason of the superior weapons and armor of the Spaniards, as well as the fact that they used horses. These animals at that time were unknown among the native races and inspired them with terror, just as they did the Aztecs in Mexico. The Indians had only wooden lances, arrows of the simplest manufacture, and clubs, and yet they managed to stand against the Spaniards at times, until hundreds of them were slain. On one occasion the Spanish records say that Valdivia was beset with 20,000 Indians. As fast as one body of the Indians was routed, another took their place. Compact masses of the Indians at times surrounded the Spaniards. 
The horses were clubbed, and this together with the war cries of the attacking force created a terrible confusion. When the Indians were finally beaten off, the ground was literally covered with the dead bodies of their comrades. Every Spaniard was wounded. This battle is known as that of Adalien. The cruelty of the Spaniards in this invasion was something terrible at times. After the Battle of Penco, where, according to the chroniclers, 40,000 Indians attacked the invaders, Valdivia cut off the nose and right hand of two hundred prisoners and sent them back to terrorize their comrades in this mutilated condition. They treated the natives with absolute contempt and endeavored to reduce them to abject slavery. Valdivia practically had no choice in the matter. Each soldier had to be paid a grant of land with a certain number of slaves. The soldiers were of a fierce and intractable character and it was almost impossible to maintain any sort of discipline among them. Valdivia founded the city of Imperial, fortified it, and employed the natives in washing the gold found in this district. He also established the city of Villa Rica, which means the rich village, and was so named because of the wealth and fertility of that valley, and another town that was named after himself. In fact, he endeavored to establish a string of fortified outposts throughout that entire section of the country. The Indians were parceled out among the conquerors, Valdivia retaining for himself about 40,000. Although at this time the Spanish population of the valley did not exceed 1,000, yet they were able after a while to force the Indians to do their work. The men were attended by a numerous retinue of servants wherever they went, and even the women wanted to be followed by a large concourse of slaves when they attended church. Rank and importance seemed to be indicated by the number of menials. The end, however, was not long in coming. It was due to an Indian boy named Lautaro, who had been raised in the household of Valdivia himself, that their freedom was finally obtained. He had learned to manage horses and to use the Spaniard's weapons. Taking some of these animals, he joined his people and stirred up a general insurrection. A public assembly of the tribes was called, and Lautaro presented a definite plan for a campaign against the enemy. When Valdivia arrived on the scene to put this revolt down, he found some of the towns already in ashes. Lautaro, although only twenty-one years of age, had shown a genius for war and was in command, and had already established some discipline among his troops. Not a single Spaniard escaped in a battle or series of skirmishes that was fought, although thousands of the Indians fell. Contrary to the example set by the Spaniards, Lautaro simply killed his prisoners by beheading them without any preliminary torture. Valdivia himself was captured by the Indians. That general at once offered two hundred sheep for his release, and promised to withdraw all of his troops from their territory. The Indian caciques, however, would not consent to this, and, at a prearranged signal, one of the Indian soldiers struck him on the head with a club and killed him. It is said that his body was afterwards eaten by the assembled caciques in order to give them heart in the struggle against the Spaniards. This seems to have been a custom among many primitive races. Thus was a struggle begun which lasted for three centuries. End of section 65section 66 of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies read for LibriVox.org by sonia the christ of the andes by nevin o winter the tunnel referred to is more than ten thousand feet above sea level the boundary line between argentina and chile runs near the center of this tunnel the editor almost immediately over the tunnel and nearly three thousand feet higher stands the famous statue known as the Christ of the Andes. This statue was erected in 1904 as a symbol of perpetual peace between the two neighboring nations. It was cast in bronze from the cannon of the two nations, which had been purchased through fear of impending war. Its location is on the new international boundary line that had just been established by arbitration. 
near it is a sign with the words chile on one side and argentina on the other side the figure of christ is twenty-six feet in height in one hand it holds the emblem of the cross while the other is extended in a blessing and as if uttering the one magic word peace on one side is a tablet with the inscription sooner shall these mountains crumble into dust than the people of argentina and chile break the peace to which they have pledged themselves at the feet of christ the redeemer on another side is the inscription he is our peace who has made both one end of section sixty six this recording is in the public domain section sixty seven of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies read for librivox dot org south america part three venezuela colombia and the guianas historical note both new granada and venezuela were under the rule of spain from the time of their settlement by the spaniards until the nineteenth century in eighteen ten they revolted and under the leadership of bolivar won their independence ecuador united with these states to form the republic of colombia but this union was soon dissolved and in both new granada now called colombia and venezuela the too common tale of the south american states was repeated outbreaks insurrections and civil wars between eighteen seventy three and eighteen eighty eight venezuela was under the sway of guzman and for those years only was there quiet in what has been called the turbulent republic of the north during the sixteenth century the spaniards planted a few colonies in guiana and the country was visited by missionaries it is divided into three parts held by england holland and france respectively british guiana has railroads and telegraph lines and savings banks and nearly three hundred thousand inhabitants about half the people of dutch guiana live in paramaribo a clean-looking little town with broad well-shaded streets and well-kept houses of french guiana as a whole little is known save that it is the home of fevers here it is that france sends some of her convicts just off the coast is the famous devil's island where dreyfus was imprisoned the land and the contiguous water lying between the leeward islands and the isthmus of darien was formerly known as the spanish main this was the route of the spanish treasure ships on their way from mexico central america and the northern shores of south america it is famous for many a wild tale of piratical exploits End of section sixty seven this recording is in the public domain section sixty eight of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume eleven canada south america central america mexico and the west indies edited by eva march tapin section sixty eight the adventures of columbus off the coast of trinidad fourteen ninety eight by washington irving on the second of august he columbus continued on to the southwest point of trinidad which he called point arenal it stretched towards a corresponding point of terra firma making a narrow pass with a high rock in the centre to which he gave the name el gallo near this pass the ships cast anchor as they were approaching this place a large canoe with twenty-five indians put off from the shore but paused on coming within bowshot and hailed the ship in a language which no one on board understood columbus tried to allure the savages on board by friendly signs by the display of looking-glasses basins of polished metal and various glittering trinkets but all in vain they remained gazing in mute wonder for above two hours with their paddles in their hands ready to take flight on the least attempt to approach them 
they were all young men well formed and naked excepting bands and fillets of cotton about their heads and coloured cloths of the same about their loins they were armed with bows and arrows the latter feathered and tipped with bone and they had bucklers an article of armour seen for the first time among the inhabitants of the new world finding all other means to attract them ineffectual columbus now tried the power of music he knew the fondness of the indians for dances performed to the sound of their rude drums and the chant of their traditional ballads he ordered something similar to be executed on the deck of the ship where while one man sang to the beat of the tabor and the sound of other musical instruments the ship boys danced after the popular spanish fashion no sooner however did this symphony strike up than the indians mistaking it for a signal of hostilities put their bucklers on their arms seized their bows and let fly a shower of arrows this rude salutation was immediately answered by a discharge of a couple of crossbows which put the auditors to flight and concluded this singular entertainment after anchoring at point arenal the crews were permitted to land and refresh themselves there were no runs of water but by sinking pits in the sand they soon obtained sufficient to fill the casks the anchorage at this place however was extremely insecure a rapid current set from the eastward through the strait formed by the mainland and the island of trinidad flowing as columbus observed night and day with as much fury as the guadalquivir when swollen by floods in the pass between point arenal and its corresponding point the confined current boiled and raged to such a degree that he thought it was crossed by a reef of rocks and shoals preventing all entrance with others extending beyond over which the waters roared like breakers on a rocky shore to this pass with its angry and dangerous appearance he gave the name boca del sierpe the mouth of the serpent he thus found himself placed between two difficulties the continual current from the east seemed to prevent all return while the rocks which appeared to beset the pass threatened destruction if he should proceed being on board his ship late at night kept awake by painful illness and an anxious and watchful spirit he heard a terrible roaring from the south and beheld the sea heaped up as it were into a great ridge or hill the height of the ship covered with foam and rolling towards him with a tremendous uproar as this furious surge approached rendered more terrible in appearance by the obscurity of night he trembled for the safety of his vessels his own ship was suddenly lifted up to such a height that he dreaded lest it should be overturned or cast upon the rocks while another of the ships was torn violently from her anchorage the crews were for a time in great consternation fearing they should be swallowed up but the mountainous surge passed on and gradually subsided after a violent contest with the counter-current of the strait this sudden rush of water it is supposed was caused by the swelling of one of the rivers which flows into the gulf of paria and which were as yet unknown to columbus anxious to extricate himself from this dangerous neighbourhood he sent the boats on the following morning to sound the depth of water at the boca de sierpe and to ascertain whether it was possible for ships to pass through to the northward to his great joy they returned with a report that there were several fathoms of water and currents and eddies setting both ways either to enter or return a favourable breeze prevailing he immediately made sail and passing through the formidable strait in safety found himself in a tranquil expanse beyond end of section sixty eight this recording is in the public domain section sixty nine of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume eleven canada south america central america mexico and the west indies 
edited by Eva March Tappan. Section sixty nine. What Sir Walter Raleigh thought of Guiana, fifteen ninety five, by Sir Walter Raleigh. In the sixteenth century, there was a general belief that somewhere in the world existed a country of gold, El Dorado, as it was called. Where this wonderland with its inconceivable quantities of gold and gems might be, no one knew, but the Spaniards sent out numerous expeditions in search of it. In 1595, Sir Walter Raleigh became one of the seekers. The following extract is from his own account of his experiences in Guyana, and paints what he believed concerning the country, for here he expected to find El Dorado the editor the empire of guiana is directly east from peru toward the sea and lieth under the equinoctial line and it hath more abundance of gold than any part of peru and as many or more great cities than ever peru had when it flourished most it is governed by the same laws and the emperor and people observe the same religion and the same form and policies in government as was used in peru not differing in any part and as i have been assured by such of the spaniards as have seen manoa the imperial city of guiana which the spaniards call el dorado that for the greatness for the riches and for the excellent seat it far exceedeth any in the world at least of so much of the world as is known to the spanish nation it is founded upon a lake of salt water of two hundred leagues long like unto mare caspio and if we compare it to that of peru and but read the report of francisco lopez and others it will seem more than credible and because we may judge of the one by the other i thought good to insert part of the one hundred and twentieth chapter of lopez in his general history of the indies wherein he describeth the court and magnificence of guiana kappa ancestor of the emperor of guiana whose very words are these all the vessels of his home table and kitchen were of gold and silver and the meanest of silver and copper for strength and hardness of the metal he had in his wardrobe hollow statues of gold which seemed giants and the figures in proportion and bigness of all the beasts birds trees and herbs that the earth bringeth forth and of all the fishes and the sea or waters of his kingdom breedeth he also had ropes budgets chests and troughs of gold and silver heaps of billets of gold that seemed wood marked out to burn finally there was nothing in his country whereof he had not the counterfeit in gold yea and they say the ingas had a garden of pleasure in an island near puna where they went to recreate themselves when they could take the air of the sea which had all kinds of garden herbs flowers and trees of gold and silver an invention and magnificence till then never seen besides all this he had an infinite quantity of silver and gold unwrought in cuzco which was lost by the death of the guascar for the indians hid it seeing that the spaniards took it and sent it into spain and in the one hundred and seventeenth chapter francisco pizarro caused the gold and silver of atapalipa to be weighed after he had taken it which lopez setteth down in these words following they found fifty and two thousand marks of good silver and one million and three hundred twenty and six thousand and five hundred pesos of gold now although these reports may seem strange yet if we consider the many millions which are daily brought out of peru into spain we may easily believe the same for we find that by the abundant treasure of that country the spanish king vexeth all the princes of europe and is become in a few years from a poor king of castile the greatest monarch of this part of the world and likely every day to increase if other princes foreslow the good occasions offered and suffer him to add this empire to the rest which by far exceedeth all the rest if his gold now endanger us he will then be unresistible end of section sixty nine
Section 70 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Albert Shu. The World Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tapan. Section 70. The Story of Bolivar, 1817-1830, by Lyndon Bates, Jr. In the latter part of March 1817, a score of horsemen were riding towards Angostura from the northern sea coast, some on mules, some on mangy horses. Most were sallow-skinned creoles clad in civilian dress, sombrero on head, sword and pistol at the belt. A few wore dingy uniforms. One, a gigantic negro, bore the insignia of an officer of the Black Republic of Haiti. Two, military of bearing, keen of eye, had the weather-worn red of the British grenadiers. Half a dozen barefoot peons in ragged ponchos rode behind with the sumpter burros. A slight figure in faded blue regimentals laced with red led the band. Only thirty-four years old, he looked fifty. His dark and wrinkled face was drawn and puckered. Hardship, dissipation, and the bitterest disappointment had left their marks. Born of a noble and wealthy Caracas family, he had been sent to Europe at the age of sixteen. He had visited France, then under the consulate, still vibrant with the recent revolution. He had played and beaten at tennis the Prince of the Asturias, against whom, as Ferdinand VII of Spain, he was now in a duel to the death for the freedom of South America. He had married at the age of nineteen and been widowed within the year. He had returned to Paris and broken his health in wild living. At Rome, he had refused to kiss the cross on Pius VII's shoe. He had returned to Caracas and had taken part in the junta which drove out Emparan, the Spanish captain-general, forced the establishment of a national congress, and drafted the Declaration of Rights of April 19, 1810, celebrated now as the Venezuelan national holiday. He had gone to England and had brought back the banished General Miranda. He had with his Societa Patriotica, secured the Declaration of Independence of July 5, 1811. He had fought against the Royalists, been overwhelmingly beaten, and fled to Cartagena. He had returned while Spain was in the throes of conflict with Napoleon, and entered Caracas amid delirious enthusiasm in a chariot before which girls strewed roses, hailing him El Libertador, he had been defeated once more and had been obliged to flee to Jamaica. A Negro spy hired to assassinate him had killed his secretary by mistake. Now at length, by the aid of a Dutch ship owner and the presidents of the Negro Republic of Haiti, he had been enabled to come back on this final attempt at South American liberation. A monkey, Mono, he was once nicknamed and not unlike a monkey he seemed with his thin little body and his wrinkled face, but one look from his dark, brooding eyes told of the fiery, unconquerable soul that burned in the slight frame. The man was Simon Bolivar, the Washington of Spanish America. On this March day in 1817, heading his tattered little cavalcade, he was passing through the anguish of his valley forge. The sky behind was reddened with the fires of Barcelona. The four hundred devoted troops left to hold the Franciscan monastery had been butchered to a man, and the Spaniards were giving the city to the sack. One thousand of the townspeople had been massacred, some on the altar steps. Women and children were being hunted through the streets. Dogs roamed the byways, eating their fill of the neglected bodies. Nor was Barcelona alone. Town after town that had given the revolutionists harbor had fallen to the royalists and suffered a like fate. Boves, the butcher, condemned as a ladron del mar, 
a renegade revolutionist leading a band of desperados which the Spaniards themselves nicknamed the Corps of Hell. Rosette, with his branding iron R for the foreheads of Republicans. Morales, whom even Boves had called atrocious. These were all in the pay of Spain. Before them fell the town of Acumare. Its streets were left a shambles of the dead and the dying. Old men, women, and children lay with the rest. Valencia surrendered upon the oath of Boves, sworn in the presence of the Holy Sacrament, to respect the lives of everybody. Yet as soon as arms had been surrendered, the governor, ninety of the leading citizens, sixty-four officers, and three hundred and ten troops were slaughtered. Caracas surrendered to Boves on similar terms, which were similarly observed. Boves issued an order that any who had conspired against Spain should be shot, and the slaughter recommenced. Aragua was stormed, and some three thousand townspeople were massacred. Now Barcelona, the last of Venezuela's northern cities, had fallen, and all that were left to follow Bolivar were fifteen officers and a few peons as their servants. Help from abroad there was almost none. President Madison had issued an order forbidding any aid from United States citizens to the struggling revolutionists. Great Britain stood apathetically by her ally Spain. The feeble little Negro Republic of Haiti alone had lent support in men and money, asking in return only Bolivar's promise, which he loyally kept, to give freedom to the slaves of Venezuela. In the colonies themselves, even, Pitifully few were his sympathizers. The white population in Venezuela, but 200,000 in number, was practically the only element in the country interested in any way in the outcome of the struggle. These native-born Creoles, tyrannized over by the arbitrary power of the viceroys and Spanish officials, excluded from office and emolument while their trade and manufacturing were garroted by prohibitive laws, were in general dissatisfied with Spanish misrule, but were averse to the fearful sacrifice which resistance entailed. The king had refused to the Venezuelans permission to found a university in Maracaibo because, in the opinion of his fiscal, it was unsuitable to promote learning in southern America where the inhabitants appeared destined by nature to work in the mines. The making of wine and oil, the growth of almonds or grapes, the manufacture of cloth, trade with the outside world or even with any Spanish port other than Sevilla, were prohibited. Oppressed by these abuses, the native whites still refrained from rallying in any great number to Bolivar. The Indians, 207,000 in number, stigmatized as a race of monkeys, filled with vice and ignorance, automatons unworthy of representing or of being represented, the Negro slaves, 60,000 in number, and the mixed bloods, 43,000 souls in all, though their grievances were far greater than those of the native whites, for the most part simply followed as they were led or paid. With but a small portion of the Creole population as its support, the revolution was imperiled hourly by the insatiable vanities and jealousies of the rival leaders. The Libertador had heard ring in his ears the cry of the mob at Guria. Down with Bolivar! Up with Marino and Bermudez! Would liberty never come? Was this river of blood all that the years of devoted effort were to bring? Bolivar, at the front of his twenty men, hung his head in the agony of defeat and failure. Halt! Halt! whispered one of the riders suddenly. What is that glitter beyond the trees? A horse neighed to the right of the party. An ambuscade, cried hoarsely the first of the red-coated officers. The drooping figure of Bolivar stiffened. The dark eyes flashed. He turned in his saddle. Then, in a voice of thunder, he cried, Columns, extend right and left. Attack on both flanks. It was an order to an imaginary force behind. The officers of his escort repeated the order and rode forward, discharging their pistols. The ambuscade melted away. The Spaniards, inferring a superior force, had taken flight. The insurgent party continued southward. As it marched, here and there, 
wild llaneros and peons were drafted in by payment, promise, or impressment. With a force swelled to some hundreds, Bolivar reached the Orinoco. In the city of Angostura, to be later renamed in his honor Ciudad Bolivar, he surprised and blockaded the feeble Spanish garrison. Piar, the mulatto chief of a band of Republican cutthroats who had combined patriotism with profit by seizing the persons and property of the Capuchin friars along the Caroni, now joined Bolivar. The latter sent him to attack San Felix. The bloodthirsty but efficient half-breed defeated the Spanish garrison and took prisoner the governor, 75 officers, and 200 men, all of whom he remorselessly slaughtered. Fearing now lest the monks whom Piar had captured would embarrass his movements, Polivar sent a message to one of the mulatto's officers in charge, saying, Transport the prisoners to La Divina Pastora. The officer, not knowing of the town thus named, and supposing that he was to send the monks to the divine shepherdess in heaven, forthwith massacred them all. Neither of these atrocities was punished. Of such deeds was the war. Murder marched alike with royalist and revolutionist. On July 17th, the weak Spanish forces abandoned Angostura and Los Castillos. The Orinoco was in possession of the revolutionists. Bolivar's joy was intense. The capture of Angostura marked the turning point in the struggle, as the capture of Trenton had signaled the turn of the tide for Washington. A few days after the capture of Angostura, Bolivar's staff met in the thick-walled house which lodged the Libertador. The members of his provisional cabinet were there. Zea, Martinez, Brion, Colonel Wilson, commander of the Red Hussars, the English Dr. Moore. A map lay on the table before them, blue pins locating the royalist troops. These occupied Cartagena, Valencia, Caracas, Barcelona, the cities all along the north coast. A few red pins showed the scattered centers of the revolutionists. Santander in New Granada, Marino and Bermudez on the northeast, opposite Trinidad, Arismendi on the island of Margarita. What was to be the next move? I propose that we stay here and meet the troops sent against us, suggested Zea. Colonel Wilson objected. The Spaniards will beat Marino and Bermudez one after the other and then overwhelm us. The colonel is right, insisted Bolivar. We must strike while they are separated. Join Bermudez and Marino in the northeast, counseled Martinez. March westward along the coast and attack Morillo. He had only 700 Spaniards on the island when he attacked Arismendi. Bolivar shook his head. Better fight alone than with them. They will sacrifice me, the Republic, and anything else to their vanity and love of power. You know how Bermudez drew his sword on me at Giuria and the plots to kill me. There was silence for a moment. The fate of Spanish South America hung on the decision. A rattle of hoofs sounded outside. A rough voice demanded admission. I would see General Bolivar. I come from Uncle Paez, called the mounted figure. Bring him here, said Bolivar. A half-breed llanero, barefooted, clad in dirty cotton shirt and trousers, his head thrust through a great blue poncho, shambled in before the council. Which is Bolivar? he asked. The leader was pointed out, and the llanero approached and put his hand familiarly on the officer's shoulder, the undisciplined plainsman's greeting. Uncle Paez sends me to you to tell that the unconquered bravos de Apure, with a thousand llaneros, will ride with you against the Spaniard. The members of the council looked at each other. Paez, with his vaqueros, roving over the boundless plains of the interior, from which for four years he had been harrying the Spanish outposts, was hardly known to most of these caraquenos and margaritans, though Bolivar had heard of his exploits in New Granada. Bolivar seized the map. Where is Paez? he cried. By the Apure, near San Fernando, said the peon. In a flash, the libertador's mind was made up. He turned to the llanero. Write to General Paez and say I march to join him. He rose to his feet and pointed to the map. See, si, senores, here lies our route. We hold in Angostura the gateway to the Orinoco. 
As far as Santa Fe de Bogotá, there is no force to oppose us along the line of the Orinoco and Apure. We are in the rear of the enemy, whose strength is in the coast towns. Here we have cattle and horses. Here we can raise recruits from the llaneros, who care not for whom they fight, and who are for us now that Boves is gone. If beaten, we can retreat like Tartars to the immeasurable plains. We will march to Apure and join Paez, he hesitated. Morillo will come down thus from the north in haste. We will meet him. His finger halted, then pointed to the plain near Calabozo. We will meet him here. Now gather our forces and organize. This is the death grapple. Recruits flocked to Bolivar's standards. To pay them, he confiscated the property of all Spaniards. The blood-stained PR, found plotting against Bolivar, as Lee against Washington, was more summarily treated. He was shot, and his force was attached to Bolivar's own. With 2,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry, the leader started from Angostura on the 31st December, 1817, up the Orinoco. Bolivar was joined on the way by his fugitive lieutenant, Sarasa, and a remnant of men. On January 31st, he united with General Paez and added 1,000 cavalry and 250 infantry to his army. Together, they marched against Morillo. At El Diamante, the Apure River barred their way. If it were not passed, their sudden attack on Morillo would be checked and the Spaniard could rally his forces. Moored to the opposite bank was a Spanish gunboat, three flat-bottomed flecheras, and several canoes. Bolivar paced up and down nervously. You have brought me here, General Paez. How will you get me across? he asked querulously. On those flacheras over there, said Paez nonchalantly. Bolivar looked after him in amazement. Paez had already gone to his llaneros. We must have those flacheras, children, he cried. Who will come with Uncle Paez and capture them? Choose whom you want, uncle, was the answering shout. Fifty llaneros he picked out. On horseback, lance in hand, they entered the stream and swam into the current. Two men were seized by caimans and dragged below as Bolivar's force breathlessly watched them. The forty-eight reached the flacheras and the gunboat, the Spaniards too surprised to resist seriously. In a tumult of triumph, the boats were sailed across the river. On February 12, Bolivar appeared before the surprised Morillo near Calabosa. The small Spanish force was attacked, beaten, and massacred without quarter. Then the fortunes of war turned against the Libertador. He was driven back to the Orinoco, but reinforcements had begun to come in now that he held firmly the great river artery. Several hundred blacks from Haiti joined him. An Irish legion came, commanded by General Devereux, and a British officer, English by name, one of Wellington's trusted subordinates, arranged for the equipment and shipment of 1,200 good troops. Most of these were soldiers of fortune, veterans left without congenial occupation at the close of the Napoleonic Wars. Notable among the volunteers was Francis M. Drexel of Philadelphia, an Austrian portrait painter who later, with Bolivar's backing, was to found the great banking house of which John Pierpont Morgan is now the head. By the end of 1818, Bolivar had won out sufficiently to issue a call for the Congress of Angostura to meet on January 1st, 1819, to frame a republican form of government and replace the military dictatorship. The magnificent dream of the Libertador now took shape. It was to erect upon the ruins of Spanish power a great centralized republic, extending from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the Caribbean Sea to the Valley of the Amazon, covering all of northern South America. Against the party that desired to carve up this vast territory into a number of small sovereign states loosely federated, Bolivar threw the whole weight of his vast influence. He pleaded before the Congress, I have been obliged to beg you to adopt centralization and the union of all the states in a republic, one and indivisible. The Congress wavered and then sided with Bolivar. There was decreed a unified republic, including what are now the republics of Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. Of this empire, named Greater Colombia, 
Bolivar was chosen the first president. The ideal of the Libertador had triumphed, but the bulk of this domain was yet to be conquered. The first assault was planned against the Spaniards in the northwest, in New Granada. Here the flames of resistance had been kept alight by General Santander, with whose ragged band it was Bolivar's immediate purpose to unite. By the middle of June 1819, this preliminary move had been successfully taken. But the Andes had yet to be crossed, and at the worst time of the year, the passage of the Cordilleras with a tattered and steadily diminishing handful of famished men was an act of desperate courage. It meant four weeks of weary climbing over snow-capped peaks and through freezing torrents. The road traversed by the poor wretches was marked by crosses in memory of those who had perished in the snow sierras. But beyond those awful mountains lay the smiling plains of New Granada, and its populace was friendly to the patriot cause. Disregarding all recognized rules of the game of war, Bolivar, who was in terrible need of provisions and arms, determined to leave the enemy across his line of communications and make direct for the important town of Tunja. It was taking a risk, but a necessary risk, and one that was completely justified by the result. For Barriero, the Spanish general, conceiving that he must fight for the defense of Tunja, gave Bolivar battle at Boyacá and was utterly routed. Barriero broke his sword across his knee and surrendered, with many officers and some 1,600 men. The Patriot army had to mourn the loss of only 13 killed and 53 wounded. Everywhere now, Bolivar was victorious. He marched to Bogotá, from which Samano, the Spanish viceroy, fled. Returning eastward, he fought the desperate battle of Carabobo, which finally freed Venezuela from the Spanish yoke. The dogged heroism of the British Legion, which lost a third of its men and two commanders in succession, saved the day. As Bolivar rode past their shattered ranks that night, he hailed them, Salvadores de mi patria. All of its survivors were made on the field of battle, members of the Order of Liberators. On into Peru went Bolivar, proclaimed dictator by the inhabitants. On the field of Ayacucho, while the dictator was absent, his second-in-command, General Sucre, fought and won a last great battle in which the Spanish army was completely routed and dispersed. The ground for miles was strewn with the silver helmets of the Spanish hussars. Ayacucho, the death blow to Spanish power in South America, was the culminating point of Bolivar's career. Dictator of Peru, President of Greater Colombia, organizer of the new state of Bolivia, his authority extended over a territory two-thirds as large as Europe. He had indignantly rejected all suggestions for monarchy and a personal dynasty. As the Libertador, he had fought to free, not to enslave. For one brief moment, as splendid a vision as man has ever cherished was real. The great South American Republic. Almost in an hour, the whole structure fell. Against him rose the generals who had shared his glory, Santander in New Granada, Paez in Venezuela, Sucre dissatisfied, abandoned Bolivia, Peru demanded the end of the dictatorship, Bolivar's ungrateful fellow countrymen cried out against his inordinate ambition. In his home city of Caracas, an attempt was made to assassinate him. Attacked on all sides by those whom he had befriended and raised to power, Bolivar resigned from the presidency and retired to Cartagena. Even here the enmity of jealous hate hounded him. He prepared to leave South America for a refuge in the West India Islands. But before he could sell, the end had come. Exhausted by the terrible exertions of his life of warfare, broken in spirit, Bankrupt in hope, he died in December 1830 at the age of 47. So little had he personally profited by his supreme position that he had to be buried at the expense of his friends. Thus ended the long line of conquistadores who battled for Trinidad and Guiana. 
for each was the draught of bitterness after all his heroism and all his glory. Columbus carried back to Spain in irons, Deberio dead of disappointment, Raleigh executed by his treacherous king, Picton brought to trial for peculation, Nelson falling for a nation that refused his last prayer, Bolivar dying despised and penniless in the country he had freed. Tragedy, grim and relentless, had marched side by side with the conquistadores. End of section 70. This recording is in the public domain. Section 71 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Read for LibriVox.org by Albert Shu. The Statue of Bolivar. Caracas, Venezuela. Photograph. Page 364. The personal appearance of Bolivar is thus described by Ducodre Holstein. Simon Bolivar is five feet four inches in height, his visage is long, his cheeks hollow, his complexion livid brown, his eyes are of a middle size and sunk deep in his head, which is covered thinly with hair. His mustaches give him a dark and wild aspect, particularly when he is in a passion. His whole body is thin and meager. He has the appearance of a man sixty-five years old. In walking, his arms are in continual motion. He cannot walk long, but becomes soon fatigued. He likes his hammock where he sits or lolls. He gives way to sudden gusts of resentment and becomes in a moment a madman, throws himself into his hammock and utters curses and imprecations upon all around him. He likes to indulge in sarcasms upon absent persons, reads only light French literature, is a bold writer and passionately fond of waltzing. He is fond of hearing himself talk and giving toasts. In adversity and destitute of aid from without, he is perfectly free from passion and violence of temper. He then becomes mild, patient, docile, and even submissive. In a great measure he conceals his faults under the politeness of a man educated in the so-called beau monde, possesses an almost Asiatic talent for dissimulation, and understands mankind better than the mass of his countrymen. End of section 71. This recording is in the public domain. Section 72 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Schmidt. The World Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 72. The Sword of Bolivar by Unknown With the steadfast skies above us and the molten stars below, we sailed to the southern midnight by the coast of Mexico. Alone, on the desolate, dark-ringed, rolling and flashing sea, a grim old Venezuelan kept the deck with me, and talked to me of his country and the long Spanish war, and told how a young republic forged the sword of Bolivar. Of no base mundane metal was the wondrous weapon made, and in no earth-born fire was fashioned the sacred blade. But that it might shine the symbol of law and light in the land, dropped down as a star from heaven, to flame in a hero's hand. And be to the world a portent of eternal might and right, they chose for the steel a splinter from a fallen aerolite. Then a virgin forge they builded by the city and kindled it, with flame from a shattered palm tree which the lightning's torch had lit. That no fire of earthly passion might taint the holy sword, and no ancient error tarnish the falchion of the Lord. 
for quito and new granada and venezuela they pour from three crucibles the dazzling white meteoric ore in three ingots it is moulded and welded into one for an emblem of columbia bright daughter of the sun it is drawn on a virgin anvil it is heated and hammered and rolled it is shaped and tempered and burnished and set in a hilt of gold for thus by the fire and the hammer of war a nation is built and ever the sword of its power is swayed by a golden hilt then with pomp and oratory the mustachioed signores brought to the house of the liberator the weapon they had wrought and they said in their stately phrases o mighty in peace and war no mortal blade we bring you but a flaming meteor the sword of the spaniard is broken and to you in its stead is given to lead and redeem a nation this ray of light from heaven the gaunt-faced liberator from their hands the symbol took and waved it aloft in the sunlight with a high heroic look and he called the saints to witness may these lips turn into dust and this right hand fail if ever it prove recreant to its trust never the sigh of a bondman shall cloud this gleaming steel but only the foe and the traitor its vengeful edge shall feel never a tear of my country its purity shall stain till into your hands who gave it i render it again end of section seventy two this recording is in the public domain Section 73 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 73. The Asphalt Lake of Trinidad. 20th century by lyndon bates jr a long run in the automobile brings us to the celebrated asphalt lake the straggling village at its edge is an extraordinary spectacle not a house but is twisted out of plumb the land is the source of never-ending litigation because the slowly shifting currents of the pitch bottom in a few years move yards and gardens on to other men's property distort boundaries into every possible shape carry landmarks a hundred yards away some natives are doing a little desultory digging here before the territory of the asphalt company begins a green bamboo across the road marks its boundary there shiftlessness ends and system begins well-built mosquito-proof barracks for the workmen with shower baths and clothes racks grace the bare hill a long pier extends far out to sea and the houses of the officers are built over piles alongside swept by every breeze on a cable way to the ship waiting off the pier end goes a slow line of big steel buckets and negroes stand sending the asphalt contents down a chute into the hold the manager of the lake mr proctor clad in khaki and riding gaiters welcomes us with strange drinks and cuban cigars on his swaying house above the waters of the gulf of paria we lunch with him and his engineers after a chat we follow back the half mile long cable way to the lake the abomination of desolation is this lake in spots a palm killed by the asphalt droops disconsolately a few tufts of grass have secured a footing in places but for the rest it is a solid mass of black dull evil-smelling pitch with pools of water here and there in which swim little parboiled fishes against any of the hot spots in the world bar none this can be backed the tropic sun beats down the black asphalt reflects it back like the entrance of a furnace one's feet are unbearably hot through the heavy leather and one sinks if he stands still for a moment a hundred and fifty degrees have been recorded on the lake a wicked-looking black snake six feet long glides into the bushes near the margin of the lake it has been sunning itself on the asphalt no wonder the serpents are supposed to be creatures of the devil as for ourselves fifteen minutes stay takes away every bit of vitality we can summon not enough interest is left in life to inquire what the negroes hewing with mattocks at the asphalt receive in wages they earn the pay whatever it is there is no mechanical way yet discovered by which the stuff can be dug 
hour after hour these negroes hack out with a few blows of the mattock the brittle pitch which flakes away in pieces a foot square they lift the burden to their heads and dump it into steel buckets which start their slow way to the ship the holes fill up in a few days with new pitch the lake is ninety to one hundred acres in extent now says mr proctor but it is gradually shrinking with the removal of such large quantities a good percentage of the asphalt pavement in the world comes from this one lake and its geological complement in venezuela we leased it under a forty seven year contract with the trinidad government to which nearly two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year has been paid in royalties such mining is the nearest thing there is to digging money out of the ground yes but your asphalt trust is welcome to it says mr jefferson if i had a thousand a day to dig pitch i would not take it End of section 73. This recording is in the public domain. Section 74 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 74. Modern Columbia, 20th Century, by Francis E. Clarke. Columbia has shared but little as yet in this upward progress, by reason in part of her difficult geographical position, which has placed her temperate and most largely peopled section so far in the interior and made it so inaccessible to the coast weeks of the most difficult journeying are required to get to the sea coast from bogota or to any of the other states of colombia and panama might as well be on the other side of the globe so far as practical communication goes says mr dawson very early in her history the spaniards lured on by gold made their way to the healthful tablelands in the interior and there quesada their leader established his capital on the site of the ancient chipka city the chipkas were a large nation of a very considerable degree of civilization they made cotton cloth mined the precious metals and emeralds used money as a circulating medium lived in houses built splendid temples established a very effective form of government, in fact, in many lines of civilization, were scarcely inferior to the Incas or Aztecs. But they had no military organization or genius, and two hundred Spaniards soon conquered them, and reduced them to vassalage. The next three centuries were centuries of rapacity and oppression, of bloodshed and revolt, and stern reprisals, we cannot follow their wearisome years in detail. At last, the people awoke to a sense of their rights and their wrongs. The ferment of the French Revolution began to work in far-off and backward Colombia. The troubles of Spain in the Napoleonic Wars gave the people their opportunity, and in 1808 the series of revolts began, which at last, under Bolivar, gave Colombia and the other republics their so-called freedom or at least transferred the location of their tyrants from Spain to their own shores, and gave them grafters of their own nation, instead of foreign oppressors, to batten on the national necessities. The history of the last hundred years has been a history of revolutions, new constitutions, and the constant swinging of the pendulum from extreme republicanism to dictatorship and back again, but often at both extremes, with a set of rapacious and corrupt rulers in power. Presidents and cabinet officers, who have been personally honest and who have desired better things for Colombia, have been handicapped by lack of power to inaugurate reforms, by the inertness of the people, and by the desperate condition of the finances of the country. Bolivar plunged the country hopelessly in debt, at the very beginning of her independent national life, by recklessly borrowing money for his mercenary troops and for his navy. Dishonesty and continued reckless borrowing increased this debt, 
until it amounted to thirty-five millions of dollars. After the separation of Venezuela and Ecuador from Colombia, each country nominally assumed its proportionate part of the debt, which, in Colombia's case, has been repeatedly scaled down, and even the interest has scarcely been paid. Yet in spite of debts, bad government, and revolutions, Colombia remains a state, great in territory, and enormously rich in natural products. The gold it contains alone would make it rich, if intelligently mined and conserved. Along the river banks it is said you find pay dirt everywhere, and cannot wash the soil of these banks at any point without finding color. Since the Spanish conquest, more than three quarters of a billion dollars worth of the yellow metal have been taken out of Colombia, and the mines are still far from being exhausted. Bogota, the capital, is a city of 120,000 inhabitants, and is the literary and intellectual, as well as the political center of the country. It has an American-installed street railway and system of electrical lights, and a library of 50,000 volumes. The Spanish spoken in Bogota is said to be particularly pure, and she has contributed more, perhaps, to the literature of South America than any other one center. The event in Colombian history of most interest to American readers was the last revolt of Panama, which separated that province from the rest of Colombia and made it possible for the United States to dig the Great Canal. I have called it the last revolt, for Panama has been in a chronic state of secession for hundreds of years. At times, her connection with far-off and inaccessible Bogota was merely nominal. At other times, she was held in absolute and rasping vassalage, which galled her spirits and tempted her to constant efforts to break away from Colombia. In 1885, the very delegates who nominally represented her in the Constitutional Convention were residents of Bogota, appointed by President Nunes. Military rule became a permanent thing on the Isthmus. All officials were strangers, sent from the Andean Plateau, and the million dollars of taxes wrung each year from the people of Panama were spent in maintaining the soldiers who kept them in subjection. One of the periodical revolts of Panama occurred in 1895, but it was premature and ill-managed, and was speedily put down by the Colombian troops. A much more formidable rebellion broke out in 1899 and resulted in a three years civil war in which 30,000 men were slain. No wonder, then, that the Panamians were all ready to take advantage of the hitch in negotiations between the United States and the Colombian governments when the corrupt officials at Bogota held out for more than the ten millions offered for the canal rights, and threatened to hinder, if not prevent, the eventual building of the canal through Panama. Then came Panama's golden opportunity, and she seized it by declaring her independence. The new Republic of Panama was proclaimed November the 3rd, 1903. All the resident inhabitants were practically in favor of the new republic, whose interests were entirely bound up with the canal. The prompt recognition of Panama by the United States ten days later, and by France fifteen days later, prevented Colombia from repeating the bloody scenes of 1899-1902, and made it possible to build the canal, which will vastly promote the progress, unification, and civilization of the world. End of section 74「Section 75 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico and the West Indies」read for LibriVox.org. South America, Part 4. Brazil. Historical Note. Brazil was seen in 1500 by both Pinzon of Spain and Cabral of Portugal. As it was east of the Pope's line of demarcation, it fell into the hands of Portugal, and a year later, the Portuguese made a settlement on the island of San Vicente. Bahia, the early capital, was founded in 1549. In the Napoleonic days, the exiled royal family of Portugal fled to Brazil. 
in 1822, soon after their return, Brazil declared its independence and crowned Don Pedro, Prince Regent, as Emperor. He was succeeded by his son, Don Pedro II. He ruled wisely and with devotion to the country, but in 1889 discontent arose, a republic was proclaimed, and the emperor and his family were forced to leave Brazil within 24 hours. Since that time, the country has remained a republic. Brazil is larger than the territory of the United States, exclusive of Alaska, but contains less than one-fifth as many inhabitants. The great need of the country is immigrants to develop the vast area of untilled land. There is scarcely a plant that will not grow somewhere within its boundaries, and with present methods of preventing tropical diseases, Brazil must soon become one of the great food-producing countries of the world. End of section 75. This recording is in the public domain. Section 76 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 76. The Discovery of Brazil, 1500, by Robert Grant Watson. In the year 1499, Vicente Yanez Pinzon of Palos, one of the three brothers who had sailed with Columbus in his first voyage seven years previously, obtained from the King of Castile the necessary permission to embark on an expedition of discovery on the Atlantic. Pinzon, who was accompanied by two nephews, as well as by several sailors who had sailed with Columbus, set out with four caravels from the port of Palos, putting to sea in the beginning of December. After passing the Canary and the Cape Verde Islands, the expedition proceeded to the southwest. Having sailed about three hundred leagues, they crossed the equator and lost sight of the North Star. On crossing the equinoctial line, they encountered a terrible tempest, but the confused mariners looked in vain for a guide whereby to steer. Pinzon pursued his course resolutely to the west, and after sailing for about two hundred and forty leagues farther, being then in the eighth degree of southern latitude, he beheld, on the twentieth of January, a point of land, which he called Consolation, but which is now known as Cape St. Augustine, in the province of Pernambuco. The sea was discolored, and on sounding they found sixteen fathoms of water. Pinzon, as in duty bound, landed with a notary, and took formal possession of the territory for the crown of Castile. The natives whom he saw in the neighborhood declined to have any dealings whatsoever with the strangers. And not liking their appearance, the commander made sail next day, and stood to the northwest, until he came to the mouth of a river, where he again encountered a multitude of naked Indians, with whom his men had a desperate encounter, in which a number of Spaniards were wounded or slain. Discouraged by this reception, the navigator now stood forty leagues to the northwest, being once more near the Econoctial line. Here the water was so sweet that he replenished his casks from it. Astonished at this phenomenon, he stood in for land, and arrived among a number of islands, whose people he found hospitable, and in no way afraid of intercourse with the strangers. By degrees Pinzon realized the fact that these islands lay at the mouth of an immense river, a river so great that its dimensions can scarcely be realized by one accustomed even to the largest of European streams, such as the Danube or the Volga, far less by one whose ideas of an inland stream were formed by the Quadalquivir. The mariner had in fact alighted at the mouth of the mightiest of the mighty streams of the New World, a river which pours into the ocean a greater volume of water than even the Mississippi or the Plata. He had reached the Amazon, a stream which, 
discovered at its mouth by one Spaniard, was a few years later to be traced throughout the greater part of its course down to the ocean by another Spaniard, the ill-fated Orellana. The Amazon at its mouth has a breadth of no less than thirty leagues, the volume of water proceeding through, which penetrates for forty leagues into the sea before losing its sweetness. Whilst laying at the mouth of this river, Pinzon encountered a sudden swelling of the stream, which, meeting the current of the ocean, caused a rise of more than five fathoms, the mountain waves threatening his ships with destruction. Having extricated his vessels with no small difficulty from this danger, Pinzon, finding that there was no object to detain him in this region, showed that he was not less civilized than other Spanish navigators at the time in the matter of requiting hospitality by carrying off thirty-six natives as slaves. Having the polar star once more to guide him, the mariner pursued his course along the coast, passing the mouth of the Orinoco and entering the Gulf of Peria, where he took in Brazil wood, and from which he emerged by the celebrated Boca del Drago. He subsequently reached Palos about the end of September of the same year, having lost two of his vessels at the Bahamas. Vicente Pinzon has the glory of having been the first European to cross the equinoctial line on the western Atlantic, and of having discovered Brazil. End of section 76「Section 77 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. The World Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 77. Why Brazil Belonged to Portugal, 1500. By Thomas Bonaventure Lawler. All the people of Europe believed that the voyages of Columbus had opened for Spain a westward route to the eagerly sought Spice Islands. As Vasco da Gama had given to Portugal an eastward route to these islands, it was probable that serious trouble might arise between the Portuguese and the Spaniards. At this time, practically all the Christian nations were in communion with the Roman Catholic Church. Spain and Portugal, therefore, were glad to turn to the Supreme Pontiff, as head of the Church, to pass judgment on any disputed questions. As early as 1454, Portugal had asked Pope Nicholas V to confirm her title to the territory which the Portuguese had discovered along the coast of Africa. This request was granted. Later decrees of the popes gave Portugal the title to all lands already found, or which should be found by them, not only from Morocco southward, but even to the far east. By these decrees, Portugal obtained the sole right to the water route around Africa to India. Spain did not long delay in securing from the Supreme Pontiff title to her discoveries. Less than two months after the return of Columbus, Pope Alexander VI granted to Spain exclusive rights to the lands which she had just discovered. It was now more and more evident that there would soon be war between Spain and Portugal, unless the disputes arising from their recent discoveries should be settled. Both of these nations were very anxious to avoid war. They therefore asked the Pope to mark the boundary between their territories. The Pope believed that the fairest method would be to give to Spain the lands to the west, and to Portugal those to the east. He therefore drew a line, called the line of demarcation, from the north to the south pole, one hundred leagues west of any one of the Azores and the Cape Verde Islands. It was supposed that these two groups of islands were on the same meridian. This decision was acceptable to Portugal. She soon changed her mind, however, as she feared this division would forever shut her out from the New World across the Atlantic. She therefore asked to have the line moved farther westward, and with Spain's permission the line was drawn, June 7, 1494, 370 leagues west of the Cape Verde Islands. This change was a fortunate one for Portugal, since it gave her title to a part of South America, as we shall now see. 
The Portuguese were at this time frequently sending vessels to India to fetch the silks, dye stuffs, and spices of the rich eastern ports. Early in the year 1500, Cabral, a Portuguese nobleman, sailed with a splendid fleet of 13 ships on the long journey to India. He planned to trade with the Oriental princes and to establish posts for commerce with India. Cabral took with him rich presents to win the goodwill of the eastern kings. Desiring to avoid the dangerous coast of Africa, he sailed farther westward than was usual. Without his knowing it, his vessels were carried by the great South Atlantic current to the west. To his great surprise, he saw, one April morning, land on the horizon. Cabral called the newly discovered country Veracruz, True Cross, a name later changed to Santa Cruz, Holy Cross. The name Brazil, by which it is now known, was given to it from the dye wood, which is exported in large quantities to Europe. If this land were to the east of the line of demarcation, it belonged, of course, to Portugal. Cabral believed this to be a fact, and he therefore set up a large cross and claimed the country for his king. At the same time, he sent back a vessel to Portugal with the glad news of his discovery. It was later found that the line did run through this part of the New World, and for this reason Portugal secured Brazil. She held it for almost 400 years, and the Portuguese language remains to this day the tongue of the people, while in nearly all the remainder of South America the Spanish language is spoken. End of section 77《セクション78 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The World Story》Volume 11 — Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies — Edited by Eva March Tappan — Section 78 — How King John VI Came to Brazil, 1808 — by D. B. Kidder and J. C. Fletcher. In the days of the French Revolution, Portugal fell into the power of Napoleon. The Portuguese king, Don John VI, could remain at home and in all probability lose his throne, or he could go on board the British squadron, sail to Brazil, and rule an enormous domain in South America. He chose the latter course. The Editor by a royal decree, he, Don John the Sixth, announced his intention to retire to Rio de Janeiro until the conclusion of a general peace. The archives, the treasures, and the most precious effects of the crown were transferred to the Portuguese and English fleets, and, on the 29th of November, 1807, accompanied by his family and a multitude of faithful followers, the Prince Regent took his departure amid the combined salvos of the cannon of Great Britain and of Portugal. That very day, Marshal Junot thundered upon the height of Lisbon, and the next morning took possession of the city. Early in January 1808, the news of these surprising events reached Rio de Janeiro, and excited the most lively interest. What the Brazilians had dreamed of only as a remote possible event was now suddenly to be realized. The royal family might be expected to arrive any day and preparations for their reception occupied the attention of all. The Viceroy's palace was immediately prepared, and all the public offices in the palace square were vacated to accommodate the royal suite. These, not being deemed sufficient, proprietors of private houses in the neighborhood were required to leave their residences and send in their keys to the Viceroy. Such were the sentiments of the people respecting the hospitality due to their distinguished guests that nothing seems to have been withheld, while many, even of the less opulent families, voluntarily offered sums of money and objects of value to administer to their comfort. The fleet having been scattered in a storm, the principal vessels had put into Bahia, where Don John the Sixth gave that carta regia which opened the ports of Brazil to the commerce of the world. At length, all made a safe entry into the harbor of Rio on the 7th of March, 1808. In the manifestations of joy upon this occasion, the houses were deserted and the hills were covered with spectators. Those who could, 
procured boats and sailed out to meet the royal squadron. The prince, immediately after landing, proceeded to the cathedral and publicly offered thanks for his safe arrival. The city was illuminated for nine successive evenings. In order to form any idea of the changes that have occurred in Brazil during the last fifty years, footnote, this was written in 1857, and a footnote. It must be remarked that, up to the period now under consideration, all commerce and intercourse with foreigners had been rightly prohibited by the narrow policy of Portugal. Vessels of nations allied to the mother country were occasionally permitted to come to anchor in the ports of this mammoth colony, but neither passengers nor crew were allowed to land, excepting under the superintendence of a guard of soldiers. The policy pursued by China and Japan was scarcely more strict and prohibitory. To prevent all possibility of trade, foreign vessels, whether they had put in to repair damages or to procure provisions and water, immediately on their arrival were invested with a custom-house guard, and the time for their remaining was fixed by the authorities, according to the supposed necessities of the case. As a consequence of these oppressive regulations, a people who were rich in gold and diamonds were unable to procure the essential implements of agriculture and of domestic convenience. A wealthy planter, who could display the most rich and massive plate at a festival, might not be able to furnish each of his guests with a knife at table. A single tumbler, at the same time, might be under the necessity of making repeated circuits through the company. The printing press had not made its appearance. Books and learning were equally rare. The people were, in every way, made to feel their dependence, and the spirit of industry and enterprise were alike unknown. On the arrival of the Prince Regent, the ports were thrown open. A printing press was introduced, and a royal gazette was published. Academies of medicine and the fine arts were established. The royal library, containing 60,000 volumes of books, was opened for the free use of the public. Foreigners were invited, and embassies from England and France took up their residence at Rio de Janeiro. From this period, decided improvements were made in the condition and aspect of the city. New streets and squares were added, and splendid residences were arranged on the neighboring islands and hills, augmenting with the growth of the town, the picturesque beauties of the surrounding scenery. The sudden and continued influx of Portuguese and foreigners not only showed itself in the population of Rio, but extended inland, causing new ways of communication to be opened with the interior, new towns to be erected, and old ones to be improved. In fact, the whole face of the country underwent great and rapid changes. The manners of the people also experienced a corresponding mutation. The fashions of Europe were introduced. From the seclusion and restraints of non-intercourse, the people emerged into the festive ceremonies of a court, whose levies and gala days drew together multitudes from all directions. In the mingled society which the capital now offered, the dust of retirement was brushed off, antiquated customs gave way, new ideas and modes of life were adopted, and these spread from circle to circle and from town to town. Business assumed an aspect equally changed, Foreign commercial houses were opened, and foreign artisans established themselves in Rio and other cities. This country could no longer remain a colony. A decree was promulgated in December 1815, declaring it elevated to the dignity of a kingdom, and hereafter to form an integral part of the United Kingdom of Portugal, Algarves, and Brazil. It is scarcely possible to imagine the enthusiasm awakened by this unlooked-for change throughout the vast extent of Portuguese America. Messengers were dispatched to bear the news, which was hailed with spontaneous illuminations from the La Plata to the Amazon. End of section 78. This recording is in the public domain. Section 79 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 11, 
Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 79. Dom Pedro II, the Exiled Emperor, 1889, by Marie Robinson Wright. Dom Pedro held a meeting of his ministers and counselors of state. He endeavored to form a new ministry, with Saraiva at the head, but Marshal Deodoro da Fonseca objected to this, and sent the following message to the emperor. The democratic sentiment of the nation, combined with resentment at the systematic repressive measures of the government against the army and navy, and the spoliation of the rights, have brought about the revolution. In the face of this situation, the presence of the imperial family is impossible. Yielding, therefore, to the exigencies of the national voice, the provisional government is compelled to request you to depart from Brazilian territory with your family within twenty-four hours. The government will provide, at its own expense, the proper means for transport, and will afford protection for the imperial family during their embarkation. The government will also continue the imperial dowry fixed by law until the constituted assembly decides thereon. The country expects that you will know how to imitate the example set by the first emperor of Brazil on April the 7th, 1831. Dom Pedro's answer to this communication, which was promptly sent to Fonseca on the same day, was as follows. Yielding to the imperiousness of circumstances, I have resolved to set out with my family tomorrow for Europe, leaving this country so dear to us all, and to which I have endeavored to give constant proofs of deep love during the nearly half a century in which I have discharged the office of chief of state. While thus leaving with my whole family, I shall ever retain for Brazil the most heartfelt affection and ardent good wishes for her prosperity. On the same day, the Condesa de, Princess Isabel, issued the following manifesto. With a broken heart, I part from my friends, from the whole people of Brazil, and from my country, which I have so loved and still do love, toward whose happiness I have done my best to contribute, and for which I shall ever entertain the most ardent good wishes. The Conde de, husband of Isabel, wrote to the Minister of War, resigning command of the artillery, and requesting leave to go abroad, adding that he had loyally served Brazil, and that, but for the circumstances which obliged him to quit the country, he would be ready to serve it under any form of government. At two o'clock in the morning of the following day, General Deodoro sent one of his officers and a detachment of soldiers with orders to the imperial family to embark forthwith, it being deemed unadvisable to wait until daylight, lest some demonstration in the streets might lead to bloodshed. The crown princess Isabel, the Conde de, and their children walked to the quay, which was but a short distance from the palace, followed immediately by the emperor and empress in a carriage, guarded by troops. The party embarked on a steam launch, and were taken on board a man-of-war, which conveyed them to Ilha Grande, the present quarantine station about sixty miles from the capital, where they remained until the afternoon, when they were transferred to the steamship Alagoas, accompanied by two lieutenants of the navy commissioned to see that the steamer went direct to Lisbon. The Alagoas was also convoyed, a part of the way, by the Brazilian ironclad Riachuelo. The first official notification of the revolution received abroad was sent to the Brazilian legation in London, and read as follows. Brazilian Minister, London. The government is constituted as the Republic of the United States of Brazil. The monarchy is deposed, and the imperial family have left the country. Tranquility and general satisfaction prevail. The executive power is entrusted to a provisional government, whose head is Marshal Deodoro, with myself as finance minister. The Republic respects all engagements, obligations, and contracts of the state. Rui Barbosa, finance minister. It is a remarkable fact, and without a parallel in history, that within a few days after the proclamation of the Republic, there was little to indicate from the general appearance of things, that the empire had ever existed. The London Times, in an editorial commenting on the event, said, The Brazilian Revolution has been carried out with a sobriety, a coolness, an attention to detail, and a general finish about all the arrangements, 
which in all the circumstances of the case are really remarkable. The fortnightly review remarked, the leaders of the revolution did nothing more than peacefully enact a change upon which the heart of the country had long been set. In the carrying out of their program, the Republicans showed no animosity toward the old emperor, for whom, personally, there was a general feeling of regard. Their quarrel was not with the gentle scholar who represented in his person the monarchical government, but with the system itself and the constituted authorities who had abused its powers. Dom Pedro II was a man of many good qualities, a student, and a lover of science. Agassi once said of him, Alas, Dom Pedro is a most unfortunate man, for, if he were not an emperor, he would be a scientist. An impartial biographer describes him as not a man born to rule millions. Art, engineering, classical lore, nothing came amiss to him and he talked equally well on all subjects, albeit he was inclined to push scholarship to pedantry. He was refined and courtly in manner, and scrupulously careful to avoid hurting the susceptibilities of others. He never refused to visit a school, a hospital, or institution of any kind. He was in his element in any international exhibition, equally interested in every department. He gave foreigners of culture a cordial welcome to his court, whatever might be their social position, and he never, to the day of his death, ceased to puzzle over the problem as to why every Brazilian had not tastes similar to his own. He was not without a sense of humor, as shown in his remark to the expert who was explaining the working of a big wheel in a factory exhibit in England. One thousand revolutions a minute, you say? Why, that beats South America! End of section 79. This recording is in the public domain. Section 80 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 80. An American Colony in Brazil, 1910, by Nevin O. Winter. In traveling over Brazil, I frequently met with American young men and women who informed me that they came from the Villa Americana. So often did that name reach my ears that I decided to visit this place and see for myself what kind of a settlement it was and how these voluntarily expatriate fellow countrymen lived in this land so different from our own it is a journey of about two hours from campinas over the palista railway but first let me tell you the history of this colony at the close of the civil war many southern families whose plantations had been devastated by the northern armies felt that they could not live again under the old flag Proud-spirited and unconquered, these brave Southern veterans, who had marched with Stonewall Jackson and the Lees and Johnstons, decided that they would leave the land that had given them birth and seek fortunes anew in a new land, and amidst new surroundings. Brazil appeared to the leaders in this movement because the plantation system was similar to that under which they had been raised, and slavery was legal in that land, which was still an empire. A few men went as an advance guard and selected a site about 100 miles northwest of the city of Sao Paulo. A favorable report was made to those still back in the States, and it was not long before several hundred families had left their southern homes and were making new homes underneath the Southern Cross. In all, it is estimated that at least 500 American families located in that section of the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil between the years 1865 and 1870. They came from Texas, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, and perhaps one or two other of the seceding states. As I stepped off the Hapio, as the express train is called down there, the name Villa Americana, which means American Village, on the neat little station struck a sympathetic chord in my heart. It seemed good also to see a number of tall, slender men, typical southern types such as one might see at almost any station in 
tennessee or georgia standing on the platform awaiting the incoming train one member of the colony who was in the government employ was with me and performed the introductions necessary how do you do glad to see you come around and see me and similar cordial expressions came from everyone and the best of it is that they were sincere and not the empty meaningless expressions so often heard it was a pleasure to accept several of these invitations as many as my limited time allowed on entering the home of perhaps the most prosperous member of this colony i felt like standing at attention and giving a salute when i saw the silk starred and striped banner of uncle sam fastened up on the wall of the best room the house itself with its large hall roomy apartments and broad veranda surrounding the house looked like one of the plantation houses so common in the south this man had a large family of children all of whom with one exception had been educated in the schools of the united states and two boys were at that time in one of our colleges about the whole house was an american atmosphere that warmed the very heart's blood in a traveller so far away from home and so it was in the other houses i visited in every one was the same cordiality the same pleasure at seeing some one from the states and the same loyalty to everything american in some of the younger members one could detect a slight accent in speaking english which is always noticeable when children learn a latin tongue in their babyhood the older ones said that these young people speak the portuguese with a similar foreign accent the young ladies of the american colony and there are a number of them were typical american girls bright cheery and free as their sisters at home and so different from the brazilian young women among whom they live and who are so hampered by the customs and traditions of their race we took a trolley ride over the settlement but is rather different from the american trolley for it is nothing more than an old-fashioned buckboard many of the original members of the colony became dissatisfied and returned to their former homes there are however four or five hundred americans still living in this colony or within a radius of a few miles a few have moved to other parts of brazil and others have intermarried with brazilians but in general they have remained true to their americanism some of the original families purchased slaves and worked their plantations in that way until that institution was abolished in eighteen eighty eight a few have prospered very much but many others have done just fairly well one of the wealthiest men made his little fortune out of watermelons others have sugar plantations and make brandy or raise coffee and still others do general farming similar to what they were accustomed in the southern states a protestant church called the union church adorns one hill and a schoolhouse in a conspicuous building is in another part of the village someone told me that the war was a tabooed subject that the few older members still left were fighting the battles over when i met the oldest member of the colony who had left the united states in eighteen sixty five the impulse came to test this subject i mentioned the fact that my own father had served in the union army and fought for his country on that side this old man who was past the allotted threescore and ten and who had fought with that intrepid warrior stonewall jackson then told me the whole history of the colony and the causes that led to its establishment it was a mistake he said but we did not realize it then and afterwards it was too late to sacrifice what we had here and move back we still love the old flag when i left he gave me the brazilian embrace as a special mark of favor and i verily believe that i left a good friend in this old man who had the traits that we all love in the southern gentleman when senator root then secretary of state visited brazil four years ago footnote this was written in nineteen ten and a footnote a new station was named elio root in his honor on the paulista railway and this name stands out conspicuously on every timetable of that line the special train that conveyed him passed through the villa americana and he was asked to stop and address the americans when the train stopped many of the older residents met him with tears in their eyes and i was told the eyes of the distinguished american were not dry and he has said that it was the most pathetic incident in his trip he was asked whether it would be better for the colony to remain in brazil or return to the united states 
stay where you are he said and be good brazilians you'll find the state so changed that they would no longer seem like home the secretary was right a few months before my visit one of the prosperous members of the colony went with his family to his old home in texas with the intention of remaining there he left his property in the hands of an agent for sale a few weeks after his arrival in texas he cabled to his agent not to sell the property as he was coming back in a few months he and his family returned to the villa giving as his reason that the old neighborhood had changed so much that it did not seem so much like home as brazil the members of this colony are now brazilian subjects the younger ones because of their birth in that land and the older ones by virtue of a general proclamation few of them actually take any part in the politics of the land all of them of course speak the portuguese language but use the english in their homes they are still americans at heart end of section eighty this recording is in the public domain section eighty one of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies read for librivox dot org south america part five paraguay and uruguay historical note the most interesting part of the history of paraguay is the tale of the dominion of the jesuit missionaries whose rule lasted from sixteen o nine to seventeen sixty eight they established missions or reductions where they not only gave the indians religious instruction but also taught their converts civilization and morality and the manner of carrying on various trades at the time of the expulsion of the jesuits in seventeen sixty eight there were four hundred thousand natives in these missions paraguay declared its independence in eighteen eleven but for many years was under the control of dictators one of these carlos lopez died in eighteen sixty two and was succeeded by his son francisco solano lopez who schemed to seize parts of brazil bolivia and argentina a desperate war followed lopez infuriated by his lack of success accused of conspiracy not only some of his civil officers but also members of the foreign legations among these was the american minister charles a washburn together with two of his official family these last two were subjected to torture and their lives were saved only by the timely arrival of the american squadron lopez executed his own brother and sister and had his mother flogged again and again finally in eighteen seventy he was slain by the brazilians and his country breathed freely once more the later history of the country has been uneventful the early history of uruguay from its discovery and first colonization to the nineteenth century is hardly more than a series of struggles between spaniards and portuguese spain won the prize but in eighteen eleven the little country declared its independence and in eighteen fourteen accepted the rule of the protector artigas but peace is rarely of long duration in south america and soon the little state much smaller than nebraska was annexed to brazil a little later it again became independent and a full-fledged republic in eighteen sixty four an alliance was formed with brazil and argentina against lopez change followed change but the country is rich and it may be hoped that the future of quiet as well as of prosperity lies before it end of section eighty one this recording is in the public domain section eighty two of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume eleven canada south america central america mexico and the west indies edited by eva march tappan section eighty two life at a paraguayan reduction by mrs marion g mulhall the following extract describes the everyday life of one of these mission centres 
the editor each mission was laid out in chessboard fashion in blocks the streets intersecting each other at right angles the huts were of sun-dried bricks with tile roofs the only structures of note being the church and college which formed two sides of the plaza or principal square the college or residence of the fathers of whom there were two in every mission was of massive proportions in the shape of a quadrangle with corridors on each side as a shelter from the sun but so devoid of luxury that the windows had wooden shutters instead of glass the workshops were generally two hundred feet in length with all the necessary appliances for blacksmiths carpenters stone cutters and such like trades each mission had also a granary an armory and a town hall for the use of the alcaldes the high moral character of the jesuits tended in a great measure to their influence over the natives with whose temporal affairs they seemed to meddle as little as possible the alcaldes managed all the municipal matters subject of course to the orders of the cura who acted as governor and administered all public works the second father was del teniente and attended solely to spiritual concerns austerity formed no part of the jesuit system which was rather of an easy character to suit the simple natives while the habits of order and discipline were on a military footing everything that regarded the public interests was conducted with the utmost formality and the church feasts and ceremonies were of a brilliant and impressive nature the jesuits remained mostly in their schools and workshops being seldom seen in public unless on great occasions or in church surrounded by a number of acolytes in rich vestments their only recreation was to cultivate a garden attached to the college in which all the fruits and vegetables of europe or the tropics might be found all clothing was made by the women who were not allowed to work in the fields but received each week eighteen ounces of cotton to spin the men wore white trousers and a shirt and cap besides a poncho on festivals the women a species of toga and petticoat fastened with a belt all went barefoot no one but the fathers wearing shoes and all were equal having the same food and clothing widows orphans and persons too old to work were supported by the rest the fruits of all labors being in common and laid up in storehouses to be given out as required maize and mandioca were the staple food with rations of beef three times a week at first their garanis were prone to drunkenness but this was cured by penances and no pains were spared to cultivate among them a taste for music dancing and feats of skill in horsemanship or the use of arms every morning about sunrise the church bell summoned the people to mass after which there was an hour for breakfast then the day's labours commenced the artisans and apprentices betaking themselves to their various trades in the workshops while the rest of the male population went out to field labours a band of music always led the way the rest following in procession carrying the statue of some saint which they deposited under a shade while they performed their work they rested during the heat of the day afterwards working for a couple of hours and then a procession was again formed marching back with sound of music as before to the mission the amount of labour was indeed light but we must remember not only the heat of the climate but also that the physical type of the guarani race was by no means robust or capable of sustained exertion feast days were very numerous averaging six or eight per month besides sundays and on such days of repose the afternoon was spent in all manner of innocent amusements sometimes a concert of select airs from the italian masters sometimes a variety of dances or athletic sports women never danced but boys were trained to represent charades and men performed war dances that were doubtless handed down from their ancestors sham fights and other martial exercises were also frequent including archery and musketry practice the consumption of powder was considerable but it was mostly for fireworks of which the indians were extremely fond and each mission usually made enough for its own consumption as the jesuits particularly cultivated a sentiment of loyalty to the spanish throne one of the grandest fetes in the year was the king's birthday on the day preceding it a procession was formed to convey the king's full-length portrait from the armory to the church a band of drums and violins leading the way and the indians rending the air with cries of viva el rey nuestro senor as they placed the picture in the portico of the church dances and running the ring on horseback ensued till sunset when the picture was carried back with the same solemnity to the armory 
for the night next morning at daybreak the bells rang out a merry peal and the festival began with the procession of the king's portrait in which all the inhabitants took part as well as in a grand te deum sung by a powerful choir under the direction of the fathers after the church festivities there was horse racing the horses carrying bells and the riders performing a variety of feats of agility in the afternoon long tables were spread and as soon as the dishes were blessed by the jesuits the inhabitants sat down to a banquet the whole concluded with illuminations and fireworks on such a festival as this the alcaldes and other municipal officers had scarfs and maces although they went barefoot like the rest st michael being the general patron of missionis his feast day was celebrated with great pomp but each mission had also its own saint's day and celebrated likewise the saint's day of the father who acted as governor on the occasion of a local fete of the latter kind it was customary to invite the jesuits and alcaldes of other missions near scouts were posted at certain distances to announce by a feu de joie the approach of the expected guests who were received with the utmost distinction and conducted to the college amid the joyful acclamations of the villagers and the inevitable discharge of rockets and mortars but the greatest festival in the year was corpus christi the principal feature being the procession of the blessed sacrament the plaza in front of the church was fitted up in a most tasteful manner for the occasion on each of the four sides was an avenue formed of green branches with an altar at each corner as the procession issued from the church the band appeared playing joyful music to which the church bells pealed in unison then came a long train of cross-bearers acolytes bearing tapers or swinging vessels full of incense and lastly the alcaldes supporting the baldachina or awning under which walked the priest carrying the most holy sacrament followed by a large crowd of men and women boys danced before the baldachina as it proceeded around the plaza while others threw on the ground roasted maize which looked like flowers at each of the four altars already mentioned the priest halted to bless the seeds vegetables and other products an eyewitness has left a vivid account of the impression produced on him at seeing trophies of grain clothing pottery etc set up in the plaza for benediction all manner of church ceremonies and public festivals had a particular charm for the indians nor lacked they store of innocent delight music and song and dance and proud array banners and pageantry and rich display the altar dress the church with garlands hung arches and floral bowers beside the way and festal tables spread for old and young end of section eighty two this recording is in the public domain section eighty three of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume eleven canada south america central america mexico and the west indies edited by eva march tappan section eighty three the escape of the american minister from paraguay eighteen sixty eight by charles a washburn though i repeatedly reminded caminos that we were ready to depart that our baggage having gone aboard we were very uncomfortable in the house and that i had no further business to detain me yet i received no notice that the paraguayan steamer was prepared to take me on board I now observed that the guards about my house were very much strengthened, and as the darkness shut down on the evening of the 8th, I saw that soldiers were posted around the house at a distance of about two rods from each other. The object of this I could not understand at the time, but regarded it as an indication that something of a very disagreeable nature would soon occur but a letter which i received from commander kirkland the next day september the eighth explained why this extra precaution had been taken the letter was dated near lambari a point less than two leagues from the capital and it appeared as though lopez was afraid that an attempt would be made to rescue us all by force however the wasp footnote the american vessel which had been sent under commander kirkland to bring home mr washburn end of footnote, did not come any higher up and remained only a few hours at that place when she returned and anchored opposite villetta she had only moved higher up 
in order to be out of the way of the shots from the Brazilian vessels that were bombarding the Paraguayan fortifications at Villeta. Supposing that the wasp was still at Lambari, my poor wife, who by this time was getting more alarmed than ever, urged that we should start on horseback and leave everything behind us. But she little knew the difficulties which we should have to encounter. I knew that if Lopez was determined to detain us, we should not escape in any such way, and that if he did allow us to leave, he would furnish us with such facilities that he could parade his magnanimity as a signal proof of his respect for the laws of nations and his consideration especially for the United States. One excuse after another was made for delaying permission for Mr. Washburn's departure. One was that it rained, and so it was not convenient to have his baggage carried to the vessel. After all possible excuses had been exhausted, he was at last notified that he might leave. At eleven o'clock we started from the house, and as we left, our poor Paraguayan servants seemed abandoned to despair. I would gladly have taken them all, and so I told Basilio, but he said it would be worse than useless for me to try to take him away, as he would not be allowed to go, and I had better not claim him as belonging to my legation. He begged me, if I ever returned to Paraguay, to inquire for him and of his fate. He feared that he would be sent to this Antonio Jara, and subjected to the most cruel treatment. I told him he would doubtless be taken as a soldier, but I hoped nothing worse than that would come upon him. He said that was nothing, he was willing to go a soldier, but that it was the flogging and the torture that he dreaded. What became of him I have never learned. That day, very early in the morning, the house had been surrounded by a large force of police and soldiers. Directly in front were standing all the time as many as twenty persons, two or three mounted, and at each corner there were eight or ten more. I again told Bliss and Masterman that they had my free permission to say anything about me that could save them from torture or prolong their lives. I said to them substantially these words, we have all seen how Carreras, Rodriguez, Burgis, Benigno, and the others who have been taken, have made declarations against us all that are entirely false, that have no foundation whatever. We know that the declarations which have been given in the letters of Benitez, as coming from them, were never made by them, or that, if they were made, they must have been previously subjected to the most terrible tortures that there is not a particle of truth in them we all know. You will be taken very likely, and tortured until you will corroborate what they have said. Now you have my permission to say anything against me. You will not hesitate to save yourselves by admitting everything true or false, which you may find Lopez is determined you shall admit. You may accuse me, if you can save your lives by it, of any crime you can imagine. You may charge me with sorcery, or stealing sheep, or anything else. Nobody will believe it in Paraguay, and certainly nobody will believe it outside of Paraguay. It can do me no harm, and if your declarations should ever be published, they will prove to the world what an infamous wretch Lopez is, for everybody will know that any declarations of that kind must have been extorted by torture, or the fear of torture. Bliss and Masterman were convinced that they would be arrested as soon as they stepped beyond the precinct of the legation. We conversed as to the order in which we should leave. At one time it was suggested that they should remain in the house, and claim that they were still in the legation if Lopez's soldiers should enter to take them. This, however, was thought to be not the most prudent course to take, but that they should accompany me as far as they were permitted to, and never leave me unless taken by force. The French and Italian consuls had come to accompany me from the house to the steamer, and Bliss and Masterman bade us all good-bye. They had indeed little hope that they would ever meet any of us again. Possibly, if I got away, something would come to their relief, ere they had been put out of the world. The two men were correct in their forebodings, for they had no sooner left the house 
that they were seized by the officers of Lopez. They were gone, taken from me by force, and within three feet of my own house. Could I yet save them? There was but one way. A quixotic attempt to rescue them, by my single arm, might involve me in their destruction, but could not help them. They had begged me to do nothing to still further enrage Lopez, until I was beyond his power. I therefore moved on towards the river in company with the consuls and with my family, that were anxiously waiting for me on the bank, went on board the steamer. The consuls then left us and returned to town. At this time they were in great anxiety in regard to themselves. The Frenchman was particularly anxious, as he told me before we left the house, that his counsellor had been already accused, and would be very likely arrested, and that as for himself it was very probable he would have fetters upon his ankles before night. We were now aboard the steamer, and I impatiently awaited the moment when she should cast off, but every moment seemed an hour. I still had great apprehensions that I should be detained, and I believed that Masterman's baggage would be the pretext of doing so. In the meanwhile a number of peons came from the arsenal to the boat, bringing on board some heavy boxes containing the money of the Englishman, which had been withdrawn some days before from my legation. With them came Mr. Hunter, an Englishman, and the head man of the arsenal. I had not seen him to speak with him since some weeks before, when I had met him in the street, and he had told me that he was afraid to speak to me. On this occasion he came on board, and the only sentence he said to me in English was to request me to talk to him in Spanish. I had hoped to learn from him something of the fate of his countrymen, who had been at my house, and had left it some two months before, but I saw the danger he was in, and that it would not do for him to say anything to me, which the spies of Lopez could not understand and report. Therefore I only talked with him in Spanish, and of the most commonplace matters, but could learn nothing of the condition of others for whose welfare I felt the keenest anxiety. But when this money had come on board it was clear that we should finally get off, and yet never was order so welcome to my ears as that which was given to the engineer of the boat about an hour after to get under way. It was about two o'clock when we started, and I was expecting to find the wasp lying near Lambari, and I watched as the boat rounded the point with straining eyes to catch a glimpse of the star-spangled banner. But we passed Lambari and went on and on, and no sight of the wasp, and then again I began to suspect that there was treachery, and that we were all to be taken to headquarters, to be subjected to I knew not what. In about two hours or a little more after leaving Asuncion, we came in sight of Villetta, and there lay the wasp in front, with her flag flaunting in the breeze. I now realized that our dangers were past, and yet it was not till we had come to anchor and I saw my wife and child into the gig of the wasp, and took my seat beside them, that I could believe that Lopez had consented to forego the pleasure of seeing me brought before his solemn tribunal. End of section 83. This recording is in the public domain. Section 84 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 84, A Visit to Artigas, about 1815 by W. H. Cobell. Fernando José Artigas became prominent in the Revolution of 1810. He was too independent to follow any leader and was soon outlawed. He then raised a force of gauchos, cattle drivers, and seized Paraguay. For five or six years he was dictator of the state, 
but in 1820, Francia overcame him and exiled him to Candelaria. The Editor J.P. Robertson, an English chronicler of the period, gives an interesting account of a meeting with Artigas. Assaulted and robbed by a band of the noted chief's adherents, he boldly set out for purification to claim redress. His words deserve quotation at some length. I came to the protector's headquarters, he says, of the so-called town of purification, and there, I pray you do not turn skeptic on my hands, what do you think I saw? Why, the most excellent protector of half the new world, seated on a bullock skull at a fire kindled on the mud floor of his hut, eating beef off a spit and drinking gin out of a cow horn. He was surrounded by a dozen officers in weather-beaten attire, in similar positions and similarly occupied with their chief. All were smoking, all gabbling. The protector was dictating to two secretaries, who occupied at one deal table the only two dilapidated rush-bottom chairs in the hovel. To complete this singular incongruity of the scene, the floor of the one apartment of the mud hut, to be sure it was a pretty large one, in which the general, his staff, and secretaries were assembled, was strewn with pompous envelopes from all the provinces, some of them distant some 1,500 miles from that center of operations, addressed to His Excellency the Protector. At the door stood the reeking horses of couriers arriving every half hour and the fresh ones of those departing as often. His Excellency the Protector, seated on his bullock skull, smoking, eating, drinking, talking, dispatched in succession the various matters brought under his notice with that calm or deliberate but uninterrupted nonchalance which brought most practically home to me the truth of the axiom, stop a little that we may get on the faster. He received me, not only with cordiality, but with what surprised me more, comparatively gentlemanlike manners and really good breeding. The protector's business was prolonged from morning till evening, and so were his meals, for as one courier arrived, another was dispatched, and as one officer rose up from the fire at which the meat was spitted, another took his place. The general politely took his visitor the round of his hide huts and mud hovels, where the horses stood saddled and bridled day and night, and where the tattered soldiery waited in readiness for the emergencies that arose so frequently. When Robertson submitted his financial claim, Artigas remained as amiable as before. You see, said the general with great candor and nonchalance, how we live here. And it is as much as we can do in these hard times to compass beef, aguardiente, and cigars. To pay you six thousand dollars just now is as much beyond my power as it would be to pay you sixty thousand or six hundred thousand. Look here he said, and so saying he lifted up the lid of an old military chest and pointed to a canvas bag at the bottom of it. There, he continued, is my whole stock of cash. It amounts to three hundred dollars, and where the next supply is to come from I am as little aware as you are. Notwithstanding this, Robertson then and there obtained some trading concessions that, he says, repaid him the amount of his claim many times over. Surely this picture reveals Artigas more truly than all the long-winded polemics that have raged about the famous Uruguayan. It is given by one whose sympathies were against the aims of the gaucho chief, and who has proved himself no lenient critic. Yet the description fits no mere cutthroat and plunderer. On the contrary, it reveals a virile personality, a thinker, and worker of a disposition that goes far to explain the adoration accorded him by his troops. Artigas, at the hands of the visitor who had sufficient cause for his ridicule, comes to light as a man, contemptuous of poverty, misery, and sordid surroundings so long as his goal remained as clear and distinct as it ever was to his sight. The picture is not without its pathetic side. It shows Artigas in the heyday of his power, yet even then hard put to it to supply his men with clothes and the common necessities of life. 
Imagine the calm force and philosophy of a being capable of governing more than a third of a million square miles of territory with the assistance of a treasury of $300. Nevertheless, these opera bouffe conditions represented the highest point of material prosperity to which Artigas ever attained. For five years he ruled thus, grappling desperately with the invading Brazilian armies and resisting the efforts of the Buenos Aires forces to regain control of the four Argentine provinces that had espoused his cause. End of section 84. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Dave Musgrove. Section 85 of Canada South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. The World's Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tapan. Section 85. Uruguay and the Uruguayans. 20th century by francis e clark as one sails down the great muddy estuary called the river plate he sees near the place where it debouches into the atlantic ocean a small rise of ground which almost anywhere else would escape observation here however with perfectly flat shores all about and prairies extending back for hundreds of miles the one solitary hill assumes an impressiveness out of all proportion to its size. The eye has been so long accustomed to monotonous levels that it hails Cerrito as an alpine wonder. Some old prince presented as a veritable Mont Blanc, dominating the little city that nestles at its base. It evidently appealed to the imagination of Ferdinand Magellan as he sailed by this coast on his great and momentous voyage around the world, for he cried out, I see a mountain, Montevideo. This was on the 15th of January, 1520, and since then everyone who has pronounced the name of the capital of Uruguay has said the same, I see a mountain, for that, of course, is what the name means. Around this famous hill history has been busy ever since, for Montevideo is Uruguay in a more emphatic way than Paris is France or Buenos Aires is the Argentine. In reading the story of Uruguayan history, one is in doubt whether it savors more of comedy or tragedy. The questions at issue seem so trivial, the results of the conflict so bloody, and the stage so small as compared with the world's larger conflicts. The tragic element prevails, however, for the causes of the innumerable wars were very real and very important to the people who took part in them, since men do not bleed and die for what they regard as of no consequence. Another wonderful thing that strikes the student of Uruguayan history is the rapid recuperation of the country after the most disastrous foreign and civil wars. One year we read of the country pillaged, the city of Montevideo bombarded and sacked, thousands of the able-bodied men killed in war and other thousands self-exiled because of the defeat of their party the next year we read of a great increase in population wealth and governmental revenues and of unlimited borrowing for internal improvements the fact is that uruguay in spite of her limited territories and population is so rich in available resources chiefly cattle and sheep and has such a commanding and strategic situation on the atlantic coast that she cannot be kept down either by her own foolish fights or by foreign foes she is said to have averaged a revolution every two years for three quarters of a century and yet though each revolution sets her back a twelve months or so in the remaining peaceful twelve months she regains the population and wealth she lost and distinctly forges ahead for a long time her history was wrapped up with that of her powerful neighbors, Brazil on the north and Argentina on the south. She was embroiled in all their wars as well as her own, and was alternately ruled by one or the other. General Don José Gervasio Artigas is considered the founder of the Uruguayan nation, though he was never chosen to office by the people, and was disastrously defeated and driven into exile by the Brazilians an exile in which he spent the last thirty years of his life he was little more than a guerrilla chief 
who for twenty five years kept the soil of Uruguay and of the Argentine Mesopotamia soaked in blood. But he awakened national aspirations in the hearts of the people, and for this reason he has been canonized as a national hero and his body buried in state in Montevideo. It was my fortune to be in Montevideo on the 19th of April, an anniversary day familiar to a Massachusetts man, when I found the banks and shops closed and the city wearing a general holiday air. It could not be, I thought, that 6,000 miles away they were celebrating the Concord fight and the Battle of Lexington, and I was soon informed that it was the anniversary of the Landing of the Thirty-Three, a day as religiously observed in Uruguay as the anniversary of the landing of the pilgrims in New England. And who were the famous thirty-three? Merely a band of adventurers who, on the 19th of April, 1825, landed on the shores of a river in the southwestern corner of the country. Uruguay was then under the domination of Brazil, and the people in town and country were restive under her sway. The famous thirty-three soon rallied to their standard practically all the people. Even the soldiers who were in the pay of the Brazilian government refused to fight their compatriots. Their officers deserted to the enemy, and soon, in spite of desperate efforts on the part of Brazil, Uruguay was free and independent. Argentina favored her cause. The intrepid Irish admiral, William Brown, battered the Brazilian fleet at sea, and in 1828, Brazil, as well as Argentina, gave up its claims to Uruguay and guaranteed her independence for five years. But the distracted little country was not to enjoy a prolonged peace, for in 1832 a civil war broke out, which, with certain periodic breathing spells, may be considered to have lasted ever since. At least the revolutions have been so numerous that they cannot be individually recorded in a short chapter of history, and few of these revolutions have been altogether bloodless. During the later years of the 19th century, however, they lost much of their ferocious character, and were little more than political overturnings, when the outs struggled to get in, and the ins fought to stay in. The Blancos, the aristocratic conservative party, was always opposed by the Colorados, the Democratic Liberal Party recruited largely from the common people and the cowboys of the plains, and in the end the Blancos were defeated and liberal ideas prevailed. In spite of these disturbances, political, martial, and commercial, the country grew in wealth and population, and improved every breathing spell from war to take an advanced step in prosperity. By 1890 the immigration to Uruguay had run up to 20,000 a year, and the population had increased to 700,000, a gain of more than 100% in 12 years. In 1897, President Borda was assassinated in the streets of Montevideo, while marching at the head of a religious procession. A grocer's clerk was seen to walk deliberately up to him, press a pistol against his white shirt front, and fire point blank. Of course the president fell, and he was buried without a post-mortem examination. When the grocer's clerk, who was arrested red-handed, came to be tried for his life, his lawyer pleaded that, according to Uruguayan law, a post-mortem examination was necessary to prove whether the president died from fright, heart disease, or a pistol shot, so his client could not be convicted. The jury, strange to say, took the lawyer's view of the case, and condemned the assassin to two years' imprisonment for insulting the president, an insult with a vengeance indeed. A Philadelphia lawyer could not have made a more ingenious plea, or one of our own Tammany juries executed a worse travesty on justice. Montevideo strikes the tourist, fresh from the stare and the bustle of mighty Buenos Aires, as rather a sleepy old town, and as somewhat commonplace if he comes from the north with the glories of beautiful Rio in his eyes. But its inhabitants are never tired of praising it for its situation, its climate, and its sedate business ways, which, I have been assured more than once, are far superior to the greed for the almighty dollar evinced in Buenos Aires and Rio, and preeminently in the United States. The city has a substantial old-world appearance, and when the new electric streetcars supplant all the old mule cars, as they very likely will before this book is printed, one great want of easy communication will be supplied. 
There are some fine residences in the outskirts of the city, with beautiful gardens, in which every sub tropical plant will grow, and the sea, which surrounds the city on every side but one, brings salubrious breezes and bathing privileges to all. A boon which the Buenos Aires appreciate, for they flock hither in large numbers every summer for their health. Large steamers, compared by one over partial writer to the Fall River boats between Boston and New York, join the two cities with a nightly service, and the connection between these two great cities of the South, both socially and commercially, is very close. The great wealth of Uruguay outside of Montevideo, as a business and distributing centre, is found in her flocks and herds which dot her fertile plains. Here is a country which, though it is the smallest in South America, is yet as large as England, and is practically one vast pasture. Every part of it is easily accessible. There are no lofty mountains and few impassable jungles, but it is a country of rich, luscious grasses, where fat cattle and sheep thrive by the million. One company alone, the famous Liebig Extract Company, which manufactures beef tea for the world, owns one million and two hundred thousand acres in Uruguay, Argentina and Paraguay, but largely in the former country. On its enormous ranches are 200,000 horned cattle and 60,000 sheep, and over 6 million head of cattle have passed through its hands in the 50 years of its existence. 2,500 workmen are employed in this business, and $17,500,000 have been distributed in dividends. These enormous figures show on what a large scale business is sometimes conducted even in a little republic. The future of Uruguay will doubtless be less stormy than the past, it could hardly be more so. Those who are best informed assure me that there are signs of political stability that have never been seen before, and though there may be periodic revolutions in the years to come, they are not likely to be accompanied by bloody civil wars, or greatly to upset the course of business and social life. End of section 85 this recording is in the public domain. Section 86 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Read for LibriVox.org by Corey Kendrick. South America, Part 6. The Argentine Republic. Historical Note. In 1776, Bolivia, Paraguay, and Uruguay were united in the Viceroyalty of Buenos Aires and were ruled by Spain. But in 1810, the Viceroyalty revolted against Spain and won its independence, although this was not acknowledged by the mother country until 1842. Uruguay became a bone of contention between Brazil and the United Provinces of Rio de la Plata, as the land was now called. This struggle resulted in the independence of Uruguay. In 1831, Buenos Aires, Entre Rios, Corrientes, and Santa Fe united. Buenos Aires was the most powerful of these provinces, and General Rosas, its captain-general or governor, became a dictator of the Union, the Argentine Confederation. After his downfall in 1852, Buenos Aires struggled unsuccessfully for independence of the other states. Argentina has had to meet disputes about boundaries, wars, uprisings, and military insurrections. During the last few years, however, its progress has been marvelous, and its population has increased amazingly. Its resources are so great that it may fairly be counted as one of the wealthy countries of the world. For many years, Patagonia was a veritable no-man's land, for no country seemed to have any special desire to claim it. In 1881, however, it was divided between Argentina and Chile. It has shown itself to be a valuable acquisition, as it affords most excellent pasturage for sheep. It is described as a region of wonderful beauty. The temperature is not extreme, there is a generous supply of moisture, and it is quite possible that this country, which for so long a while played the part of the ugly duckling, may prove to be a land of great richness and fertility. End of section 86. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corey Kent. Section 87 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. 
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume eleven canada south america central america mexico and the west indies edited by eva march tappan section eighty seven argentine independence eighteen ten to nineteen ten by hiram bingham on the twentieth of, of may nineteen ten the argentine nation in general and buenos aires in particular observed with appropriate ceremonies the one hundredth anniversary of their independence great preparations were made to ensure a celebration that should suitably represent the importance of the event in eighteen ten buenos aires had been a spanish colony for two hundred and fifty years following her foundation in the sixteenth century but the spanish crown had never valued highly the great rolling prairies drained by the rio de la plata there were no mines of gold or silver here and spain did not send her colonists into far-away america to raise corn and wine that should compete with spanish farmers at home buenos aires was regarded as the end of the world all persons and all legitimate commerce bound thither from spain were obliged to go by way of panama and peru over the andes across the south american continent before they could legally enter the port of buenos aires the natural result of this was the building up of a prosperous colony of portuguese smugglers in southern brazil another result was that no spaniards cared to live so far away from home if they could possibly help it and society in buenos aires was not nearly so brilliant as in the fashionable spanish-american capitals of lima santiago or bogota during the closing years of the eighteenth century the spaniards became convinced of their short-sighted policy and made buenos aires an open port the english were not slow to realize that this was one of the best commercial situations in south america and that far from being the end of the world as the spaniards thought it was a natural centre through which the wealth of a large part of south america was bound to pass the great mr pitt who was most interested in developing british commerce with south america felt that it would probably be necessary to introduce british manufactures in the wake of a military expedition and decided to seize buenos aires which was so poorly defended that it could easily be captured by a small resolute force accordingly in june eighteen o six an attack was made the viceroy notwithstanding repeated warnings had made no preparations to defend the city and it was captured without difficulty there was great rejoicing in london at the report of the victory but it was soon turned to dismay by the news of a disgraceful and unconditional surrender the sudden overthrow of the english was due largely to the ability of a local hero named Lanier's, who played successfully on the wounded pride of the porteños the significance of the episode is that it gave to the porteños the idea that the power of spain could be easily overthrown and that they actually had the courage and strength to win and hold their own independence hardly had the city recovered from the effects of its bombardment by the english before events destined to produce a profound change throughout south america commenced to attract attention in spain napoleon inaugurated his peninsula campaigns and the world beheld the spectacle of a spanish king become the puppet of a french emperor in july eighteen o nine a new viceroy appointed by the spanish cortes then engaged in fighting against napoleon took possession of the reins of government in buenos aires in the early months of eighteen ten napoleon's armies were so successful throughout the spanish peninsula that it seemed as if the complete subjection of spain was about to be accomplished on may eighteen the unhappy viceroy allowed this news from spain to become known in the city at once a furor of popular discussion arose led by belgrano and other liberal young creoles the people decided to defy napoleon and his puppet king of spain as they had defied the soldiers of england on the twenty fifth of may the viceroy frightened out of his wits surrendered his authority and a great popular assembly that crowded the plaza to its utmost capacity appointed a committee to rule in his stead 
so the twenty fifth of may eighteen ten became the actual birthday of argentina's independence although the acts of the popular government were for six years done in the name of ferdinand the deposed king of spain and the act of independence was not passed by the argentine congress until eighteen sixteen no sooner had buenos aires thrown off the yoke of spain than she began an active armed propaganda much as the first french republic did before her other cities of argentina were forcibly convinced of the advantages of independence and the armies of buenos aires pressed northward into what is now southern bolivia it was their intention to drive the spanish armies entirely out of the continent and what seemed more natural than that they should follow the old trade route which they had used for centuries and go from buenos aires to lima by way of the highlands of bolivia and peru but they reckoned without counting the cost in the first place the indians of those lofty arid regions do not take great interest in politics it matters little to them who their masters are furthermore their country is not one that is suited to military campaigns hundreds of square miles of arid desert plateaued ten or twelve thousand feet above the sea a region suited only to support a small population and that by dint of a most careful system of irrigation separated by frightful mountain trails from any adequate basis of supplies were obstacles that proved too great for them to overcome their little armies were easily driven back on the other hand when the royalist armies attempted to descend from the plateau and attack the patriots they were equally unsuccessful the truth is that southern bolivia and northern argentina are regions where it is far easier to stay at home and defend one's self than to make successful attacks on one's neighbours an army cannot live off the country as it goes along and the difficulties of supplying it with provisions and supplies are almost insurmountable the first man to appreciate this was jose san martin it is not too much to say that san martin is the greatest name that south america has produced bolivar is better known among us and he is sometimes spoken of as the washington of south america but his character does not stand investigation and no one can claim that his motives were as unselfish or his aims as lofty as those of the great general to whose integrity and ability the foremost republics of spanish south america argentina chile and peru owe their independence san martin was born of spanish parents not far from the present boundary between argentina and paraguay his father was a trusted spanish official his mother was a woman of remarkable courage and foresight his parents sent him to spain at an early age to be educated military instinct soon drew him into the army and he served in various capacities both in africa and later against the french in the peninsula he was able to learn thoroughly the lessons of war and the value of well-trained soldiers he received the news of the popular uprising in argentina while still in spain and soon became interested in the struggles of his fellow countrymen to establish their independence in eighteen twelve he returned to buenos aires where his unselfish zeal and intelligence promptly marked him out as an unusual leader the troops under him became the best drilled body of patriots in south america after witnessing the futile attempts of the patriots to drive the spanish armies out of the mountains of peru by way of the highlands of bolivia he conceived the brilliant idea of cutting off their communication with spain by commanding the sea power of the west coast he established his headquarters at mendoza in western argentina a point from which it would be easy to strike at chile through various passes across the andes here he stayed for two years governing the province admirably building up an efficient army organizing the refugees that fled from chile to mendoza making friends with the indians and keeping out of the factional quarrels that threatened to destroy all proper government in buenos aires in january eighteen seventeen his army was ready he led the spaniards to think that he might cross the andes almost anywhere and succeeded in scattering their forces so as to enable him to bring the main body of his army over the most practical route the Uspalata pass the expedition was successful and in eighteen eighteen san martin had the satisfaction of administering such a decisive defeat to the spaniards at maipo as to ensure chilean independence with the aid of a remarkable soldier of fortune thomas cochran earl of dun donald and an interesting group of anglo-saxon seamen san martin drove the spaniards from the west coast and captured the city of lima the aid which was given him by buenos aires and chile was not sufficient to enable him to penetrate the great andes of the interior and totally destroy the last spanish army 
he sought bolivar's aid but that proud liberator would only come as commander-in-chief so rather than sacrifice the cause of independence san martin with unexampled self-effacement gave up his well-trained veterans to bolivar and sucre and quietly withdrew to his modest home in argentina his unwillingness to enter into political squabbles his large-minded statesmanship and his dignified bearing did not endear him to his fellow-countrymen and he was forced to pass the declining years of his life in europe in exile from his native land the history of the period is full of petty personal rivalries and absurd political squabbles against these as a background the magnificent figure of san martin efficient soldier wise statesman and unselfish patriot stands out plainly distinct his achievements are worthy to be remembered with those of the greatest heroes of history his character the finest south american has ever produced has few equals in the annals of any country for many years he was disliked by his fellow patriots because he openly expressed the belief that they were not fit for pure democratic government since his day many south americans agree with him End of section eighty seven this recording is in the public domain Section 88 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. The World's Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 88 the people of the argentine pampas about eighteen seventy by dr domingo faustino sarmiento first comes the rastreador or tracker then the baqueano or guide the payador or bard and the gaucho malo or outlaw the rastreador possesses the highest development of gaucho instinct he can tell in a confused track of animals feet how many of them are laden or have riders he can even detect the footsteps of a person or animal that he knows and follow it in the most miraculous manner for hundreds of miles nature seems to give him a special instinct in these vast plains for the recovery of a lost animal or the pursuit of a fugitive whenever a robbery occurs the person robbed instead of applying to the authorities sends for the nearest rastreador covering up meanwhile very carefully whatever footmark the intruders may have left the rastreador examines it closely mounts his horse and rides away now and then casting his eyes to the ground and following the trail like a bloodhound until after weeks and months he brings the criminal to justice the latter seldom asserts his innocence as the judge usually regards the rastreador as infallible the stories told of calibar who was well known in san juan for forty years are surprising it happened once that while he was gone to buenos aires on business his best saddle was stolen his wife having covered the footmark as usual showed it to him on his return after two months a year and a half later he was seen one afternoon with his head bent down walking along a street in the suburbs of san juan till he entered a certain house and found there his lost saddle soiled and torn in eighteen thirty a criminal under sentence of death having escaped from prison calibar was sent in pursuit the fugitive had taken every precaution to leave no track and walked for some distance up the course of a shallow stream but calibar was not to be baffled and followed the stream till he came to a place where he saw drops of water on the grass he got out there he said following the criminal through fields and plantations and over walls he finally led the soldiers into a small vineyard where having examined all the approaches to the house he said they would find him inside the soldiers searched the premises and coming out maintained that the man had escaped calibar however insisted that he was inside and so it proved the unhappy man was shot next morning the baqueano or guide is hardly inferior to the rastreador in importance he knows every inch of country for five hundred miles around his abode and is the only map by which south american generals conduct their campaigns he is always at the side of the commander and the fate of the army depends on him rarely if ever does he betray the confidence reposed in him he knows every pool of water fresh or salt and many a secret ford across a river or passage through a swamp by which he can shorten the route 
in the darkest night whether in the midst of a forest or on a boundless plain in which his companions may think themselves lost he dismounts for a moment plucks a few leaves or a handful of grass and chews them by the taste he can tell pretty nearly where he is and especially whether he is near salt or fresh water he then mounts again tells his companions that they are so many leagues from this or that place and starts off at an easy gallop in a given direction without even a star to guide him in the pampas it often happens that a traveller may meet one of those baqueanos and ask him to guide him to a certain place two or three hundred miles off the baqueano will glance along the horizon reflect for a moment and fixing his eye on a given point start off like an arrow riding day and night until he reaches his destination he knows of the approach of an army forty or fifty miles off and the direction it is taking by the course which the deer guanacos and ostriches follow when the enemy gets nearer he can tell by the volume of dust whether their force numbers hundreds or thousands his commander relying upon his estimate as infallible if the condors and other birds of prey are wheeling in circles overhead he can tell from their manner whether it is an enemy in ambush an encampment recently abandoned or merely a dead animal the payador is a kind of wandering minstrel who sings of the wars and adventures of the day like the troubadours of the middle ages he goes about from rancho to pulperia from his guitar singing of the outlaws of the pampas or the raids of the indians he is a living chronicle of customs history and exploits and his verses would form perhaps many a valuable link for the future historian of these countries he has no home his dwelling is wherever the night may find him his fame and fortune are his verses and his guitar in every rural dance in every festive gathering his is the place of honour so much is music a passion of the gauchos that at every pulperia or wayside inn a guitar is always hung over the counter for the use of the first group of wayfarers the payador sometimes mixes his own exploits with those of his heroes for he is not uncommonly a fugitive from justice either for killing a friend stealing a horse or for some daring adventure the character of his songs is generally monotonous unless under some sudden inspiration the gaucho malo or outlaw has his home in the desert and despises the people of the towns glorifying in the epithet which is given to him he has probably been a fugitive for years and his name is so much dreaded that it is only whispered with a certain amount of respect he lives in a clump of thistles or wild hemlock his food consists of game unless when he lassoes a cow which he kills for the tongue leaving the carcass for the birds of prey he will suddenly present himself in a village from which the police have just gone in pursuit of him talk with the neighbors as they form an admiring circle around him get some tobacco and yerba remount his horse and if he sees the police in sight quietly trot away towards the desert without any symptoms of fear or even looking back the police will not pursue him for they know that their horses are no match for his pangare as famous as himself if he happens to be surprised by the police and surrounded he rushes at them knife in hand and leaving two or three of them on the ground dead or wounded leaps on the nearest horse and escapes while the bullets vainly whistle after him the payador of the district adds this fresh exploit to his list of songs sometimes he will appear at a village dance take part in the festivity and retire as suddenly and unmolested as he came but he is not a common robber or assassin and would not think of stopping a traveller if he steals it is only horses he knows every horse in the province and can tell in a moment where any lost one may be found he is often employed to recover such animals and will deliver them up for a stipulated sum at a given time and place with the utmost punctuality these honest traders frequently buy stolen hides from this class of outlaws i remember an amusing occurrence in azul a town about two hundred miles south of buenos aires where the principal shopkeeper who was also justice of the peace for the district made a bargain with a gaucho named el cuervo or the crow to take hides from him without asking questions it was arranged that every evening after dusk el cuervo was to throw the hides over the wall of the shopkeeper's yard 
I may mention that the shopkeeper had one of the largest estancias in the neighbourhood, and people did not speak well of the way in which he had acquired his wealth. For several nights El Cuervo threw over the wall half a dozen or more hides, and was paid next morning a few dollars for each. It was not long before one of the shopkeeper's peons, or labourers, in stacking out the hides, observed his master's mark. As soon as the hides began to dry in the sun, the mark became plainly visible. The shopkeeper was furious, and said to El Cuervo, "'You scoundrel, you have killed and skinned some of my cattle!' To which the gaucho replied, "'Master, whose cattle did you want me to kill unless your own?' The shopkeeper, being justice of the peace, did not dare to punish El Cuervo, and wisely said no more about it, seeing that the gaucho had outwitted him. End of section 88. This recording is in the public domain. Section 89 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 89. A Real Patagonian, about 1880, by Lady Florence Dixie we had not gone far when we saw a rider coming slowly toward us and in a few minutes we found ourselves in the presence of a real patagonian indian we reined in our horses when he got close to us to have a good look at him and he doing the same for a few minutes we stared at him to our heart's content receiving in return as minute and careful a scrutiny from him whatever he may have thought of us we thought him a singularly unprepossessing object and for the sake of his race we hoped an unfavourable specimen of it his dirty brown face of which the principal feature was a pair of sharp black eyes was half hidden by tangled masses of unkempt hair held together by a handkerchief tied over his forehead and his burly body was enveloped in a greasy guanaco capa considerably the worse for wear his feet were bare but one of his heels was armed with a little wooden spur of curious and ingenious handiwork having completed his survey of our persons and exchanged a few guttural grunts with gregorio of which the purport was that he had lost some horses and was on their search he galloped away and glad to find some virtue in him we were able to admire the easy grace with which he sat his well-bred looking little horse which though considerably below his weight was doubtless able to do its master good service continuing our way we presently observed several mounted indians sitting motionless on their horses like sentries on the summit of a tall ridge ahead of us evidently watching our movements at our approach they disappeared over the ridge on the other side of which lay their camping-ground cantering forward we soon came in sight of the entire indian camp which was pitched in a broad valley plain flanked on either side by steep bluffs and with a little stream flowing down its centre there were about a dozen big hide tents in front of which stood crowds of men and women watching our approach with lazy curiosity numbers of little children were disporting themselves in the stream which we had to ford in order to get to the tents two indians more inquisitive than their brethren came out to meet us both mounted on the same horse and saluted us with much grinning and jabbering on our arrival in the camp we were soon encircled by a curious crowd some of whose number gazed at us with stolid gravity whilst others laughed and gesticulated as they discussed our appearance in their harsh guttural language with a vivacious manner which was quite at variance with the received traditions of the solemn bent of the indian mind our accoutrements and clothes seemed to excite great interest my riding-boots in particular being objects of attentive examination and apparently of much serious speculation at first they were content to observe them from a distance but presently a little boy was delegated by the elders to advance and give them a closer inspection this he proceeded to do coming toward me with great caution and when near enough he stretched out his hand and touched the boots gently with the tips of his fingers this exploit was greeted with roars of laughter and ejaculations and emboldened by his success many now ventured to follow his example some enterprising spirits extending their researches to the texture of my ulster 
and one even going so far as to take my hand in his while subjecting a little bracelet i wore to a profound and exhaustive scrutiny whilst they were thus occupied i had leisure to observe their general appearance i was not struck so much by their height as by their extraordinary development of chest and muscle as regards their stature i do not think the average height of the men exceeded six feet and as my husband stands six feet two inches i had a favourable opportunity for forming an accurate estimate one or two there were certainly who towered far above him but these were exceptions the women were mostly of the ordinary height though i noticed one who must have been quite six feet if not more the features of the pure-bred tahuelche are extremely regular and by no means unpleasant to look at the nose is generally aquiline the mouth well shaped and beautified by the whitest of teeth the expression of the eye is intelligent and the form of the whole head affords a favourable index to their mental capabilities these remarks do not apply to the tahuelches in whose veins there is a mixture of araucanian or fuegian blood the flat noses oblique eyes and badly proportioned figures of the latter make them most repulsive objects and they are as different from a pure-bred tehuelche in every respect as wheel of fortune from an ordinary cart-horse their hair is long and coarse and is worn parted in the middle being prevented from falling over their faces by means of a handkerchief or fillet of some kind tied round the forehead they have naturally little hair on the face and such growth as may appear is carefully eradicated a painful operation which many extend even to their eyebrows their dress is simple and consists of a chiripa a piece of cloth round the loins and the indispensable guanaco capa which is hung loosely over the shoulders and held round the body by the hand though it would obviously seem more convenient to have it secured round the waist with a belt of some kind their horse-hide boots are only worn for reasons of economy when hunting the women dress like the men except as regards the chiripa instead of which they wear a loose kind of gown beneath the kapa which they fasten at the neck with a silver brooch or pin the children are allowed to run about naked till they are five or six years old and are then dressed like their elders partly for ornament partly also as a means of protection against the wind a great many indians paint their faces their favourite colour as far as i could see being red though one or two i observe had given the preference to a mixture of that colour with black a very diabolical appearance being the result of this combination the tehovchas are a race that is fast approaching extinction and even at present it scarcely numbers eight hundred souls they lead a rambling nomadic existence shifting their camping places from one region to another whenever the game in their vicinity gets shy or scarce it is fortunate for them that the immense numbers of guanaco and ostriches makes it an easy matter for them to find subsistence as they are extremely lazy and plentiful as game is around them often pass two or three days without food rather than incur the very slight exertion attendant on a day's hunting but it is only the men who are cursed or blessed with this indolent spirit the women are indefatigably industrious all the work of a existence is done by them except hunting when not employed in ordinary household work they busy themselves in making guanaco coppas weaving gay-coloured garters and fillets for the hair working silver ornaments and so forth not one of their least arduous tasks is that of collecting firewood which always a scarce article becomes doubly hard to find except by going great distances when they camp long in one place but though treated thus unfairly as regards the division of labour the women can by no means complain of want of devotion to them on the part of the men marriages are matters of great solemnity with them and the tie is strictly kept husband and wife show great affection for each other and both agree in extravagant love of their offspring which they pet and spoil to their heart's content the most prominent characteristic of the tehuelche is as easy-going good-humour for whereas most aboriginal races incline to silence and saturnine gravity he is all smiles and chatter the other good qualities of the race are fast disappearing under the influence of aguardiente footnote an intoxicating liquor end of footnote to the use of which they are getting more and more addicted and soon it is to be feared they will become nothing more than a pack of impoverished dirty thieving ragamuffins after having sat for some time on horseback in the centre of the numerous circle above referred to we dismounted the act causing fresh animation and merriment in our interviewers whose interest in us after a thorough examination had begun to flag somewhat an object which greatly excited their feelings was a rifle belonging to my brother 
and their delight knew no bounds when he dismounted and fired it off for their edification once or twice at a distant mark at each discharge they set up a lusty howl of satisfaction and nothing would do for them but for each to be allowed to handle the weapon and inspect its mechanism there was a trader in the camp who had arrived about the same time as we did and amongst other wares he had brought a rusty carbine with him for sale he was called upon by the indians to produce it and fire it off to compare its qualities with those of my brother's rifle this he proceeded to do but seven times in succession the cartridges missed fire each time this happened he was greeted with shouts of derisive laughter and it was evident that both he and his weapon were the objects of most disparaging remarks on the part of the tehouches one of them a man of some humour brought out a small piece of ostrich meat and offered it to the trader in exchange for his carbine saying in broken spanish your gun never kill piece of meat as big as this your gun good to kill dead guanaco at which witticism there was renewed and prolonged applause as the newspapers say End of section eighty nine this recording is in the public domain section ninety of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume eleven canada south america central america mexico and the west indies edited by eva march tappan section ninety in buenos aires twentieth century by hiram bingham a generation ago the traveller to buenos aires was obliged to disembark in the stream seven or eight miles from the city proceed in small boats over the shallow waters and then clamber into huge ox-carts and enjoy the last mile or two of his journey as best he could since then extraordinary harbour improvements costing millions of dollars have been completed and ocean steamers are now able to approach the city through dredged channels yet such has been the phenomenal growth of the port that the magnificent modern docks are already overcrowded and the handling of cargo goes on very slowly retarded by many exasperating delays the regular passenger and mail steamers are given prompt attention however and the customs house examination is both speedy and courteous in marked contrast to that at rio in years to come the two other important ports of argentina rosario higher up the rio de la plata and bahia blanca farther down the atlantic coast are destined to grow at a rapid rate because of the better docking facilities they will be able to afford bahia blanca in particular is destined to have a great future as it is the natural outlet for the rapidly developing agricultural and pastoral region of southern argentina buenos aires however will always maintain her political and commercial supremacy she is not only the capital of argentina but out of every five argentinos she claims at least one as a denizen of her narrow streets already ranking as the second latin city in the world her population equals that of madrid and barcelona combined hardly has one left the docks on the way to the hotel before one is impressed with the commercial power of this great city your taxicab passes slowly through crowded streets where the heavy traffic retards your progress and gives you a chance to marvel at the great number of foreign banks english german french and italian that have taken possession of this quarter of the city with their fine substantial buildings and their general appearance of solidity they have a firm grip on the situation one looks in vain for an american bank or agency of any well-known wall street house american financial institutions are like the american merchant steamers conspicuous by their absence the anglo-saxons that you see briskly walking along the sidewalks are not americans but clean-shaven red-cheeked vigorous britishers in some ways this is an english colony the majority of the people do not speak english except in the commercial district and the englishman is here on sufferance but it is his railroads that tie this country together it is his enterprises that have opened thousands of its square miles and although the folly of his ancestors a century ago caused him to lose the political control of this purple land the energy of his more recent forebears has given him a splendid heritage not only has he been able to pay large dividends to the british stockholders who had such great faith in the future of argentina he has made many native argentinos wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice 
landowners whose parents had not a single change of clothes are themselves considering how many motor-cars to order their patronage sustains the finely appointed shops which make such a brave display on florida and congalo streets these streets may be so narrow that vehicles are only allowed to pass in one direction but the shops are first class in every particular and include the greatest variety of goods from the latest creations of parisian millinery to the most modern scientific instruments fine bookshops large department stores gorgeous restaurants expensive to the last degree emphasize the wealth and extravagance of the upper classes it is hardly necessary to speak of the more usual evidences of great wealth palatial residences that would attract attention even in paris and new york charming parks beautifully laid out on the shores of the great rio de la plata and a thousand luxurious automobiles of the latest pattern carrying all they can hold of parisian millinery one does not need to be told that this is a city of electric cars telephones and taxis these we take for granted but there is a characteristic feature of the city that is unexpected and striking the central depots for imported thoroughbreds only a few doors from the great banks and railway offices are huge stables where magnificent blooded horses and cattle sheep and pigs which have brought records of distinguished ancestry across the atlantic are offered for sale and command high prices these permanent cattle shows are the natural rendezvous of the wealthy ranchmen and breeders who are sure to be found here during a part of each day while they are in town so are foreigners desirous of purchasing ranches and reporters getting news from the interior the cattle fairs offer ocular evidence of the wealth of the modern argentina and the importance of the pastoral industry there are over a hundred million sheep on the pampas cattle and horses also are counted by the millions the problems of argentine agriculture and animal industries are being continually studied by the great landowners who have already done much to improve the quality of their products argentina has worked hard to develop those industries that are dependent upon stock raising the results have amply justified her the exportation of frozen meat from argentina amounts to nearly twenty million dollars annually only recently one of the best-known packing houses of chicago opened a large plant here and is paying tribute to the excellence of the native stock every year argentina sends to europe the carcasses of millions of sheep and cattle as well as millions of bushels of wheat and corn more in fact than we do of all the south american republics she is our greatest natural competitor and she knows it nevertheless she lacks adequate resources of iron coal lumber and water power and notwithstanding a high protective tariff can never hope to become a competitor in manufactured products argentina exports more than three times as much per capita as we do and must do so in order to pay for the necessary importation of manufactured goods it also means that she will always find it to her advantage to buy her goods from england france and germany where she sells her foodstuffs brazil can send us unlimited amounts of raw materials that we cannot raise at home while at present argentina has little to offer us yet we are already buying her wool and hides and before long will undoubtedly be eating her beef and mutton footnote this came to pass in nineteen fourteen end of footnote as england has been doing for years the number of north americans in buenos aires is very small while we have been slowly waking up to the fact that south america is something more than a land of revolutions and fevers our german cousins have entered the field on all sides the germans in southern brazil are a negligible factor in international affairs but the well-educated young german who is being sent out to capture south america commercially is a power to be reckoned with he is going to damage england more truly than dreadnoughts or gigantic airships he is worth our study as well as england's willing to acquit himself with and adapt himself to local prejudices he has already made great strides in securing south american commerce for his fatherland he has become a more useful member of the community than the englishman he has taken pains to learn the language thoroughly and speaks it not only grammatically but idiomatically as well something which the anglo-saxon almost never does he has entered into the social life of the country with a much more gracious spirit than his competitors and rarely segregates himself from the community in pursuing his pleasures as the english do his natural prejudices against the spanish way of doing things are not so strong 
his steamers are just as luxurious and comfortable as the new english boats it is said that even if the element of danger that always exists at sea is less on the british lines the german boats treat their passengers with more consideration giving them better food and better service no wonder the spanish-american likes the german better than he does the english or american already the english residents in buenos aires who have regarded the river platte as their peculiar province for many years are gall beyond measure to see what strides the germans have made in capturing the market for their manufactured products and in threatening their commercial supremacy and neither english nor germans are going to hold out a helping hand or welcome an american commercial invasion meanwhile the argentinos realize that their country cannot get along without foreign capital much as they hate to see the foreigner made rich from the products of their rolling prairies they realize also that they greatly need more immigrants the population is barely five per square mile and as a matter of fact is practically less than that for so large a part of the entire population is crowded into the city and province of buenos aires consequently they are doing all they can to encourage able-bodied immigrants to come from italy and spain and the immigrants are coming my ship brought a thousand other ships brought more than three hundred thousand in nineteen o eight argentina is not standing still nor is she waiting for american enterprise during nineteen o eight considerably more than two thousand vessels entered the ports of the republic four flew the american flag End of section ninety this recording is in the public domain Section 91 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Central America. Historical Note. At the time of the coming of the Spaniards, Central America was inhabited by a race known as the Mayas. That this race was well along on the road to civilization is attested by the ruined cities that are scattered through the tropical jungles of Central America and Yucatan. In 1502, the coast of Central America was sighted by Columbus. A few years later, the country was subjugated by Spain, and until 1821, it was called Guatemala. In that year, Guatemala proclaimed its independence, but during the following year, what are now the five states, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, San Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, were united in the Mexican empire of Itorbide. One year later, they had freed themselves and had become the Republic of the United States of Central America. In 1839, this union was dissolved, and a second one, formed soon afterwards, was also dissolved. Indeed, the history of these states for many years has consisted of attempts to form an enduring union. End of section 91. This recording is in the public domain. Section 92 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 92. A Sacrifice to Tohir by William T. Brigham Tohio was a god of the Quiches, a powerful Indian tribe of western Guatemala at the time of the Spanish conquest. The Editor On the platform where Frank and I had stumbled over the confused piles of rubbish and tried in vain to trace the buildings, so distinct only forty years before, the mighty Gukumats had built high the altar of the bloodthirsty Tohio. A steep pyramid in the center of the rebuilt Gumarca, now called Utatlan. Our knowledge of the ceremonial of that Quiche worship is but slight, but enough is known to give an air of reality to the pile of rubbish that alone marks the site of the holy place of this ancient kingdom. I sat near the base of the altar, and the city walls arose about me. The ruin of three centuries departed and again all was new and full of busy life. Around me, but at a suitable distance from the altar temple, were the palaces of the princes, built of cut stone and covered with the most brilliant white stucco. From the flat roofs of these massive dwellings floated banners of many colors and strange devices. 
Arches of evergreens and flowers spanned every entrance to this plaza, whose floor was of the smoothest, whitest stucco, and heaps of fragrant flowers were piled at the palace doorways, and about the great altar that towered like a mountain of light in the midst. All around me were the phantom forms of the Indios, clad in garments of rich colors, but silent and expectant. I seemed to know them all and understand their tongue. It was the most sacred festival of the year. The rains had ceased and the summer was beginning, and a summer at Utatlan was a delight unequaled in the outer world. For many months the high priest and king had hidden himself from the sight of man, high in the mountains that overlook the Quiche Plain. In his Casa Verde he was engaged in prayer and meditation, while his only food was fruit and uncooked maize. His body was unclothed but stained with dismal dyes, and twice every day, as the sun rose and set, he cut himself with an obsidian knife on his arms, legs, and tongue, that he might offer his choicest blood to the divinity he worshipped. Once only in his life must he do this, and scattered in the remote mountain hermitages were many nobles keeping him company in the spirit. These were the fathers of the young men who had not yet offered their blood, and had been selected to be the godchildren of their king and priest. In these lonely retreats the fathers taught their sons many duties, and drew their blood from the five wounds. The votaries had gathered from their various cells at the sound of the drum, which was beaten only on most solemn occasions, and were marching in procession to the plaza. I could see them as they filed onto the narrow causeway that led into the town, and then they were lost to sight as they climbed the steep ascent. In profound silence, these men and youths, naked as they were born, entered the enclosure and seated themselves at the foot of the altar steps. The solemn silence was now suddenly broken by a crash of trumpets and drums, while a procession of a different kind took up its march to the temple, bright colors and the gleam of gold and precious stones, the clang of barbaric music and the sound of holy songs reached the eye and ear as the idols, which had been carefully concealed since the last fiesta, were now brought to the palace of sacrifice. Strange things these were, not of heaven above, nor the earth beneath, nor of the waters which are under the earth, but carved from wood and stone, and decked with beaten gold, hung with jewels, and borne triumphantly on the shoulders of the noblest citizens. Then all was joy and bustle in the plaza. The hermits were clothed with new robes and welcomed back with honor. The high priest put on his robes and mitre, and for a while the people gave themselves up to music and dancing and ball playing. It seemed as if life had no other end, but a terrible solemnity was to come. Even among the dancers, I saw men clothed in a peculiar but rich garb, generally of another people but not always foreign. And I knew that these men had for days before the festival gone freely through the town, entered any house, even the royal palace, where the food they sought was freely given them, and they were treated with marked respect. Outside the city walls were some of them, with collars about their necks, attended by four officers of the king's guard. Food and drink were free to these honored men, but they were captives taken in war or perhaps men who were obnoxious to the king, and were to be sacrificed to Tohio. A terrible death awaited them, but they regarded their fate as a matter they could not help, and with Indian stolidity enjoyed the frolics of the people and smiled at care. It was strange to see how little anyone seemed to be affected by the certainly approaching death of their fellows. Everyone knew what was coming, but no dread anticipation marred the festive scene. The music ceased in the plaza. The chief idol was placed on the altar top, and the priests and nobles seized the victims by their hair and passed them, struggling, one by one up the steep steps of the altar to the chief priest, who stood high on the sacrificatorio in the sight of all the people. There was no murmur, not even a shudder among the multitude only the involuntary shrieks of the sacrifice as the priest cut it to his breast with the stone knife and tore out his quivering heart. 
holding this in the golden spoon of the temple. He placed it reverently in the mouth of the idol, loudly chanting this prayer, Lord, hear us, for we are thine. Give us health, give us children and prosperity, that thy people may increase. Give us water in the rains, that we may be nourished and live. Hear our supplications, receive our prayers, assist us against our enemies, and grant us peace and quiet. And the people cried, So be it, O Lord. The body had been extended on a rounded sacrificial stone, and the neck held securely by the yoke, but now it was hurled down the side of the pyramid, where there were no steps, and those appointed carried the remains to the cauldron whither those who had the right came for the cooked meat, the hands and feet being reserved for the officiating priest. One by one the victims were offered to the idol, while the pyramid was no longer white but crimson and their death shrieks were ringing in my ears when Frank laid his hand on my shoulder and asked if I was asleep. Called back to deserted ruins and the humdrum present, I could not entirely shake off the impression of the past. On that little mound where we were sitting so peacefully, hundreds, yes, thousands of our fellow men had writhed in agony to satisfy the enmity of their fellows or to be an acceptable offering to the gods, who were supposed to be their creators. End of section 92. This recording is in the public domain. Section 93 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Copan by Joaquin Miller Deep in the mountains of Honduras is a level plain whereon stand the ruins of a city. There are remains of palaces, temples, and other public buildings. There are bits of stone pavements, fragments of colossal statues, columns, and pyramids. There are sewers made of stone and cement. There are portions of what were once massive stairways, and there are obelisks covered with hieroglyphics. The builders of this city, and of others equally mysterious, must have lived in Honduras long before the coming of the Spaniards, long before Columbus discovered America, but who they were and when they lived are as yet unanswered questions. The Editor Far in the wildest Kainine wood we found a city old, so old its very walls were turned to mould, and stately trees upon them stood. No history has mentioned it, no map has given it a place. The last dim trace of tribe and race, the world's forgetfulness is fit. It held one structure, grand and mossed, mighty as any castle sung, and old when oldest Ind was young, with threshold Christian never crossed. A temple builded to the sun, along whose sombre altar stone brown bleeding virgins had been strown like leaves, when leaves are crisp and done in ages ere the Sphinx was born, or Babylon had birth or morn. End of section 93. This recording is in the public domain. Section 94 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tapin. Section 94, Balboa, 1513, by Thomas Buchanan Reed. Thomas Wentworth Higginson says, It is exciting to hear how Balboa, crossing the Isthmus of Darien in 1513, came for the first time in sight of an unknown sea, the vast Pacific Ocean. How he knelt on the mountain top from which he saw it and thanked God for this great discovery, and how, descending to the shore, he waded in waist deep and waving his sword 
took possession of the ocean for the king of spain and pledged himself to defend it for his sovereign the editor from san domingo's crowded wharf fernandez vessel bore to seek in unknown lands afar the indians golden ore and hid among the frighted casks where none might see or know was one of spain's immortal men three hundred years ago but when the fading town and land had dropped below the sea he met the captain face to face and not a fear had he what villain thou fernandez cried and wherefore serve us so to be thy follower he replied three hundred years ago he wore a manly form and face a courage firm and bold his words fell on his comrades hearts like precious drops of gold they saw not his ambitious soul he spoke it not for lo he stood among the common ranks three hundred years ago but when fernandez vessel lay in golden darien a murmur born of discontent grew loud among the men and with the word there came the act and with a sudden blow they raised balboa from the ranks three hundred years ago and while he took command beneath the banner of his lord a mighty purpose grasped his soul as he had grasped the sword he saw the mountain's fair blue height whence golden waters flow then with his men he scaled the crags three hundred years ago he led them up through tangled brakes the rivulet's sliding bed and through the storm of poison darts from many an ambush shed he gained the turret crag alone and wept to see below an ocean boundless and unknown three hundred years ago and while he raised upon that height the banner of his lord the mighty purpose grasped him still as still he grasped the sword then down he rushed with all his men as headlong rivers flow and plunged breast deep into the sea three hundred years ago and while he held above his head the conquering flag of spain he waved his gleaming sword and smote the waters of the main for rome for leon and castile thrice gave the cleaving blow and thus balboa claimed the sea three hundred years ago end of section ninety four this recording is in the public domain Section 95 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. The World's Story, Volume 11. Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 25 chief nicaragua and the spaniards fifteen twenty two by frederick palmer gil gonzalez davila effected the conquest of nicaragua in fifteen twenty two with one hundred horses four men and his grand conceit and winning manners he found a large indolent native population existing easily of the plentiful fish in the rivers and the products of the bountiful soil divided into many tribes and in the highlands sharing the mayan civilization the first chief he met was nicoya whom he told of the all-powerful christian god who could send unbelievers to hellfire and believers to heaven according to the persuasive hills reports to spain nicoya concluded immediately in favor of bliss rather than burning and he and all his followers were baptized in return for salvation nicoya made hill a present of all his gold idols and gold dust to the value of sixteen thousand castellanos back in the hills was a mightier chief nicaragua from whom the country takes its name nicoya warned hill that nicaragua might fight valiantly if angered or if approached properly he might accept christianity so hill sent an embassy with this message tell him that a captain comes commissioned to these parts by the great king of the christians 
to tell all the lords of these lands that there is in the heavens higher than the sun one lord maker of all things and that those believing and obeying him shall at death ascend to that loftiness while disbelievers shall be driven into the fire beneath the earth tell him to be ready to hear and accept these truths or else to prepare for battle nicaragua's answer was that of a proud and hospitable gentleman tell those who sent you he said that i know not their king and therefore cannot do him homage that i fear not their sharp swords but love peace rather than war gold has little value they are welcome to what i have and in regard to the religion they teach i will talk with them and if i like it i will adopt it hill now proposed an exchange of gifts before discussing spiritual affairs in return for gold valued at fifteen thousand castellanos he gave a shirt a red cap and a silk dress after this successful bargain he harangued nicaragua on the value of christianity through the grace of the king of spain but nicaragua begged to ask the missionary a few questions you who know so much of the maker and of the making of this world tell me he said of the great flood and will there be another in the universal end will the earth be overturned or will the sky fall and destroy us whence do the sun and moon obtain their light and how will they lose it how large are the stars how are they held in the sky and moved about why are the nights made dark and the winters cold why did not the christian god make a better world what honour is due him and what rights and duties has man under whose dominion are the beasts whither goes the soul which you hold to be immortal when it leaves the body does the pope never die and is the great king of spain immortal and why do the christians so love gold hill answered all most satisfactorily according to his accounts though he does not say how came these men from heaven nicaragua asked of the interpreter yes was the answer but in what way asked nicaragua directly down like the flight of an arrow or riding a cloud or in a circuit like a bent bow the interpreter's reply is not recorded possibly he said that this detail was known only to the king of spain after he had exercised his wits long enough nicaragua concluded i see no harm in it we cannot however give up our war paint and weapons our gay decorations and dances and become women then according to bancroft upon a high mound whose summit was reached by steps hill gonzalez had planted the cross upon first entering the town a procession headed by the spanish and the native leaders now marched solemnly about the town and ascended the steps of the mount on their knees chanting their hymns of praise the while proceeding to the temple they erected there an altar and jointly placed upon it the sacred emblem in token the one of giving and the other of receiving the true faith hill says that in one day he personally catechized every one of the nine thousand and seventeen natives his exactitude about the number ought to be convincing to any sceptic but peace in nicaragua was transient hill's men were soon trying by treacherous attack to force such gold from the natives as they would not give other conquerors set claim to this land of treasure with its amiable people among them was cortez these quarrels were carried to the court of spain when not fought out on the spot and while guatemala was under single-headed authority nicaragua became the scene of the broils of fortune hunters who set the example for the feuds of leaders and communities which followed independence at the end of spanish dominion in eighteen twenty two nicaragua must have had nearly two million population the prosperous cities of granada and leon each had a hundred thousand then for more than thirty years the civil tumult of municipality against municipality house against house family against family and neighbor against neighbor continued men of wealth were forced to beggary on the highways the fertile plateau of the northern midland was devastated and depopulated until by eighteen fifty probably less than five hundred thousand people remained End of section ninety five this recording is in the public domain. Section 96 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tapin. Section 96. William Walker, The Last of the Filibusters. 1853 to 1860 by Joaquin Miller. In 1853, William Walker, an American, led an expedition to conquer the Mexican state of Sonora and proclaimed himself its president. This scheme was not a success, and two years later he was ready to undertake another. This was to aid the land speculators in Nicaragua sixty-two followers accompanied him to that country and he was joined by a few natives victory came swiftly he entered the city of granada and was made secretary of war and then commander-in-chief the next step was his election as president of the country then came insurrection and defeat twice he set off with a small force to arouse a revolution in honduras but he was at length captured, tried by court-martial, and shot. The Editor I lay this crude wreath on his dust, inwove with sad sweet memories, recalled here by these colder seas. I leave the wild bird with his trust, to sing and say him nothing wrong, I wake no rivalry of song he lies low in the level sand unsheltered from the tropic sun and now of all he knew not one will speak him fair in that far land perhaps twas this that made me seek disguised his grave one winter tide a weakness for the weaker side a siding with the helpless weak a palm not far held out a hand hard by a long green bamboo swung and bent like some great bow unstrung and quivered like a willow wand beneath a broad banana's leaf perched on its fruits that crooked hang a bird in rainbow splendour sang a low sad song of tempered grief no sod no sign no cross nor stone but at his side a cactus green upheld its lances long and keen it stood in hot red sand alone flat palmed and fierce with lifted spears one bloom of crimson crowned its head a drop of blood so bright so red yet redolent of roses tears in my left hand i held a shell all rosy lipped and pearly red i laid it by his lowly bed for he did love so passing well the grand songs of the solemn sea a shell sing well wild with a will when storms blow loud and birds be still the wildest sea-song known to thee i said some things with folded hands soft whispered in the dim sea sound and eyes held humbly to the ground and frail knees sunken in the sands he had done more than this for me and yet i could not well do more i turned me down the olive shore and set a sad face to the sea end of section ninety six this recording is in the public domain section ninety seven of canada south america central america Mexico and the West Indies. Read for LibriVox.org by Piotr Nater. Cargadores of Guatemala, 20th century. By Nevin O. Winter. The Indians are obliged by law to do carrying work across the country when desired and paid for their services. If the traveler is unable to get a cargador, an appeal to the proper official will secure one within a reasonable time. That official will, if necessary, arrest a man and lock him up overnight in the cabildo in order to have him on hand when wanted. They can only be obliged to go about a two days' journey from home and carry a hundred pounds. Their wages are only a few cents per day in gold, so that their services do not come very high. In case of attempted overcharge, the jefe, local governor, 
will settle all disputes, and he is generally very fair in his conclusions. Many of the cargadores use a framework called a carcaste in which to carry their loads. If one desires to engage the cargador, it is necessary to give him enough time to prepare tortillas for the journey. With a basket of these, a plenteous supply of coffee, a cup, and a few twigs for fire, the Indian is ready for the journey. He will not need to buy anything on the road except some fruit or a little white eye, the native brandy. Their excuse for this extra would be like the old Guatemalan who said, one wants to get rid of his memory once in a while. At night they light their fires either in the public hall or out of doors under the brilliant starlit canopy where they make their coffee and warm their tortillas. Embers of these fires may be seen on every hand as one journeys across the country. The men are unobtrusive, and even when gathered together in considerable numbers, they are quiet if any strangers are present. Among themselves, however, they are gay and light-hearted, and seem to enjoy life. These cargadores are an ancient and honorable institution in Central America. From time immemorial, they have transported baggage and produce from one part of the country to another, and they rather look upon the encroachment of railroads with disfavor, for it will curtail their business. They will carry a mule's load of one hundred and fifty pounds at even a greater speed, averaging five or six miles an hour, for they travel at a sort of jog-trot. Some of the couriers in olden times were very fleet of foot, for they used to be kept busy in time of war before the introduction of the telegraph. President Rufino Barrios had a runner in his employ, of whom it is said that he carried a despatch thirty-five leagues into the interior and returned an answer in thirty-six hours, making the two hundred and ten miles over mountains at the rate of six miles an hour, including stops and delays for food and sleep. When equipped for the road, these men wear a costume consisting of short trousers, like bathing trunks, a little cotton shirt, and sandals made of cowhide. End of section 97. This recording is in the public domain. Section 98 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Zunis. The World's Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 98. Happy Little Costa Rica, 20th Century, by Frederick Palmer. A Frenchman, Le Ferrier, writing of this little-known region thirty years ago in De Paris a Guatemala, says, The Costa Ricans dislike wasting their resources in wars or war material, preferring the arts of peace and to welcome those bringing wealth from other countries. The policy and character of the old social order remain unchanged. Still talking of union, Costa Rica's instinct is as naturally for isolation as that of Switzerland. She has never been an aggressor against her neighbors. But if Central America is assailed, her response is immediate as a measure of self-protection. Without her assistance, William Walker, the filibuster, would not have been beaten in Nicaragua. Her little army administered the decisive defeat to his forces and then marched back from those unpleasant lowlands to its own pleasant highlands. Neighboring dictators have learned a wholesome respect for the men who have the qualities of the farmer and the planter, which the Boers exemplified. At a signal of danger, they will, as Don Carlos Peralta said, come riding in from all directions, rifle in hand, confident of their ability to defeat any tatterdemalion lot of conscripts from the other republics. They have suffered presidents who grew autocratic and who won office by chicanery and ballot box stuffing. But every president has a check. He knows that he may look out of the window one morning to see men on horseback streaming into town, so public opinion exists and has an effect. Clannishness makes the Costa Ricans love company. Their fraternal feeling, which is the growth of time, leads to the greeting of brother as men pass, and other Central Americans have nicknamed them the brotherly people. While outlying regions wait on development, the population centers around San Jose the New and Cartago the Old Capital. 
San Jose is one-third the size of Guatemala City, and its first distinction to the approaching visitor is an electric car line when he has seen none since leaving the city of Mexico. The streets are scrupulously clean and well-paved. Sanitation is the hobby of the president, Gonzalez Fiques, whom the weekly life for San Jose included in its free press, a humorous weekly, always pictures with a mosquito on the top of his bald head and one of the local newspapers is of the opinion that he is otherwise the head of a perfectly incapable administration and tells him so daily. No city of its size at home, and none is, of course, a capital, has so many attractive shops. That rich coffee land is prodigal, creating an extravagant people. If this year's crop is bad, why not live while you live? And no doubt next year's crop will be good. Senora and Senorita must have Parisian hats for the church parade and beautiful gowns for the opera. Imported dainties for the palette reappear in the store windows after being absent since leaving the city of Mexico. Costa Rica spends so freely that her foreign trade amounts to five times the average per capita of the other Central American countries. Ten million people of the Costa Rican type in Central America would soon change our attitude of disinterestedness then there would be a commercial prize on our borders worth having. The light-hearted Costa Rican is proudest of the beauty of his women and his opera house. What would be the use of the opera house if it were not for the beautiful women, as Don Carlos well said? Some of them are fair-haired and have blue eyes, a distinction worth a dowry to any San Jose girl. They are devoted to religion, and their influence sways fathers, husbands, and sons. Though freedom of worship is guaranteed, Costa Rica recognizes the church by an annual grant, and every Sunday morning the well-uniformed, European-appearing garrison marches to the cathedral, which is the only one I saw in Central America that was in repair. That crowning piece of Costa Rican extravagance, the National Opera House, which cost a million dollars in this town of 20,000 people, is a tribute to their cultivated taste. We had not its equal in New York in architectural pretensions until the new theater was built, and on the American continent it is surpassed only by the national theaters in Mexico, Rio de Janeiro, and Buenos Aires. The marble for its staircase came from Italy. Artists were brought from abroad to paint the scenes of coffee and banana culture which should express the source of Costa Rican wealth, and the love of music is no affectation. It is a serious matter, with predilection for the Italian and French classics and for rigid observance of stage conventions, and a discriminating exhibition of pleasure or displeasure over the performer's work. San Jose boasts its polo teams, its football 11, and baseball nines. Nothing which belongs to a great world capital seems wanting, at least in miniature. There is a national fondness for beautiful parks and impressive public buildings. Though the Costa Ricans took relatively little interest in the Treaty of Washington, it was considered a national honor to have the Court of Peace sit in the one country which had been peaceful, and when Mr. Carnegie gave the money to build the palace for housing the judges at Cartago, the attitude changed to positive enthusiasm. A national library is building. An enormous penitentiary stands outside the town as an example of architectural pride. Future generations may grow up to it. At present, the guests are as lonely as the scattered few in a summer hotel just before the autumn closing time. The insane asylum, set in a garden of palms and flowers, might be mistaken for the suburban residence of some multimillionaire, but I should not call it an insane asylum. This is against the rules of modern science, as I was reminded by the director, educated in Germany, who showed me through a hospital modern in every respect. Whatever public institution I visited, the impression was the same. The National Museum was not a travesty. The art school had a score of busy pupils, boys and girls, and the high school and the girls' seminary lose little by any foreign comparison. While on the severely practical side, the public abattoir, well-ordered in keeping with what doctors trained abroad had concluded was the best precedent, would not have been thought complete without an ornamental front to soften the thought of the butchery within to passers-by. And that new department store kept by a German. It opens up a world of gossip about bargains and is a drain on many a coffee estate. 
but no Costa Rican woman, you may be sure, will ever allow any bargain to permit the sale of a rood of the family coffee land. Issue debentures, yes, but sell, never. From generation to generation, the land is held, and its value, close to San Jose, would astound a Western farmer who owns a valuable wheat farm. That coffee plant is capricious. It grows better nowhere in the world than here. After all my ineffectual efforts to find out about exports and imports in the other countries, what a pleasure it was to be referred to a bureau which filled your pockets and arms with statistical information and your mind with confidence that the information was at least approximately correct. The Spanish-American custom of no land tax still prevails. Costa Rica is a country of landowners, large and small, and if one wants to borrow money instead of laying a mortgage, he can issue debentures on his property. Titles are clear and the books open to all to see whatever loan stands against any holding. Taxes are chiefly on imports and by weight, but under a more reasonable scale than elsewhere. But there is a fly in the amber. Proud little Costa Rica, so scrupulous about her national honor, has been defaulting the interest on her national debt for many years. She loved those handsome buildings, and paying for dead horses was most trying. However, be it said to her credit, her citizens were always apologizing for the fact, which represented at least a stage of self-consciousness, and, at last accounts, arrangements were underway to settle with her creditors and begin a new career. End of section 98. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Amy Zunis. Section 99 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke. Mexico, Part 1 stories of the aztecs historical note it is thought that before the coming of the spaniards mexico had been occupied by at least three races first were the toltecs they built cities some fifty miles from the present city of mexico so vast that their ruins have won for these people the name of the builders early in the twelfth century the chichimecas came upon them and drove them to the southward the chichimecas settled near texcoco and there they remained until in the twelfth century some nahuatlaca tribes came to that region according to tradition the aztecs one of these tribes found it difficult to secure an abiding place for themselves and were told by their gods to build where they should see an eagle perched upon a prickly pear cactus and strangling a serpent in obedience to this command they settled upon some marshy islands in lake texcoco where the city of mexico now stands the power of the aztecs increased until the other tribes had become subordinate to them in fifteen o two montezuma the second was elected ruler of the aztecs and he was on the throne at the coming of the spaniards the religion of the ancient mexicans was the most bloodthirsty the world has known their favorite deity was the god of war to whom were dedicated the prisoners taken in battle his temple was in the shape of a pyramid rising in successive terraces to an immense height so that from all parts of the city the wretched captives could be seen as they were driven up the steps to the shrine at the top here they were stretched on a concave slab of jasper before the statue of the war god their hearts were cut out by the priest as a sacrifice and their bodies were rolled down the steps for the captors to take home and eat at the feast of victory in order to obtain enough victims for their ferocious deity the aztecs were obliged to make almost continuous war on neighboring tribes and in battle to devote their energies rather to capturing their enemies than to slaying them 
end of section ninety nine this recording is in the public domain section one hundred of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone a hymn of the ancient mexicans this is addressed to tetty oinan mother of the gods the editor hail to our mother who caused the yellow flowers to blossom who scattered the seeds of the magoi as she came forth from paradise hail to our mother who poured forth flowers in abundance who scattered the seeds of the magoi as she came forth from paradise hail to our mother who caused the yellow flowers to blossom she who scattered the seeds of the magoi as she came forth from paradise hail to our mother who poured forth white flowers in abundance who scattered the seeds of the magoi as she came forth from paradise hail to the goddess who shines in the thorn bush like a bright butterfly ho she is our mother goddess of the earth she supplies food in the desert to the wild beasts and causes them to live thus thus you see her to be an ever fresh model of liberality toward all flesh and as you see the goddess of earth do to the wild beasts so also does she towards the green herbs and the fishes End of section 100 this recording is in the public domain. Section 101 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the world story volume eleven canada south america central america mexico and the west indies edited by eva march tappan section one hundred and one nezwa coital king of the tuscucans by william hickling prescott the king was strict in the execution of his laws though his natural disposition led him to temper justice with mercy many anecdotes are told of the benevolent interest he took in the concerns of his subjects and of his anxiety to detect and reward merit even in the most humble it was common for him to ramble among them in disguise like the celebrated caliph in the arabian nights mingling freely in conversation and ascertaining their actual condition with his own eyes on one such occasion when attended only by a single lord he met with a boy who was gathering sticks in a field for fuel he inquired of him why he did not go into the neighbouring forest where he would find a plenty of them to which the lad answered it was the king's wood and he would punish him with death if he trespassed there the royal forests were very extensive in Tezcuco and were guarded by laws full as severe as those of the norman tyrants in england what kind of man is your king asked the monarch willing to learn the effect of these prohibitions on his own popularity a very hard man answered the boy who denies his people what god has given them Deswa coital urged him not to mind such arbitrary laws but to glean his sticks in the forest as there was no one present who would betray him but the boy sturdily refused bluntly accusing the disguised king at the same time of being a traitor and of wishing to bring him into trouble nezwa coital on returning to the palace ordered the child and his parents to be summoned before him they received the orders with astonishment but on entering the presence the boy at once recognized the person 
with whom he had discoursed so unceremoniously and he was filled with consternation the good-natured monarch however relieved his apprehensions by thanking him for the lesson he had given him and at the same time commended his respect for the laws and praised his parents for the manner in which they had trained their son he then dismissed the parties with a liberal largesse and afterwards mitigated the severity of the forest laws so as to allow persons to gather any wood they might find on the ground if they did not meddle with the standing timber another adventure is told of him with a poor woodman and his wife who had brought their little load of billets for sale to the market-place at Texcuco. the man was bitterly lamenting his hard lot and the difficulty with which he earned a wretched subsistence while the master of the palace before which they were standing lived an idle life without toil and with all the luxuries of the world at his command he was going on in his complaints when the good woman stopped him by reminding him that he might be overheard he was so by nezwacoidal himself who standing screened from observation at a latticed window which overlooked the market was amusing himself as he was wont with observing the common people chaffering in the square he immediately ordered the querulous couple into his presence they appeared trembling and conscience struck before him the king gravely inquired what they had said as they answered him truly he told them they should reflect that if he had great treasures at his command he had still greater calls for them that far from leading an easy life he was oppressed with a whole burden of government and concluded by admonishing them to be more cautious in future as walls had ears he then ordered his officers to bring a quantity of cloth and a generous supply of cacao the coin of the country and dismissed them go said he with the little you now have you will be rich while with all my riches i shall still be poor end of section one hundred and one this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and two of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies read for librivox dot org by thomas peter mexican hieroglyphics photograph page four hundred and eighty two the mexican priesthood being the educated class were much concerned with the art of picture writing which they had developed to a stage quite above the rude figures of the american hunting tribes and used systematically as a means of recording religious festivals and legends as well as keeping calendars of years and recording the historical events which occurred in them the main principle is pictorial guards are represented with their appropriate attributes the fire-god hurling his spear the moon goddess with a shell etc the scenes of human life are pictures of warriors fighting with club and spear men paddling in canoes women spinning and weaving etc an important step toward phonetic writing appears however in the picture names of places and persons the simplest forms of these depict the objects signified by the name as where chapultepec or grasshopper hill is represented by a grasshopper on a hill or a stone with a cactus on it stands for Tenoc, or Stone Cactus, the founder of Tenochtitlan. The system had, however, risen a stage beyond this, when objects were drawn to represent not themselves, but the syllables forming their names, as where a trap, an eagle, a pricker, and a hand are put together not to represent these objects, but in order that the syllables of their names, Moquazuma, should spell the word Moquazuma. End of section 102. This recording is in the public domain. Section 103 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. The World Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies, 
Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 103. How an Aztec Boy Became a Knight by Hubert Howe Bancroft. There were several military orders and titles which were bestowed as a reward for gallantry. One of them, the knightly order of the Tecutli, being restricted to the nobility. To obtain this rank, it was necessary, besides being of noble birth, to have given proof of the highest courage and to have sufficient wealth to defray the enormous expenses attached to it. For three years before he was admitted, the candidate and his parents busied themselves in making ready for the ceremony, and in collecting rich garments, jewels, and golden ornaments as presents for the guests. When the time approached, the omens were consulted, and an auspicious day being selected, his relatives and friends, and a number of great nobles and tecutlis were invited to a sumptuous banquet. On the morning of this all-important day, the company set forth in a body for the temple of Kamaxli, the Tlaxcaltec god of war, followed by a multitude of curious spectators, mainly of the lower orders. Arriving at the summit of the pyramid consecrated to the war god, the aspirant to knightly honors bowed down reverently before his altar. The high priest then approached him, and with a tiger's bone or an eagle's claw, perforated the cartilage of his nose in two places, inserting pieces of jet or obsidian, which remained until the year of his probation was passed, and were then replaced with golden beads and precious stones. This operation signified that he who aspired to the dignity of a tecutli must be swift to overtake an enemy as the eagle, and fierce in battle as the tiger. Speaking in a loud voice, the high priest now begins to heap insults upon the candidate, who makes no answer, but stands meekly before him. His voice grows louder and louder. He brandishes his arms aloft and works himself into a fury. The assistant priests gather close around the object of the pontiff's wrath. They jostle him. They point their fingers sneeringly at him and call him coward. For a moment, the dark eyes of the victim gleam savagely. His hands close involuntarily. He is about to spring upon his tormentors, but with an effort he calms himself and remains passive as ever. That look makes the priests draw back, but only for an instant. They are upon him again, for they know that he is strong to endure and they will prove him to the uttermost. Screaming vile epithets in his ears, they tear the garments piece by piece from his body, until nothing but the moxley is left, and the man stands bruised and almost naked in their midst. All is useless, however, their victim is immovable, and at length he is left in peace. The candidate has now passed safely through his most trying ordeal, but that fierce look was a narrow escape. Had he lifted only a finger in resistance, he must have gone down from the temple, to be scorned and jeered at by the crowd below as one who had aspired to the dignity of a tecutli, and yet could restrain his temper no better than a woman. All the long months of preparation would have been in vain. His parents would have wept for vexation and shame, and perchance he would even have been punished for sacrilege. But he is by no means yet a member of the coveted order. He is now conducted to a hall in the temple, where he commences his novitiate, or period of probation, with four days of penance, prayer, and fasting. During this time his powers of endurance are sorely taxed. The only furniture allowed him are a mat and a low stool, and his garments are of the coarsest description. At nightfall a priest brings to him a black ointment, wherewith to besmear his face, a few spines of the maguey plant with which to draw blood from his body, a censer, and some incense. His sole companions are three veteran warriors, who instruct him in his duties and keep him awake, for during the four days he must only sleep a few minutes at a time. If, overcome with drowsiness, he should exceed the limit, his guardians thrust the maguey thorns into his flesh, crying, Awake! Awake! Learn to be vigilant and watchful. Keep your eyes open, that you may look to the interests of your vassals. At midnight, the candidate burns incense before the war god, and draws blood from various parts of his body. He then walks round the temple, and on his way burns paper and copal at the four sides of the building facing the cardinal points letting fall upon each offering a few drops of his own blood. Once only in twenty-four hours he breaks his fast, and then the food, which is taken at midnight, consists only of four small dumplings of maize meal, each about the size of a walnut, and a little water. 
Even this he leaves untasted if he wishes to display extraordinary powers of endurance. The four days elapsed, he obtains permission from the high priest to complete his time of probation at some temple in his own city or district. For two or three months before his formal admission to the order, the relatives of the candidate make ready for the coming ceremony. A grand display is made of the rich attire and costly jewels prepared for him. Presents without stint are provided for the guests. A second banquet is made ready, and the whole house is decorated for the occasion. On the day appointed, the company assemble as before, and with music and dancing, the knight is borne toward the shrine of Kamaxtli. Accompanied by his brother Tikutlis, he ascends the steps of the temple and respectfully salutes the god. The coarse garments are then removed, and his hair is bound in a knot with a red cord, to the ends of which are appended some feathers of brilliant plumage. He is now arrayed in a garb of rich material, including a tunic, adorned with a delicately embroidered device, the badge of his newly acquired rank. In his right hand are placed some arrows, and in his left a bow. The ceremony is completed by the high priest, who instructs him in his duties, tells him the names which he is to add to his own as a member of the order, describes to him the signs and devices which he must emblazon on his escutcheon, and exhorts him to be liberal and just, to love his country and his gods. The knight then descends into the court of the temple, and music and dancing are resumed until it is time for the banquet to commence. To the guests, at least, this was the most interesting feature of the day for in front of each one were placed the presents intended for him, consisting of costly wares and ornaments, in such profusion that two slaves could with difficulty carry a single portion. On the following day, the servants and followers of the guests were feasted and presented with gifts, according to the means and liberality of the donor. The privileges of the Tecutlis were important and numerous. In council, their votes outweighed all others, and at feasts and ceremonies, in peace or in war, they always received the preference. The vast outlay needed to obtain this title debarred many who were really worthy of the distinction. In some instances, however, when a noble had won renown in war, but had not the means to pay for his initiation, the expenses were borne by the order, or by the governor of his province. End of section 103 Section 104 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 104, How the Aztec King Passed His Time, Early Part of the Sixteenth Century, by Hubert Howe Bancroft. The number of attendants attached to the royal houses was very great. Every day, from sunrise until sunset, the antechambers of montezuma's residence in the capital were thronged with nobles who discussed in low tones the topics of the day for it was considered disrespectful to speak loudly within the walls of the palace they took their meals from the dishes provided for the royal table as did after them their own servants of whom each one was entitled to a certain number according to his rank these retainers fill several of the outer courts during the day numbering in all some two or three thousand the king took his meals alone in one of the largest halls of the palace in cold weather a fire was kindled of charcoal made of the bark of trees which emitted no smoke but gave forth a delicious perfume and to protect him from the heat a screen ornamented with gold and carved with figures of idols was placed between his person and the fire he was seated on a low leathern cushion covered with soft skins and his table which was of a similar description though larger and higher was covered with white cloths of the finest texture the dinner service was of the finest wares of cholulu and many of the goblets were of gold and silver or of beautiful shells 
the viands included all descriptions of fish flesh and fowl that could be procured in the empire or imported from beyond it relays of courtiers were employed in bringing delicacies from afar and it is said that the royal table was every day supplied with fish brought from the sea-coast more than fifty leagues distant there were skilful cooks among the aztecs and in preparing the royal banquets there was almost as much variety in the cooking as in the materials used meats fish and poultry roasted stewed and boiled were served up in every style and among them were many curious messes such as frog spawn and stewed ants seasoned with chili but strangest of all the compounds that made up the royal cart was one highly seasoned dish so carefully prepared that its principal ingredient was completely disguised that ingredient being human flesh bread of many varieties all more or less resembling the modern tortilla or unleavened cake of maize and tamales of various descriptions the tamale being a compound of meat vegetables herbs and lard coated with maize dough and wrapped in a corn husk formed a portion of each repast as to the quantities of food prepared for these meals authorities differ but it must have been enormous for the lowest estimate places the number of dishes at three hundred and the highest at three thousand they were brought into the hall by pages of noble birth who placed their burdens upon the matted floor and retired noiselessly the monarch then pointed out the viands of which he desired to partake or left the selection to his steward who alone was privileged to place them upon his table everything being in readiness a number of beautiful women entered bearing water in round vessels in which the king might wash his hands and towels wherewith to dry them at the same time two other women brought him small loaves of bread made of the finest maize flour beaten up with eggs this done a wooden screen carved and gilt was placed before him that none might see him eat except the five or six aged lords who on these occasions stood in the presence of royalty barefooted and with bowed heads to these as a special mark of favour the monarch occasionally sent a choice morsel from his own plate during his meal the king sometimes amused himself with watching the performances of his jugglers and tumblers and at other times there was dancing accompanied with singing and music there were always present dwarfs and professional jesters who were allowed to speak a liberty denied to all others under penalty of death and as one of the privileges of their calling to tell sharp truths in guise of jests the more solid food was followed by pastry sweetmeats and a variety of fruits the only beverage served at the meal was chocolate which was taken with a spoon finely wrought of gold or shell from a goblet of the same material his repast concluded the king again washed his hands in water brought to him as before and then after inhaling from a gilt and painted pipe the smoke of a mixture of liquid amber and tobacco he took his siesta the after-dinner hours montezuma devoted to affairs of state giving audience to foreign ambassadors to deputations from various portions of his empire and to such of his lords and nobles as had business to transact with him before entering the presence chamber all except those of royal blood were required to leave their sandals at the door to cover their rich dresses with a large coarse mantle and to approach the monarch barefooted and with downcast eyes for the subject who should dare to look the sovereign in the face was surely put to death the king usually made answer through his secretaries or when he deigned to reply directly spoke in a tone of voice almost inaudible nevertheless he listened attentively to all that was said to him and encouraged those who from diffidence or embarrassment found difficulty in speaking each one when dismissed retiring with his face toward the royal throne 
the business of the day thus concluded the monarch again gave himself up to pleasure passing his time in familiar badinage with his jesters and listening to ballad singers who sang of war and the glorious deeds of his ancestors or in watching the feats of strength and sleight of hand of his acrobats and jugglers thrice each day he changed his dress and a garment once worn was never used again the aztec monarchs seldom appeared in state among their people though we are told that they would sometimes go forth in disguise to see that none of the religious ceremonies were omitted to ascertain whether the laws were observed and probably to learn the true state of public opinion with regard to themselves when they did appear however the parade was in keeping with their other observances on these occasions the king was seated in a magnificent litter covered with a canopy of feather work adorned with gold and precious stones and borne on the shoulders of four noblemen he was attended by a vast multitude of courtiers who walked in silence and with downcast eyes the procession being headed by an official carrying three wands whose duty it was to give warning of his approach in addition to the host of retainers already mentioned there were innumerable servants and officials attached to the royal household such as butlers stewards and cooks treasurers secretaries scribes military officers superintendents of the royal granaries and arsenals and those employed under them numbers of artisans were constantly engaged in repairing old buildings and erecting new ones and a small army of jewellers and workers in precious metals was maintained permanently at the palace for the purpose of supplying the king and court with their costly ornaments the enormous expense of supporting the monarch's household was defrayed by the people who were sorely oppressed by overtaxation the entire management was entrusted to a head steward who with the help of his secretaries kept minute hieroglyphic records of the royal revenue and it is said that at the time of the conquest one of the palace apartments was filled with these records End of section one hundred and four this recording is in the public domain section one hundred five of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies read for librivox dot org by jared starr mexico part two the coming of the spaniards historical note when cortez first landed in mexico on the spot where vera cruz now stands the aztecs met him in most friendly fashion they told him that the governor of their province was teutlayo but that far inland dwelt the great montezuma the mighty ruler of the whole land cortez assured them of his friendly intentions and said that he desired to meet their governor this meeting was accomplished and he then pushed on to the city of mexico montezuma tried his best to induce the spaniards to remain away from his capital but he still refused to fight them for according to national tradition the god quetzalcoatl would some day return to mexico with beard and a white skin and the king was half convinced that these invaders might be of the race of the sun at length the spaniards entered the city and fortified themselves in one of the palaces as the attitude of the mexicans grew menacing cortez seized montezuma and compelled him to acknowledge the authority of spain and to pay an immense ransom soon after he was stoned to death by his own subjects for having submitted to cortez his successor led a furious attack on the handful of spaniards who were forced to retreat after losing many of their men having recruited fresh forces cortez marched again to the city which he captured after a long and desperate siege the aztec king was seized and executed and all mexico submitted to spanish rule End of section 105. This recording is in the public domain. Section 106 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. 
The World's Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 106. Has the God Quetzalcoatl come to Mexico? Year 1519, by William Hickling Prescott. Teutlile arrived, as he had announced, before noon. He was attended by a numerous train, and was met by Cortés, who conducted him with much ceremony to his tent, where his principal officers were assembled. The Aztec chief returned their salutations with polite, though formal, courtesy. Mass was first said by Father Olmedo, and the service was listened to by Teutlile and his attendants with decent reverence. A collation was afterwards served, at which the general entertained his guests with Spanish wines and confections. The interpreters were then introduced, and the conversation commenced between the parties. The first inquiries of Teutlile were respecting the country of the strangers and the purport of their visit. Cortés told him that he was the subject of a potent monarch beyond the seas, who ruled over an immense empire and had kings and princes for his vassals that acquainted with the greatness of the mexican emperor his master had desired to enter into a communication with him and had sent him as his envoy to wait on montezuma with a present in token of his good will and a message which he must deliver in person he concluded by inquiring of teutlile when he could be admitted to his sovereign's presence to this the aztec noble somewhat haughtily replied how is it that you have been here only two days and demand to see the emperor he then added with more courtesy that he was surprised to learn there was another monarch as powerful as montezuma but that if it were so he had no doubt his master would be happy to communicate with him he would send his couriers with the royal gift brought by the spanish commander and so soon as he had learned montezuma's will would communicate it teutlile then commanded his slaves to bring forward the present intended for the spanish general it consisted of ten loads of fine cottons several mantles of that curious feather-work whose rich and delicate dyes might vie with the most beautiful painting a wicker basket filled with ornaments of wrought gold all calculated to inspire the spaniards with high ideas of the wealth and mechanical ingenuity of the mexicans cortes received these presents with suitable acknowledgments and ordered his own attendants to lay before the chief the articles designed for montezuma these were an armchair richly carved and painted a crimson cup of cloth having a gold medal emblazoned with saint george and the dragon and a quantity of collars bracelets and other ornaments of cut glass which in a country where glass was not to be had might claim to have the value of real gems and no doubt passed for such with the inexperienced mexican teutlile observed a soldier in the camp with a shining gilt helmet on his head which he said reminded him of one worn by the god quetzalcoatl in mexico and he showed a desire that montezuma should see it the coming of the spaniards was associated with some traditions of the same deity cortes expressed his willingness that the cask should be sent to the emperor intimating a hope that it would be returned filled with the gold dust of the country that he might be able to compare its quality with that in his own he further told the governor as we are informed by his chaplain that the spaniards were troubled with a disease of the heart for which gold was a specific remedy in short says las casas he contrived to make his want of gold very clear to the governor while these things were passing cortes observed one of teutlile's attendants busy with a pencil apparently delineating some object on looking at his work he found that it was a sketch on canvas of the spaniards their costumes arms and in short different objects of interest giving to each its appropriate form and color this was the celebrated picture writing of the aztecs and as teutlile informed him this man was employed in portraying the various objects for the eye of montezuma who would thus gather a more vivid notion of their appearance than from any description by words Cortes was pleased with the idea, and as he knew how much the effect would be heightened by converting still life into action, he ordered out the cavalry on the beach, the wet sands of which afforded a firm footing for the horses. The bold and rapid movements of the troops, as they went through their military exercises, the apparent ease with which they managed the fiery animals on which they were mounted, the glancing of their weapons, and the shrill cry of the trumpet, all filled the spectators with astonishment 
but when they heard the thunders of the cannon which cortez ordered to be fired at the same time and witnessed the volumes of smoke and flame issuing from these terrible engines and the rushing sound of the balls as they dashed through the trees of the neighbouring forest shivering their branches into fragments they were filled with consternation from which the aztec chief himself was not wholly free nothing of all this was lost on the painters who faithfully recorded after their fashion every particular not omitting the ships the water-houses as they called them of the strangers which with their dark hulls and snow-white sails reflected from the water were swinging lazily at anchor on the calm bosom of the bay all was depicted with a fidelity that excited in their turn the admiration of the spaniards who doubtless unprepared for this exhibition of skill greatly overestimated the merits of the execution these various matters ended teutlile with his attendants withdrew from the spanish quarters with the same ceremony with which he had entered them leaving orders that his people should supply the troops with provisions and other articles requisite for their accommodation till further orders from the capital teutlile promptly sent messengers to montezuma to tell him of the coming of the strangers now from the appearance of comets and other signs the subjects of the king believed that quetzalcoatl himself was about to visit his people it was possible that among these fair-skinned visitors was the god of the sun it was also possible that they might be enemies montezuma decided to send an embassy to them bearing magnificent presents to impress them with his power and wealth but forbidding them to come any nearer to his capital city at the expiration of seven or eight days at most the mexican embassy presented itself before the camp it may seem an incredibly short space of time considering the distance of the capital was near seventy leagues but it may be remembered that tidings were carried there by means of posts as already noticed in the brief space of four and twenty hours and four or five days would suffice for the descent of the envoys to the coast accustomed as the mexicans were to long and rapid travelling at all events no writer states the period occupied by the indian emissaries on this occasion as longer than that mentioned the embassy consisting of two aztec nobles was accompanied by the governor teutlile and by a hundred slaves bearing the princely gifts of montezuma one of the envoys had been selected on account of the great resemblance which as appeared from the painting representing the camp he bore to the spanish commander and it is a proof of the fidelity of the painting that the soldiers recognized the resemblance and always distinguished the chief by the name of the quote unquote, mexican cortez on entering the general's pavilion the ambassadors saluted him and his officers with the usual signs of reverence to persons of great consideration touching the ground with their hands and then carrying them to their heads while the air was filled with clouds of incense which rose up from the censer borne by their attendants some delicately wrought mats of the country were then unrolled and on them the slaves displayed the various articles that they brought they were of the most miscellaneous kind shields helmets cuirasses embossed with plates and ornaments of pure gold collars and bracelets of the same metal sandals fans panaches and crests of variegated feathers intermingled with gold and silver thread and sprinkled with pearls and precious stones imitations of birds and animals in wrought and cast gold and silver of exquisite workmanship coverlets and robes of cotton fine as silk of rich and various dyes interwoven with feather work that rivalled the delicacy of painting there were more than thirty loads of cotton cloth in addition among the articles was the spanish helmet sent to the capital and now returned filled to the brim with grains of gold but the things which excited the most admiration were two circular plates of gold and silver quote unquote, as large as carriage wheels one representing the sun was richly carved with plants and animals no doubt denoting the aztec century it was thirty palms in circumference and was valued at twenty thousand pesos de oro the silver wheel of the same size weighted fifty marks note about twenty-five pounds end note. the spaniards could not conceal their rapture at the exhibition of treasures which so far surpassed all the dreams in which they had indulged for rich as were the materials they were exceeded according to the testimony of those who saw these articles afterwards in seville where they could coolly examine them 
by the beauty and richness of the workmanship. When Cortés and his officers had completed their survey, the ambassadors courteously delivered the message of Montezuma. It gave their master great pleasure, they said, to hold this communication with so powerful a monarch as the King of Spain, for whom he felt the most profound respect. He regretted much that he could not enjoy a personal interview with the Spaniards, but the distance of his capital was too great, since the journey was beset with difficulties, and with too many dangers from formidable enemies to make it possible. All that could be done, therefore, was for the strangers to return to their own land, with the proofs thus afforded them of his friendly disposition. Cortés, though much chagrined at this decided refusal of Montezuma to admit his visit, concealed his mortification as he best might, and politely expressed his sense of the emperor's munificence. It made him only the more desirous, he said, to have a personal interview with him. He should feel it, indeed, impossible to present himself again before his own sovereign without having accomplished this great object of his voyage, and one who had sailed over two thousand leagues of ocean held lightly the perils of fatigues of so short a journey by land. He once more requested them to become the bearers of his message to their master, together with a slight additional token of his respect. This consisted of a few fine Holland shirts, a Florentine goblet, gilt and somewhat curiously enamelled, with some toys of little value, a sorry return for the solid magnificence of the royal present. The ambassadors may have thought as much, at least they showed no alacrity in charging themselves either with the present or the message, and on quitting the Castilian quarters repeated their assurance that the general's application would be unavailing. The splendid treasure, which now lay dazzling the eyes of the Spaniards, raised in their bosom very different emotions, according to the difference of their characters. Some it stimulated with the ardent desire to strike at once into the interior and possess themselves of a country which teemed with such boundless stores of wealth. Others looked on it as the evidence of a power altogether too formidable to be encountered with their present insignificant force. They thought, therefore, it would be most prudent to return and report their proceedings to the governor of Cuba, where preparations could be made commensurate with so vast an undertaking. There can be little doubt as to the impression made on the bold spirit of Cortés, on which difficulties ever acted as incentives rather than discouragements to enterprise, but he prudently said nothing, at least in public, preferring that so important a movement should flow from the determination of his whole army rather than from his own individual opinion. Meanwhile the soldiers suffered greatly from the inconveniences of their position amidst burning sands and the pestilent effluvia of the neighboring marshes, while the venomous insects of these hot regions left them no repose day or night. Thirty of their number had already sickened and died, a loss that could ill be afforded by the little band. To add to their troubles, the coldness of the Mexican chiefs had extended to their followers, and the supplies for the camp were not only much diminished, but the prices set on them were exorbitant. The position was equally unfavorable for the shipping, which lay in an open roadstead, exposed to the fury of the first norte which should sweep the Mexican Gulf. The general was induced by these circumstances to dispatch two vessels under Francisco de Montejo with the experienced Alaminos for his pilot to explore the coast in a northerly direction and see if a safer port and more commodious quarters for the army could not be found there. After the lapse of ten days, the Mexican envoys returned. They entered the Spanish quarters with the same formality as on the former visit bearing with them an additional present of rich stuffs and metallic ornaments which though inferior in value to those before brought were estimated at three thousand ounces of gold besides these there were four precious stones of a considerable size resembling emeralds called by the natives chalchuites each of which as they assured the spaniards was worth more than a load of gold and was designed as a mark of particular respect for the spanish monarch Unfortunately, they were not worth as many loads of earth in Europe. Montezuma's answer was in substance the same as before. It contained a positive prohibition for the strangers to advance nearer to the capital, and expressed the confidence that, now that they had obtained what they had most desired, they would return to their own country without unnecessary delay. Cortés received this unpalatable response courteously, though somewhat coldly, 
and turning to his officers exclaimed, This is a rich and powerful prince indeed, yet it shall go hard, but we will one day pay him a visit in his capital. End of section 106. This recording is in the public domain. Section 107 of Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 11, Canada, South America, Central America, Mexico, and the West Indies. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 107 the king without a throne by hubert howe bancroft the spaniards approached the capital and were met by a procession of more than one thousand nobles and merchants arrayed in embroidered robes and with jewellery of pendant stones and gold passing in file before their visitors they touched the earth with their hands carrying the fingers to the lip in token of respect at the junction of the causeway with the main avenue of the city was a wooden bridge ten paces in width on this spot the captain-general dismounted to await the arrival of the emperor who borne in solitary grandeur through the ranks of his nobles lords and court dignitaries all of them marching with bare feet and bowed heads descended from his richly adorned litter and with the dignified mien of an aztec sovereign advanced toward cortez above his head four chieftains held a canopy covered with green feathers adorned with gold and silver and jewels and before him attendants swept the path and spread tapestry lest the imperial feet should be soiled by contact with the earth the monarch was arrayed in a blue tumultly or mantle which bordered with gold and richly embroidered and jewelled hung in loose folds from the neck on his head was a mitred crown of gold and plumes on on his feet were golden sandals their fastenings embossed with precious stones saluting cortez with the grace of an old-world monarch montezuma presented him a bouquet of flowers in token of welcome in return the spaniard took from his person and placed around the neck of the emperor a necklace of glass in the form of pearls and diamonds strung on cords of gold and scented with musk with these baubles false as were the assurances of friendship that accompanied them the sovereign pretended to be pleased and after many expressions of good will returned to his palace the spaniards then marched into the capital in front were scouts on horseback followed by the cavalry at the head of which rode the captain-general then came the infantry with the artillery and baggage in the centre and last the allies the streets which had been deserted in deference to the emperor were now alive with spectators who thronged the lanes the windows and the roofs at the plaza from which rose the huge pyramid temple surrounded on all sides by palatial structures the procession turned to the right and cortez was escorted up the steps of a palace facing the eastern side of the temple enclosure hence through a courtyard shaded with coloured awnings and cooled with fountains montezuma conducted him in person into a spacious hall and seated him on a gilded dais bedecked with jewels malincha he said the word meaning companion of marina the attendant of cortez everything in the palace is at your disposal and every want shall be attended to then with the courtesy of a monarch he retired while the spaniards arranged their quarters and enjoyed the banquet spread before them by the emperor's servants in the afternoon montezuma returned attended by his suite and expressing his delight at meeting such valiant men declared that he had sought to prevent them from visiting the capital solely because his subjects feared them he then related the myth of quetzalcoatl expressing his belief that the spaniards were the predicted race 
hence he said to cortez if we can believe the statement of the latter be assured that we shall obey you and hold you as lord lieutenant of the great king you may command in all my empire as you please and shall be obeyed all that we possess is at your disposal the captain-general replied that his sovereign the mightiest in the world and the ruler of many great princes was indeed quetzalcoatl he desired not however to interfere with the emperor's authority and had sent his envoys only to serve him and instruct him in the true faith a few days later the visitors asked permission to erect a church in their own quarters and with the help of native artisans the work was completed in three days while selecting a site for the altar relates bernal diaz the carpenter observed that an opening in the wall had been recently closed up and coated with plaster cortez ever on his guard against treachery immediately ordered the wall to be opened aladdin on entering his cave could not have been more astonished than were the spaniards on stepping into the chamber thus exposed here were riches for them to their hearts content bars of gold were there nuggets large and small and figures implements and jewellery of the same metal there was silver there were embroidered and jewelled fabrics and there were emeralds and precious stones the commander allowed his followers to revel in ecstasy at the sight but on their greed he set restraint he had reasons of his own for not at that moment disturbing the treasures and gave orders that the wall should be closed up all being enjoined to keep secret the discovery already rumours in circulation among the spaniards had roused anew the fears which had been soothed by the emperor's friendly and hospitable reception it was even said that the nobles had prevailed on him to break down the bridges arm the entire populace and fall on the spaniards with all his available strength whether these reports were originated by cortez in order to carry out his plans cannot be determined at least they served as an excuse for holding a council at which a most daring expedient was proposed and accepted this was no less than to seize the person of the emperor and hold him as a hostage if instead of committing this outrage the captain-general had now been content to depart with his treasure from the capital it is probable that the conquest of mexico would have been completed without further bloodshed there was in truth no foundation for the rumours montezuma desired the friendship of the strangers and had even offered cortez his daughter in marriage his real reasons for such an unhallowed deed were best known to himself he was zealous for his religion burning with ambition and deemed this the shortest and surest road to the full realization of his purposes on the morrow cortez sent word that he was about to visit the emperor and ordering out small parties as if for a stroll around the palace and the paths leading to it gave them instructions to be ready for any emergency twenty-five soldiers followed him in twos and threes to the audience chamber all armed to the teeth but as this was nothing unusual no suspicion was aroused assuming a serious tone the captain-general produced a letter from vera cruz containing information of an outrage committed as was believed at the emperor's instigation whereby several spaniards had been slain the latter indignantly denied the charge and cortez assured him that he believed it to be false but as commander of the party he must account for their lives to the king and ascertain the truth 
in this montezuma said he would aid him and calling a trusted officer gave him a bracelet from his wrist bearing the imperial signet and bade him conduct to mexico the guilty parties cortez expressed his satisfaction but added that in order to convince his men of the emperor's innocence it would be advisable for him to remove to their quarters until the offenders were brought to justice montezuma was thunderstruck at this matchless impudence he the august sovereign before whom princes fell prostrate at whose word armies sprang into existence and at whose name great potentates trembled to be thus treated in his own palace by a score of men whom he had received as guests and loaded with presents for a moment he stood mute and the changing aspect of his countenance revealed the agitation of his mind then he declared that he would not go they could always find him at his palace at length however he yielded and closely surrounded by the spaniards though merely he was told as a guard of honour was borne on his litter through wondering and excited multitudes to the apartments of cortez though not held a close prisoner being permitted at times to visit under a strong escort his palaces temples and hunting grounds the mere fact of his captivity was itself a burden almost greater than the monarch could bear at first he was not unkindly treated respect for his person being enforced among the spaniards under severe penalties it is related that one of the sentinels exclaimed in his hearing confusion on this dog by guarding him constantly i am sick at stomach unto death when informed of this insult cortez ordered the man to be publicly lashed in the soldiers hall we may presume however that the lash was not applied with undue severity within a fortnight after the seizure of montezuma a chieftain named quapapaca the ringleader in the disturbance already mentioned made his appearance at the capital as a spanish historian relates though his may not be the correct version of the matter he confessed his guilt and after some hesitation admitted that he had acted under the emperor's orders this excuse availed him not however and he was at once condemned to the stake together with his own son and the members of his suite who had accompanied him to mexico before the pyre was lit cortez presented himself before the emperor and in a severe tone declared that his life was forfeit but as he loved him for himself and for his generosity he would inflict only a nominal punishment he then turned on his heel while one of the soldiers clasped round the prisoner's ankles a pair of shackles for a moment montezuma stood rooted to the ground then he groaned in anguish at this the greatest indignity that could be offered to his sacred person but the cup of his bitterness was not yet full the kings of tezcuco and tlacopan and a number of the principal caciques were now in the captain-general's power this was surely a good opportunity to exact of them an acknowledgment of spanish sovereignty he reminded the emperor of a promise already made to pay tribute and required that he and his vassals should tender their allegiance instead of objecting as had been anticipated montezuma at once acquiesced mainly for the reason perhaps that he imagined his consent would be followed by the departure of his persecutors the chieftains and dignitaries of his court were summoned and in their presence he declared 
that the long expected race had arrived from the land of the rising sun and demanded their allegiance in the name of quetzalcoatl to whom of right the sovereignty belonged the gods had willed that their own generation should repair the omission of their ancestors hence he continued his words being probably dictated by the spaniards i pray that as you have hitherto honoured and obeyed me as your lord so you will henceforth honour and obey this great king for he is your legitimate ruler and in his place accept this mighty captain all the tribute and service hitherto tendered to your emperor bestow upon him for i must also serve him and bestow upon him all that he may require in doing so you will please me and fulfil your duty the concluding words of the self-deposed monarch were choked with sobs which in the humiliation of his soul he could no longer stifle the courtiers and chieftains wept and even the eyes of the spaniards were dimmed with tears end of section one hundred and seven this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and eight of canada south america central america mexico and the west indies this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume eleven canada south america central america mexico and the west indies edited by eva march tappan section one hundred and eight the fall of the city of mexico fifteen twenty one by jacob abbott it was on tuesday the thirteenth of august fifteen twenty one that the conflict ceased the mighty empire of mexico on that day perished and there remained in its stead but a colony of spain on the very day of the capture of the city of mexico cortez searched every spot where treasure could be found and having collected everything of value returned to his camp giving thanks he says to our lord for so signal a reward and so desirable a victory as he has granted us he continued for three or four days searching eagerly for spoils amid all the scenes of horror presented by the devastated city all the gold and silver which were found were melted down and one-fifth was set apart for the king of spain while the rest was divided among the spaniards according to their rank and services among the spoils obtained in the city says cortez in his dispatch to charles v were many shields of gold plumes panaches and other articles of so wonderful a character that language will not convey an idea of them nor could a correct conception be formed of their rare excellence without seeing them still the booty which was gained fell far short of the expectation of the victors the heroic guatemozen when the hope of successful defence had expired determined that the conquerors should not be enriched by the treasures of the empire a vast amount was consequently sent out in boats and sunk to the bottom of the lake for a short time however exultation in view of their great victory caused both the commander and his soldiers to forget their disappointment love of glory for a moment triumphed over avarice the native allies had been but tools in the hand of cortez to subjugate the mexicans the deluded natives had thus also subjugated themselves they were now powerless and the bond servants of the spaniards cortez allowed them to sack the few remaining dwellings of the smouldering capital and to load themselves with such articles as might seem valuable to semi-barbarian eyes but which would have no cash value in spain with this share of the plunder they were satisfied and their camp resounded with revelry as those fierce warriors with songs and dances exulted over the downfall of their ancient foes cortez thanked them for their assistance praised them for their valour and told them that they might now go home they went home soon to find that it was to them home no more the stranger possessed their country and they and their children were his slaves in the spanish camp 
the victory was honoured by a double celebration the first was purely worldly and religion was held entirely in abeyance bonfires blazed deep into the night the drunken revelry resounded over the lake until father olmedo remonstrated against such godless wassail the next day was appropriated to the religious celebration the whole army was formed into a procession the image of the peaceful virgin was decorated with tattered blackened and blood-stained banners beneath which the christians had so successfully struggled against the heathen with hymns and chants and in the repetition of creeds and prayers this piratic band of fanatics crimson with the blood of the innocent moved to an unappointed sanctuary where father olmedo preached an impressive sermon and solemnized the ordinance of the mass the sacrament was administered to cortez and his captains and with the imposing accompaniments of martial music and pealing artillery thanksgivings were offered to god but now came the hour for discontent and murmuring the excitement was over the din of arms was hushed the beautiful city was entirely destroyed and two hundred thousand of the wretched inhabitants whose only crime against the spaniards was that they defended their wives their children and their homes were festering in the grave in counting up their gains these guilty men found that the whole sum amounted to but about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars their grievous disappointment vented itself in loud complainings and was soon turned into rage they accuse aguatimozin of having secreted the treasure which had been hoarded up and demanded that he should be put to the torture to compel him to disclose the place of concealment cortez for a time firmly refused to yield to this atrocious demand but the clamour of the disaffected grew louder and louder until at last cortez was accused of being in agreement with guatimozin that he might appropriate to his own use the secreted treasure thus goaded cortez infamously consented that the unhappy captive monarch should be put to the torture the cacique of tacuba the companion of guatemozin and his highest officer was put to the torture with him guatemozin had nothing to reveal he could merely assert that the treasures of the city were thrown into the lake with extraordinary fortitude he endured the agony adding additional lustre to a name already ennobled by the heroism with which he conducted the defence his companion died upon this bed of agony in the extremity of his torment he turned an imploring eye toward the king guatemozin it is recorded observing his look replied am i then reposing upon a bed of flowers cortez who had reluctantly yielded to this atrocity at last interposed and rescued the imperial sufferer cortez has much to answer for before the bar of this world's judgment for many of his criminal acts some apology may be framed but for the torture of guatemozin he stands condemned without excuse no voice will plead his cause cortez seemed to be fully aware that it was not a creditable story for him to tell and in his dispatches to the king of spain he made no allusion to the event it was a grievous disappointment to cortez that so little treasure was obtained for his ambition was roused to send immense sums to the spanish court that he might purchase high favour with his monarch by thus proving the wealth and grandeur of the kingdom he had subjugated cortez himself accompanied a party of practised divers upon the lake and long and anxiously conducted the search but the divers invariably returned from the oozy bottom of the lake empty-handed no treasure could be found for three hundred years while mexico remained under spanish rule the anniversary of this victory was regularly celebrated with all the accompaniments of national rejoicing End of section 108 this recording is in the public domain